Assalamu alaikum. It's uh, wonderful to be here in the, the Bay Area and wonderful to see everybody in person and online. Um, we're extremely happy to be present for this program called Presence. And the Bay Area is very special for uh, myself and especially for my father. Um, Alhamdulillah, it's, it's a place where he started his journey to Islam and it's a place where you know there's there's been many amazing things happened you know have, have happened here and it's um a place full of goodness and knowledge and so it's really really nice to be back here after i think it's been about 10 years or so that uh, he's last been here so alhamdulillah it's really nice um we're excited just to be here have this program um also some of you may have heard we're launching an online program and you'll hear more about that when as the program continues so Without further ado, I'll hand over to my father and let him do his thing. So, Bismillah. All right. I think I'm going to stand up. Yeah. So, do you use that or this? No, you're good. All right. You can do it right. This is somewhere it's, where it's solid. I don't know why it's not. I can't see it. So. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. 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 I always am forced or insisted from within to begin with Alhamdulillah. Praise be God belongs to God. And to, for whatever comes, and for whatever is, especially a gathering like this where people have come, all of you have come with an intention of some sort. And that intention <clears throat> will be rewarded. Whatever takes place, whatever I say, I don't say. So the hopes and the best of what you might expect to get from a program like this, even in two days, it's already happened, if you've come with that intention. And that's for me and you equally. And I am no different than you in that, in that this is something for me in which I will learn simply by your presence and the exchange that we have that is subtextual, subliminal, that happens between people and between us at all times in spite of the words or along with the words or along with ever what the, we give or take from each other and whatever events take place outwardly or physically. There's something else more subtly taking place. So coming with the intention, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. I say that because that will be the result of this, this experience, a job. So um, um, this is a long day. I've just come from New Mexico where the fires are raging and where I'm still suffering from both the grass pollens which have come up in the smoke and about 10 days of intense smoke in which my eyes and even finally my <coughs> my lungs were affected a lot and I'm still sort of recovering from that so if I'm coughing along the way you know uh, forgive me for but you know the, the fires are pretty serious <laughs> evacuations and immense uh, destruction in homes and things like that so alhamdulillah, good to see you all here. Uh, this topic of this, these two days is presence. Uh, what does presence mean? What does presence mean is something. Also in terms of what's happening in, in, as we go along through the day, I do like to have interaction and questions, comments, anything that you misunderstand, or any terms that you don't understand, please, please feel free to say, wait a minute, what do you mean? What does that mean? I mean, even though there, I think most people here are Muslims, some may not be, and those listening in, some may not be Muslims, some, some online, because there's a pretty good online presence uh, for this program as well. But uh, I like... I'm sorry? Was that a question? 
That was a, a phone or something? It's a little comment on the day and age in which we live. So I'll jump off right away. Let me say one of the things I always say at the beginning of my presentations is do not expect something linear. I didn't even hand that outline out to you all today. And I really, if I have an outline that I give out to people, I have to refer to it. And I have you used to have people who'd say, hey, you didn't get to the next topic in the outline. <laughs> but really, I make this disclaimer, do not expect that. That's not who I'm in. That's not my style. My style is primarily more artistic and poetic. And so the jumping off right now with that little sound that came from some device. I had a student who was in Dubai. And she said to me, well, you're coming to Dubai. Will you have dinner with us? Yes. And she said, would you be so kind as to talk to my daughter, who's 14, because she's being bullied at school because she doesn't have a cell phone. And I said, well, what, you know, I can't, what am I going to tell a 14-year-old who doesn't have a cell phone and her friends do? And she said, well, would you please do that? And I said, oh, okay, Bismillah, I'll do it. So uh, we did that and we sat down. So we sat down, I sat down with her and her mother, and I said to her, so your mom tells me that you get bullied for uh, not having a cell phone by your friends. And she rolls her eyes and says, yeah. And I said, well, you know why? Your mother doesn't want you to have it. And she rolls her eyes again and says, yeah, I know, because she loves me. And I said, well, wait a minute. If she loves you, why would she not want you to have that? And then she didn't roll her eyes this time. She got serious. Rolling the eyes, by the way, for the teenagers is what I call their BS meter. And see, you know, meters, meters have, have things that go like that, if it's a little bit, and it goes like that, if it's really big, you know, meter, a little, little needle. But the, the teenage BS meter is rolling the eyes. It's like, oh, you know, that's, I've heard that all before too many times. And uh, she was serious after that, you know, how is it that your mother's love? Would, she said, well, devices divide. And I'd never heard, and I'd never put those two words together, devices divide. And so we were both kind of shocked at, like, wow, what, you know, what, <laughs> it's a brilliant thing, she said. And we waited for a moment. And then she said, and there will probably be blood. We were shocked again. And she said, maybe even war. Because device, di division and divisiveness and separation, she, uh, she didn't say this, but we know that. That's division, separation. And the inability to see that we are Bani Adam, the children of Adam, that we are us. The simple ability to say, wait a minute. OK, you're wearing a red hat that says Trump 2024 or whatever. You're, you're doing something else. You know, you've got a, a, a rainbow shirt about the LGBT. Doesn't matter. We're all Bani Adam. We're all children of Adam. Very hard to stay with that in the modern world especially, especially when we have on the social media, we have, we have mechanisms that will send material and in, entertain or entrain or bring attention to this group of people and that group of people, and they'll be identified and separated and, and promoted within their own group. And divisions divide and rule is the principle. So one of my biggest theses that I've always brought is the ability, because hikmah, as a hakim, it means, that means that we look at the sort of basic principles and underlying patterns understanding the basic designs and principles that God has created in his creation, in every aspect of his creation. There's a pattern, which we call the sunnah of Allah, the, the pattern of Allah, the manner in which Allah has done these things. And this is what makes metaphor such a great thing, because we can look at something in nature, and we can see the way in which it manifests itself, and that will teach us something about 
something in ourselves or something about society. Metaphor is the sort of overlapping and the reflection of all forms and realities and the patterns that we can begin to see. Jalaluddin Rumi, he talks about the ant that's crawling on the carpet and the ant sees the, the red, the, the black threads and the yellow threads and then the green threads and then the ant is smart enough begins to recognize, oh, this is the pattern and he begin, can get a semblance and an understanding of the pattern of it and Rumi says, but he does not see the entire carpet or the maker of the carpet. So this is what we're dealing with, and this is why, you know, as Muslims we say, la ilaha illallah, there is no God except Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. But that la ilaha, as a convert, I remember one of the remarkable things, of that when I looked at it closely, it was la ilaha, no God, no God. There is Allah. And that Allah means is a name for a reality that's beyond anything we can formulate as a concept, as an image, as a representation of the absolute and ultimate reality that's beyond our can, beyond our ability to know or even conceive of. We can't even conceive of it. This is what makes Islam and, and true monotheism remarkable and unique. God is something greater, or the God, Allah is something greater. So, hikmah is the ability to begin, is, is the principles of understanding and beginning to understand, to see, to recognize, and make use in terms of understanding of the basic principles of the patterns and the design of the creation in us and outside of us. So my teacher, in, you know, I look for a teacher, excuse me, this is the, this is the, uh, the, the fires in New Mexico, the fires in the pollens. They might be with us all day, so please forgive me for that. Um, my teacher in Pakistan that I finally met, he said I learned medicine in the forest with my grandfather, and I'll teach you whatever I know. And, that was the time I knew he was my teacher because that principle, we, whatever we learn, whatever we learn, and wherever we, in whatever form we learn it, we will, if we're learning in a deep way, we'll, that understanding we have of that topic and that particular subject will be relevant to anything else we might want to understand if there's true understanding in terms of the depth or the principles of what we're learning. Does that make sense? Anyone? Yeah. Okay. I usually look for nods out there. Uh, and nods, nods are one of these great communicate. Some of you have heard this from me. And if I reiterate things, please forgive me. But you know, a lot of these things need reiterating because a lot of the material I present is not typical and obvious, and not I don't think something you find often in books. Not the subtle, the subtle realities. One of the basic principles that I teach, and I'm concerned with developing amongst the Muslims and amongst anyone who's willing to take the same track, which is the development of the principles of hikmah. The principles of these basic, when I say hikmah, I also say hikmahs, and I, I can do, I will do this thing. And this, this gesture that I make represents a principle or a basic hikmah, kind of like a headline or a bumper sticker or something to put on the wall. Some basic principles. I remember I worked with a woman once uh, by email, and I said to her, I said, you know, she was a very sensitive, hypersensitive person. And I said, so what really an important, that something important for you to learn and discover and learn and, understand and discover in a deep way in which you know this, not that it's an idea only, and that is sensitivity is a strength. 
It's an enormous strength. Now, there's that nod I was looking for, right there. My teacher, one of my teachers said, he said, he said, you know, we, we believe the wise man nods because he's wise. And he said, maybe he's wise because he nods. And that's a deep principle, it's a deep wisdom. There's, there's, a, good, there's a good wise person <laughs> nodding. We wise, we, we nod, and, and we could say that when that person, the wise person nods because he's wiser, vice versa, because what's happening there is the affirmation, bodily affirmation, of recognition. What that person is saying is true. I hear you. I agree with you. I understand it. I recognize it. I recognize it. I know it again from inside. We have a common reality that's taking place, and that nod connects us. It could be they would, you know, listen, or blank. I remember sitting with a husband and wife. The husband was a great scholar. Well, great scholar. A recognized scholar, probably great too. I, that's not the point. But he was a scholar who was very dry in his nature. Very much in his books, could quote all sorts of things from many, many books. And I was talking to him about a lot of these principles online. And he was, everything I said, he was just there, still unmoving face. Just, he didn't, there wasn't, not even one. And she was behind him, she was doing that, doing that whole time. And I thought, well, who's getting this? And. And, you know, I mean, some people cannot nod and still be taking it in. But that's a dry attitude. And, and it's not a collecting. This topic of this conference or this workshop is presence, being present, and the subtitle being better connections in ourselves and then with others. And I'm a firm believer in this principle that people say, well, you know, I can't meet people. And I, uh, you know, I'd love to meet somebody and, you know, hook up or get married or blah, 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 whatever. Some people are very good at meeting people. And one, well, well, there's tools and there's techniques and there's principles that we can learn depending upon who we spend time with and our, you know, where we're taught and where we learn these things and what sort of setting. Some people are very formal, but they know how to sail, they know how to, they know how to talk. I, uh, one of my dear friends, uh, one of my dear brothers, I tell him, I, I was sitting, this is my, my jumping off on tangents, by the way. I was sitting in a coffee shop with a dear, dear friend of mine who's deep wisdom, great knowledge of Islam. But, you know, he's had problems with his teeth, so he no, it's no longer has any teeth. And he, he's gotten overweight, so he has, you know, kind of a belly that shows, and he just wears whatever is there. He's not interested. His, his point being, I don't care about them. It's like, I'm fine. I'm fine in myself. I'm OK with myself, so I don't care about other people. Well, we were sitting there having coffee and talking, and whatever we were talking about, the couple at the next table, when they got up to leave, they came over and they said, you were talking about such and such a country. Are you from this country? They brought up a conversation and asked the questions about what we were talking about. And then they left. And then this man who was, you know, he was disheveled. Allah bless him, and that's who he is. And, you know, for him, that's great. But he said to me, um, he said, why did they go up and talk to you? They didn't even look at me. And I said, I, by name, I said, look, I said, look at what you're wearing. <laughs> look at your teeth. Look at your hair. Look at your state. You know, I could say that to him, and he was recognizing it. And I had, you know, I have. I was dressed well. I had the, my bright yellow Moroccan shoes. I said, you know, that people, when they meet you, on first impression, eighty percent. I mean, this is in study. Eighty percent of the judgment on who you are and what you are is on your clothing, and eighty percent of that is on your shoes. Now, women understand this better than men. Some, some men don't get it. <laughs> my, wife, my wife, if I'm just wearing my clothes, it's most relaxed clothes, 
my most relaxed clothes, she said, so you're going to be homeless today? <laughs> and I, I finally started listening to her and said, yes, of course, I, you know, I, I mean, I'm doing my best. But, uh, but it's not easy. So back to this, what I was saying in the first place, which is um, connecting the, the basic or at one point. Connecting in ourselves is a key to being able to connect with others. Why? Why is connection in ourself going to have anything to do with our connecting outside of ourselves with other people? Can I ask anybody that? Any? Why? Because if you trust yourself, you can trust others. OK. If you can trust yourself, you can trust others. You love others how you would love yourself. Well, I mean, those, uh, that's a question. You know, I mean, uh, is it possible to know others without knowing yourself? What is connecting with yourself and knowing yourself? Connecting with yourself. That's another question. Is connecting the same as knowing? Well, what is knowing? Any, what is knowing? I mean, we could get into very sort of more subtle, complex, philosophical, and semantics of it. But knowing something, there's different ways of knowing something. You know the principles, as Muslims, you know the principles of yaqeen. Yes? People know this term, yaqeen, certainty. There's one of the traditional ways of describing certainty of knowing is there's three, three stages. Anybody know those three stages? Ilmo yakin, Ainu yakin, and Hakla yakin. And can you describe what, what are those three stages? What's Ilmo yakin means what? Knowledge. Knowledge meaning what? There's a metaphor that's used for it. Ilmo yakin is you. You learn that there's a fire in the forest. This is appropriate for me coming from New Mexico these days. There's a fire in the forest. I know Joaquin is what? Seeing. You see it with your eyes. You actually see. There's the fire. And then Hakka Joaquin is you're there. The smoke's doing this thing to your eyes and your lungs. And you're in the fire. It's degrees of knowing and degrees of and the same thing true for the self. We can learn that, well, I have a certain amount of earth, air, fire, and water, and in this particular balance, and therefore that's my mizaj, which has become a popular catchphrase these days, as if that's going to help us know ourselves, which it can. But one of the things that's important here is the recognition of one of our Islamic principles by Allah's design and articulated by some of the best of our scholars and philosophers through these many years, which is the self contains an entire universe. No more, no less. When I went to my teacher in Pakistan, he said, I learned medicine in the forest. Allah's pure creation without corruption. It used to be we could learn so much from the animals Allah didn't place those animals there at random. The animals and everything in his creation was purposeful and part of this extraordinary perfection of perfection of design with us at the center of it. Not at the highest point or better than any piece of it, but at the center of it as his caliphs and representatives with the mandate to care for it. We, we have an obligation to care for the stone, for the horse, for the camel, for the bug, even the mosquito, in whatever manner that care is, you know, is meant to be. So wholeness, we talk about health, 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 health. You know, Whole Foods, I remember there, it, Whole Foods in New Mexico, there's a sign as you're leaving Whole Foods that says, 
the world's the, 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 the world's healthiest grocery store or something like that and someone crossed out the H and put in a W <laughs> but but the point is we talk about health all the time but what does it mean it means whole it means whole to become whole and how whole do we become? Do we become whole in an idea in our heads, or do we become whole? My teacher in Pakistan, he used to say, the entire whole being, the healthy present, present being, is the one who thinks from his toes to his fingertips, his face and his heart, and who feels from his toes to his face, hands, and heart. And those two are whole together. And that present, that means present, whole, wholeness. I remember I was in England, and I was at, uh, in Glastonbury, and they gave me this woman, amazing woman, her name was Zero. And Zero is this woman, convert woman, who supplied uh, thousands and thousands of wheelchairs that she designed out of plastic that could be used in Africa for people that needed wheelchairs. And she was kind of an unofficial mayor of Glastonbury, even though she was a Muslim and Glastonbury is famous for the, for the abbey that was there and the Christian community and the, uh, even the, the people say that Jesus salam, visited Glastonbury at some point, Allah well, him, you know, but, but um, she set up this program in the Glastonbury abbey and took two days of workshop. But the point I want to make here is that I gave a lecture there at, uh, to a group of people uh, I was only a couple of Muslims, it was mostly Christians and people from Glastonbury and other people. And a woman came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I really appreciate your presentation and I appreciate your, your uh, ease with yourself. And I'd never heard that before. I'd never heard ease with myself. I'd, it was something, you know, but I realized, well, I guess I do have a certain amount of ease. I mean, I can say what I feel I need to say, I can be with you know, say anything to anyone without sort of hesitation. I, I recognize what she said to me. It was like a revelation, revelation that, yeah, I do have an ease. And I remember also I was asked to do something many years before that. I was asked to, I was asked to give a lecture on Rumi at Harvard. And I thought about this. I'm, oh, oh, oh. I'm not a scholar. I've never read Rumi in the original language. I know that Rumi's been a part of my life since I became Muslim and before I became Muslim. Because Rumi, Rumi talks about in his Matnabi, he talks about making shahada and that you just recite this formula and you become Muslim. And I remember I didn't know anything about it and I was walking down the street in San Francisco and I said, well, wait a minute, let me see. There is no God but the God and Muhammad was his messenger. And then I waited for something to happen, you know, like it didn't happen, but it did happen a couple of months later. That, so that was the beginning of it. So it happened from Rumi first, and then I actually met a Muslim, and it did happen. But I was at Harvard, and, and there was a group of maybe three or four hundred people, and there was this, and you know, it was Emerson Hall, and it was this, this what do you call it, this sort of high sort of scholarly kind of place. Now, what am I doing here? I'm an artist. I don't, you know, I've never gotten a degree of any kind. I don't have any initials behind my name at all. Not even an MFA, Master of Fine Arts. I don't even have that. And I thought, but wait a minute, my heart is true. I believe in Rumi. And I made, and so I began to sing. I just, but I had this, I had this, it was the first time that I felt I could do whatever I wanted to do, say whatever I needed to say, and there was absolutely no fear of any sort. And I realized later that that was from the primary, the work that I'd been doing that we call somatic work with my teachers. Working with the body and recognizing that the body, how, how can I say it simply? So many ways of saying it. Adam. When Allah created Adam, he placed the spirit in Adam at that time. And Iblis objected, what are you doing? And Allah said, I know what you do not know. 
But at that time, Adam's, the spirit was put into Adam's body, and that was the beginning of the human experience to this day, like all of us, with that spirit in this body. And that's the principle, the ba a hikmah, a basic principle in the hikmah, is the spirit lives in this body. This body that goes through all of these details and all of these things and all these ins and outs and all these places and times and events and experiences and all of these exchanges. And our body contains the, the biggest part of our memory, of our identity, of who we are and what we are. For those of you who have maybe heard me say this before, I'll re reiterate it, but the, the, uh, I love that fire. The, um, the rate at which synaptic patterning is taking place in our mother's womb. There's, have, anybody here have heard me talk about the thousand and one nights or the thousand, thousand days for the? No? no? OK, well, I can reiterate it. But there's, I, w I was, uh, there was something I discovered. A lot of what I, the work I've been doing is, uh, a lot of it's in the realm of neurology, which I've discovered being separate from spiritual things offers a great opportunity to see how neurology can be commentary and proof for a lot of these things that we, we have inherited in our traditions. And so one of the terms and one of the expressions, one of the terms I found in, my, in the neurological field is what they call the thousand days. And the thousand days represents the last trimester of, of our being in our mother's womb and the first two years of life. And that period of a thousand days in which our brains are not even formed. There's no crevices and crinkles. It's just almost smooth. But the learning experience that's taking place in that thousand days is the neuro, neurosynaptic patterning that takes place at the rate of what, what, what kind of speed? How many synaptic, any numbers? Can you imagine? Anyone? I mean, it, I'm obviously, unless you know this, it's kind of a, it's kind of a nebulous abstract principle. 40,000 synaptic connections are made per second. That's huge in terms of learning, patterning, foundational building of a sense of self in a body, in a body. That continues up until, you know, um, the second, you know, in the, in the second years of life. Now, interesting, when, we, when that thousand days is up, that's when we learn how to speak. That's when we take in all this data from that previously built and designed synaptic patterning of a kind of intelligence and being, then we begin to speak. We learn how to talk. That's when, at around two, speaking starts to come in. And that's when we shift a lot from that to more of an outward taking in and learning these words and mimicking and connecting in a different way to the world outside of us. The point finally here being the recognition that we have a hard time in the modern paradigm to understand is that our identity and our memories are primarily in our bodies, not up here in the brain. Somewhere along the way, we got this idea everything happened up here in the skull. And that was never in any of our traditional models. We believed in character. And the perfecting of character, the change of character, but character has to do with an overall sort of quality of our being. So, how do we know ourselves? You know, uh, someone once asked the Prophet Sallallahu "How do I know if I'm a good person?" And Prophet Sallallahu said, "Ask your neighbor." And the truth is, 
from a neurological point of view, from a scientific point of view, from a traditional point, we cannot know ourselves without the other. We can go into a cave and all sorts of things can happen, but to know who we are, we need the others. And that others, that connection with others begins when we're babies. And all of us know this thing when we see a baby. There's not a thing we read in the book, well, there's a baby. I need to do this thing. But we, don't, we didn't read the book. We just go to the baby and say, hey, how are you? And we change our voice so the baby, and we'll make faces or gestures. And babies within moment, minutes can connect and mimic what they see. That's the, also the beginning of a very human development of what was called tachayal, the ability to imagine, the ability to posit another reality there, that being a human being, which enables the positing of one a self as well. I mean, in other words, it, there's a reciprocal reality that's there, human, and I'm here. Now, that, the interesting thing is that ability to is not developed with children, the many, many thousands of children who have been raised by animals. Because they don't have the same thing of the gaze. They don't have that same thing of the, I mean, a lot of the animals don't even have eyes in the front, <laughs> if you think about it. But that human quality, and there's many examples of that, and so children that have not had that gaze early on, they're remarkable beings. And they have all kinds of, of, of sensory and sensibilities that are very developed and extraordinary. And, it's, and the, anyone who studies these, it's, it's amazing thing to study because it's so interesting. So the self is developed in this way. And then every instant of every day of every moment that takes place more or less memory is imprinted on our being by our senses. The, the Hakims used to say that everything that we sense is written on our blood, and then our blood in turn builds you know, the bones and the tissues and the organs and all these things of our being physically. So the self, what, uh, a woman came to me once. Uh, one of the things I do with a lot of the people I work with, I send them two documents to fill out. One is a timeline, a history of their health, situ their life, you know, from birth to the present, with important events and illnesses and things that you know impacted them or meaningful for them. Some people it's very easy to do. Some people it's very hard. Some people will be long and complicated. And then the other one is what I call a symptom picture, just like, what, what ails you? You know, how is these systems, how are your eyes, your head, all these different parts? And part of the reason I do that is not for necessarily the, the data that I'll get and use, which I will use for homeopathic medicine, but for them to do it themselves. It's kind of a little, I kind of see without them realizing, it's kind of a little biography of themselves. And that's helpful to recognize, well, I did this, 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 and I haven't put it in chronological order. Just so they have this, and a lot of people find that healing, Holy, bring, bringing wholeness. Anything that brings connections within ourselves, you know, the, the great line, Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. And, and great, empty, had, had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put him together again. And I know it may sound cheesy, but only Allah can put him together again. And but the irony of that particular story or that particular poem or there's a rhyme or whatever it is that Humpty anyone know who, who Humpty, what Humpty Dumpty was or where that came from? Charles I. From what? Charles I. Charles I. But what was who was Humpty Dumpty? Huh? No, Humpty Dumpty was a cannon. It was a big cannon. And it fell off a wall and it was shattered, and that was it. No more Humpty Dumpty. All the king's horses and all. But the point is, we get shattered. You know, I mean, you know, the great, the great line about the presence that I have to, 
quote here. I, I, I feel redundant because I've done so many times. Like Sheikh Zubair. You all know who I'm talking about when I say, some of you know who I'm referring to when I say Sheikh Zubair, right? Tarif. Sorry? Shakespeare. There's no P in, in Arabic, so Shakespeare. Sheikh Zubair. He said, to be or not to be? That is the question. To be or not to be, simply that is the question. And then he says, is it nobler to take arms in the face of the slings and arrows of life? And that's the point I'm making here. The slings and arrows of life, it happens at the moment we come in, eh, at the moment we come into this realm. They used to like smack the baby so that it would cry, you know, as if that was a necessary thing, which is obviously not, but. But, uh, but, you know, the, the, the saying is that the, the wise person, the wise person is the one who laughs at death when someone dies because whatever that person, however they live their life, they go, will go to, as they say it, their just desserts. They weep at the birth because they know this pure being, and this is what we believe firmly as Muslims. We come into this world with absolute purity. And even Freud finally, before his death, admitted, okay, I had that part wrong. He changed, he, he changed his opinion to something more within the Islamic principle. We come in pure. They laugh at the death, weep at the birth, and then they say the wise person is silent at the marriage because Allah went us. Allah knows on that one. And that was a good response for the ones that got that way. <laughs> and this is wisdom. Yes? Maybe a tangential question, but like, as we develop and become impure and then we're impacted, yes. what is it? Is it more of our choices that then shape us? Or is it, or like, would you say, like, you know, some people say that there's people who like zap their energy. Or it's like, there's people around you that might be this negative energy kind of thing. Yeah. Well, they both come together, don't they? I mean, so many people, when they're getting well, I mean, how many times I've heard priests, people say, I know now, especially when there's addictions involved, they say, I know now I can't be with those people. I need to be with different people. Right? Oh, sorry, the question was, uh, you know, what about people that are negative and they sort of zap your energy? And are these choices we make? Or what was the other part of that? Yeah, is it like those energies that just impact us, or is it like how we respond to that? It's both. Is it an energy that impacts us, or, or is that how we respond? It's both things. I mean, how we respond can be something we take on consciously, and we can consciously make choices to do. We do know, you know, because the famous hadith in which someone asked the Prophet, you know, are the, it, 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 this is the great question about free will that people who aren't Muslim, they Buddhists can understand it, but a lot of people who aren't Muslim don't understand how can we have free will and how can there be absolute command. Someone asked the Prophet, so they said, you know, is, this, is the story something that's been pre-written or is it something that's unfolding? And he saw, I said, he said, the pens have written it, they've lifted themselves, and the ink is dry. Right, Tarif? That's, that's absolute, it's written. But we do have this odd thing that we can't, it's hard for us to fathom in terms of a logical understanding of free will. We have choices and we can change. And another thing that comes up when you say that, yes, there are some people that zap your energy. No question about it. Some people that are negative about everything. And there are some people who, you know, they're positive, but it's not obvious positive. Like my, 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 my wife refers, to, with due respect for any Christians, I mean, it's, I mean, I don't mean to belittle any, any group of people or any path or any way. But she's, once she used this term, she said, 
uh, you know, some, some of these Christians are, have kind of euphoric pathology, pathological euphoria. You know, everything is nice and wonderful, and a lot, of, a lot of Muslims have that. One of the big tasks I've had with the Muslim community, which has primarily been my people that I've worked with for now, uh, for over 50 years, is getting them to be real. And not, mashallah, mashallah, alhamdulillah, well, how are you feeling? Well, I feel like crap. <laughs> uh, alhamdulillah. No, and they're not going to say that. One of my teachers in Morocco, he'd say, how are you doing? Kepahal. And I'd say, alhamdulillah, which is sunnah. Alhamdulillah, ala kulli hal. But what's your particular hal? <laughs> you know, I feel just so excited I can barely stand on my own two feet. I feel so bad, I just want to go out and punch somebody. You know, alhamdulillah. <laughs> but getting them to be real, and it's called spiritual bypassing. Spiritual, and that's a term that came from the Buddhists, but it's very accurate. And that's one of the biggest tasks. I, I remember a man I was doing somatic work with, and the somatic work is where you in, enable a person to go into a journey, I call it a visceral journey into the feelings and sensations, sensations of all kinds that are in our body. And I remember, you know, when, you, when a person successfully makes that journey, they begin discovering all sorts of things in there. Memories. And, and, and things that they don't even recognize as memories but are in their body. And I remember he had this state that he was in and, 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 he, and part of one of the things I teach is Mai Chi. We'll get to that later. Mai Chi, some of you know, how, how many of you shared Mai Chi with me? Anybody else? A few people. Mai Chi is moving according, to, making movements according to these visceral sensations and these more subtle, nuanced sensations. Telling and allowing your body and giving it license to move, and whatever. So he was making movements, and sometimes when a person's in that state, they'll be very, very slow movement, it has to be slow, and it might be tremoring, but you can tell there's a state of being in which something is happening more than just simply lifting the hand. There's something deeper because all of our movements are absolutely integrated with the sense of self. Absolutely. How we get up from a chair. This is Feldenkrais and Alexander. Do people know those people? Feldenkrais? No, these are body working people. Feldenkrais, you must know. And, and, and Feldenkrais would talk about when you're sitting in a chair, how you get, from, get up from that chair is patterned. You'll get up in a certain way, and you always get up the same way. And you use the same muscles, the same shift of center of gravity, et cetera, et cetera. Ralph Walder Emerson, the American philosopher and writer, he said, for the one who has eyes and wisdom, by the gait, by the posture and the gait a person has, their being is exposed, as if it were a Swiss watch opened up. And you can see the inner workings by the way they stand, the way they move, by the gestures that they make, et cetera, et cetera. Everything, the body speaks at all times. The body, this is one of my hickmas, the body speaks at all times, awake or asleep, from the body to the body and to the self. Yes? Uh huh. Come, yes. Yeah. So do I need to reiterate that? Yeah, she was saying about your income. And, and you, at some point, in some place, you had this impulse to walk rhythmically down the street. You know. Actually, at the last workshop, and, and, and you know, Allah Alam, we don't know, because places have a reality that's much greater than we realize, too. Hippocrates wrote 20 volumes on water, air, and places. 
the geography of place. There's one amazing researcher who talks about how the geography of, play, of a place, of the environment, will affect the speech and the language of the people who live there. Amazing man, Alfred Tomatis, in the 40s. Amazing things he, he, he worked with. Anyway, I don't want to get lost on that because I want to get back to this man who was moving in this state. It's a kind of state he got into, and he was moving, and something was happening inside him. And he was a scholar, and he was very erudite, but a lot of his Islam was didactic. It was rote. It was something that, alhamdulillah, to this day now he's becoming, he's making it real. Which is, but this, he had this amazing thing in which he did something, and, and I, I called him on that later. I said, you know, that session we did, and he just cracked up laughing because he knew it. Was, he very slowly, with great difficulty, he reached up, very slowly like this. It was like something deep was happening, and you could see, and he took his kufi off. And he left his kufi. And so what was the meaning of that? He moved from being a dress up Islam, Muslim, dress up Muslim, to being a real Muslim, more, more genuine in himself. So, so the connections in oneself and knowing oneself, we can say, I know myself. I, I mean, I met a man recently who said, well, I spent a lot of time with, with people in, as, a, as an attorney. And I'm used to them telling lies and telling the truth. And I begin, I know the difference. And I've got to develop that in myself. But I was questioning, and you know, Allah, and I would do respect. <coughs> <coughs> I said, I didn't feel <coughs> that he honestly did know himself. <coughs> but the way I would test something like that about a man, <coughs> back to what the Prophet said. Says, do I, how do I know if I'm a good man? Ask your neighbor. Well, the, the thing, one of my basic principles that I use in my practice, and I've seen results from this that are remarkable, which is ask your wife or ask your daughter or your son. We don't have neighbors anymore. <laughs> Barely. Some places, if you have neighbors, you should be thankful. But a lot of men, I mean, I've had men. I've had men sort of recoil at that, like, you know, what's, you know, whatever happened to, um, you know, the Islamic principles and the patriarchy, the, you know, the, 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 the heroic thing of patriarchy, we're, we're men, we're in charge, you know, that kind of stuff. I, those men dislike what I say when I say that. If you really want to know someone, say, you, you do what? Watch them use an old computer? Yeah. I don't get it. <laughs> you got a what? I guess the question being that your patience is a great indicator how you react. I see. I see. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah, my, my one, I, one, of my, one of my things I've thought about age, how old a person is, is I feel now at 81, I can wear my pants at my waist <laughs> instead of down there. I have a question, though. Yes, please. I understand where we're going. Yeah. It seems to me that the Islamic principles and the Islamic principles are discussion. Islam is the principle of the Islamic Yes, more or less. Or how do we react to it? You bring up the idea of this Muslim. A Muslim does a prayer five times a day, and it's amazing. Walk over and it's walking. Yes. That in itself must have memory inside the body. Yes, absolutely. So, how does that connect to what you're saying? Well, what, what the question was, or the comment was, wherever we go, we're taking in information. More or less, I added, because we also learn how to create, I mean, the, the modern term they would use for this is boundaries. That is, we have a, a limitation and a boundary to our being, some things we don't want to take in. One of the things I wanted to do with this workshop, and I didn't have it set up, 
was create a camera obscura. You know what a camera, people know what a camera obscura is? I've been a science nerd since I was a little kid. And when I was like 13 years old, I used to build camera obscuras in which you take a room that's completely darkened and you open one hole about this size in one wall. And anybody, what happens if there's sunlight, sunlight outside, what happens? A beam of light? A ray of light. A ray of light? Anyone else? What happens in that room like that is the same thing that happens at every moment for all of us, which is the eye takes in all of the... I mean, you're seeing me up here, carpets, walls. But what, what's happening, you know, one of these neurologists that I really like, I mean, he, he can get a little carried away, but I like him because he said something that I really appreciated what she said. He said, the eye is not like any other part of our body. It's like a piece of our brain pushing out through the holes in our skull. Brilliant. Because the eye, it, it doesn't, the a light ray doesn't, no, everything comes in. Everything comes in. That's why I wanted to build a camera obscure it and have everybody. But when you, if, if we were to have this, this one of these walls open to a lighted area, sunlight better, that hole would project onto this wall, everything out there upside down. That's a camera obscure. That's why when I was a, when I was a little you know thirteen year old nerd, that's why I built it for the neighbor kids and said, "Come and look at this." And go outside and they go out. You know, and we had great fun. I I did it with my kids, right? Because that's what's happening in the eye, and the eye is translating everything that's out there as a brain. With the with the rods and the the, the retinas and it's turning. There, there was a man also at that time many years ago, maybe fifty years ago, four, no forty, yeah, maybe fifty years ago, who created glasses that if you wear the glasses, it turns everything upside down. And of course, that, you know, walking, doing anything is like it's it's hard to do. But in time, after about two weeks, people act normally. They're so it's all normal. But then when they take the glasses off, everything's upside down again. What we see is enormous. <laughs> Everything we see, we take in to some degree. There are a lot of studies that say we remember so much more than what we realize we're taking in. And I see in my people that I work with, for example, I see couples who have distress between them after watching long episodes of a particular TV series, and they have fights afterwards. And they don't realize why they're having the fights, because they don't realize that it wasn't the words and the plots and the stories. There were heroes and there were the victims, and it was something underneath it. The ambience of the discussion, the dialogues, the style that they were learning. We're learning so much from movies, television, and that's been going on for Decades and decades now. You're well. You're absorbing it. You know, Bob Dylan. How many? How many people are familiar with Bob Dylan's work? Okay, not as many as would be nice to see. But <laughs> he said because he won the Nobel Prize for literature, and a lot of people said this guy's a pop singer. What? what how can he win? an award for literature, Nobel Prize, and he gave a one hour, and it's available on YouTube, he gave a one hour answer to that question. And the one hour thing was, he said, people, people appreciate and they reiterate my, my songs, not because of the words, he said, because of the source from which they came. And he said, the sources of all my songs are from the Odyssey, Moby Dick, great literature that he read when he was very young. And he said he knows all these songs came forth from a poetic right brain part of his being that was not logical, that just came. You know, the uh, uh, Mr. Tambourine Man that comes, you know, the, the muse that comes to him just creates this stuff 
but he recognized that it came from all of these things that he was affected deeply by in terms of their meaning and the depth of their meaning. So right brain, left brain. So that's how many are familiar with this current concepts of right brain, left brain? The Quran, <coughs> the Quran says on the day of judgment, our skin and our bones will speak. I was going to refer to earlier that way back, many, many years ago, there were studies done about how much we actually remember. It's huge. But we don't retain. Some people are very good. Some people, <coughs> memory and presence are very connected. One of the examples I always give is, is, you know, when we have an event that's remarkable, we remember things about it. There are people, I had a, a young boy I was working with one time, and it was so sad because he was one of these people who remember everything. Are you familiar with that, people? People who remember everything. Huh? And well, that's what they used to call it, but it's, yeah, it's more than that. It's like they, you can give them a date. They'll tell you where they were that day. They can tell you the clothes, they, everything. They can go on at length. There's that young man. And these people are considered, uh, they used to use, be used the word savants. You know, and unfortunately, they call them idiot savants. You know, like they, but, but because they're not normal people. But our capabilities in, within us are so much greater than we realize. Some, some are developed in this way, some are developed. Back to your question, though. We take in everything, and what we learn how to do is to create not just boundaries or barriers. It's like nowadays, this term of boosting your immune system, my comment is, I do not want to be immune. I want to be alive and healthy, alive in the way that I can manage whatever comes. But we can look at boundaries as being obstacles in something, that barriers, or we can learn it in terms of sustaining and maintaining wholeness of our locus and being. You follow me? We don't let that come in. But if it comes in, we can manage it. Sorry? An example of that? I mean, my wife and I, when we watch, we watch a movie, we do watch movies. We have a we have a we have an automatic fast forward when it comes to the sex scenes. They, I mean they happen, and and it's not, it's never incumbent on the plot of the story or the exposition of it. But if you take it in, you take it in. Something we, we used to be this term the term that we used to use in the language was called obscene. Obscene. What's the meaning? Literal meaning of obscene. Anyone? Literally. It means off scene. You don't, you, don't, you don't look, you don't see it. You don't want to see it. There's no need to see it. And what we don't realize is, is that all of these things that we take for granted, oh, yeah, well, oh. that's in one example. But it's also with people and things. The point I want to get to here at some point today is recognize how do we build this locus of being and standing on our own two feet, and then another bodily somatic term. We use that term, he can carry his own weight, he can stand on his own two feet, or I'm having a lot of difficulties now, but I'm going to get back on my feet, or rijalala. How many of you know that term, rijalala? Rijalala? It, I mean, it's translated usually as man of Allah, but it's actually genderless. It's a person of Allah, but it comes from Rajala to stand. Standing on your own two feet. A person of God. So developing this sense of being and being all right. Not that I'm hot stuff or better than anyone else. At, at No way. Far from that. It's the opposite of that. I'm at the center of creation by Allah's design by his command to be his khalifa, but that doesn't mean I'm better than any dog. I have a role as a center to speak for the trees, for the stones, for the waters, for the fish, and the peoples. I have an obligation to stand for them. 
to care for them, to 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 to, to be a caretaker for his creation, and we failed miserably. So we take in all these things, and and on one hand we can avoid everything. I mean, I remember this this this, this woman, who, Muslim woman, who used to go through the magazines. Her daughter would get the fashion magazines, and she'd go with through with a black felt tip pen and just mark out all the things. What do you think the response to that was? Anyone? What do you think a child's response to is blacking out half, you know, all these things, redacted? Well, I mean, she would she would go to school in full hijab, and in her bag she had. Short, you know, bare midriff clothing that she'd put on when she got to school. I mean, that was one example, but I'm I'm just saying that that's, you know, it's it's not it's 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 developing the positive choice and preference and respect of being who Allah is design is designing you to be. Allah is al khaliq al bari al musawir. And that means that every moment of every day, every second of every moment, same as in the 40,000 synaptic patternings in the first thousand days, from that point on, we're building with data coming, data, data coming, data coming, data. We're building this sense of self. Now the problem is so much data is coming in and it's so bizarre, if nothing else. I mean, to me, anyone who can't see how bizarre it is to be hurtling down highways in 2,000 pounds of metal with rubber wheels at 70, 80 miles an hour. Anyone who can't see this is absolutely, totally insane. I have to say, you got to wake up. There's, this is not OK. And do not think that it's just part of modern life, quote unquote. No. It's affecting you, your children, your ancestors. Your boss, it's affecting everything. How do we do it? So we, on one hand, we can say, oh, I'm going to go live in the forest, which is fine. You know, there's a UC Berkeley professor that goes every month, one month, he goes into the forest, no electricity, no, no, uh, none of that stuff at all. And he said if he didn't do that, he wouldn't survive. One month with his family. I remember when uh, my son over there, I remember when we had electricity turned off in, in New Mexico, and it was off for three days. And when it's time to, and, and they, my kids said, Let's, why don't we just leave it off? <laughs> we did for a little bit. And I remember another time with, with a controversial figure in England, uh, Abdul Qadir Sufi, who was a dear man, close, I was very dear to me. I remember one day I said to him, you know, we were all living as a group in this building four stories, three or four stories. Bristol Gardens was how tall? Three stories, four stories? Four stories. And all these people were Muslims. We all did dhikr together on a regular basis. A lot of stories about that place. They're pretty remarkable. Remarkable time. And I remember saying to him, you know, I said, you know, maybe we, because we were having trouble with the electricity and the gas because we were rebuilding those buildings to live in them. We were fixing the gas and electricity. And I said, maybe we should just not use electricity and gas. We could just use oil lamps and otherwise. And, just and he looked at me like some revelation. And he stood up and said, Hello, Akbar. And he ran out in the hallway and started shouting down the thing, Hello, Akbar. Hello. <laughs> and we did it. We did it for months. We cooked whole sheep in the basement, in the kitchen in a fireplace with wood and charcoal, and we'd serve whole, whole cooked sheep to the people from the, from the central mosque. 35, 35 countries one day were represented. We would feed these people that. So I mean, on one hand, we could do that. On the other hand, what we, want to, we can also do is develop this absolute integrity of our own being. They can walk through anything. I like to say, I like, I believe, and I, I appreciate being with bikers and bankers in massage or mash pits. 
right? Some people will laugh at that when I say mosh pits. Some, some people won't even know what a mosh pit is. I miss mosh pits and crowd surfing, to be honest. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> I've done raves all night. All night raves. When my kids are having naps and falling asleep, I'm up in the dawn and I'm still, but I'm doing hapra. <laughs> With the techno music going. I love it. So, we live in a body. Our souls are in this body, and I say to, my, I say to myself, I say, soul, how are you doing in this body? Where I've taken you, what I've done with you, and uh, how is it? And you know, uh, it, you know the, the line, there's a line, I'm, I'm a very, I, I'm an advocate for popular music and popular expression. Because it's the voice of the community and people, even however corrupt it might be. It's a voice, and the voice is speaking. And it's a body. In the same way, the, 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 the body of the community and the world, the body of the community, the neighborhood, the city, those bodies and the world all speak in the same way that our body does at all times. Our body speaks to our body and to ourselves at all times, awake or asleep. Someone was telling about their dream last night. And when we understand these principles and understand what it means for a body to be speaking to itself, then things like understanding what, what is this dream about? I mean, he was asking me about a dream. And one of the things I learned from one of my teachers is that you, you know what your dreams are because it's you. And it's your elements of existence that are speaking and processing in your dream, hopefully. Dreams are the means by which we process our experiences. Play is another way that we process our experiences. Art and expression is another way we express, we process our experiences. Play is a good example. Children, when they play, it's not random. They play with what has taken place for them and they've taken in and they're processing it because designed into us by Allah's design is this inclination towards wholeness and integrity and coherence to be whole, to be healthy. And one of the great secrets, and I say secrets because some people get it and know this, but a lot of people don't, and the main group of people that don't get it are the medical doctors and the medical profession in the modern world, with due respect. The greatest thing they do as healing is probably their intention to do good and help other people. That probably has much more effect than any medications they give, to be honest. But the basic principle that they don't get is that the the symptoms that we experience, any symptom that we experience, where does it come from? What is, where does pain in our body, where does pain in our body come from? Huh? The nerves. Our nerves in our body. Why? Huh? Why? It's, huh? It can, yeah, it's, it's like a, basically it's a voice. Our body speaks at all, so how does our body speak at all times to our body and ourself? Pain. Someone's standing on our foot, our foot says, get that person off there. If our back is hurting, people have chronic back pain and I you know, try to, to try to get them to hear, your back is complaining. It's complaining, it's saying, don't do this anymore. Don't sit in chairs anymore. Don't sit in the car with your back like that. Don't sleep on a soft mattress with your back in the. Uh, don't don't sit huddled over the computer. Whatever. We offend our bodies, and that's the problem. Well, again, it's knowing these things. The other hikmah, the other hikmah is 
every single thing takes part in every single experience that we are or aren't. Everything takes part. And the on the scene <laughs> is so much bigger than the final result, which is just the fragments of results. The material world is just the aftermath. It's constantly coming into existence at all times. Every day, every moment, he is on a new thing. But it's discerning that and getting to know yourself. Is, it's, it's, it's not just knowing how much earth, air, fire, and water makes up your mizaj, quote unquote. But I was going to say earlier, this, this two documents that I get out to people, the symptom picture. Some, a woman sent back me the symptom picture with pages of details about all the things she's experienced. And I looked at it and I thought, wow, this is really complete and complex. And I said to her, I said, I got your paper, your document, and it's very detailed and complex. So how many lunch? She said, yeah, well, I'm a very complex person. I said, yes, <laughs> you got it. You got to realize that you're much more complex. And I didn't mean this. With due respect to how many therapists are there here? Only one. Well, you know that uh, Abdul Halim Mahmoud, the Sheikh Al uh, Azhar, one of the most remarkable of the Sheikhs of Azhar, he said every every Sufi Sheikh is a, also a psychotherapist. That's if they're doing that kind of work, because some Sheikh are not that. That's not it's not to transform people or to heal people. But Sheikh Habib, my Sheikh in Morocco, he said he said the Sheikh is only a midwife. He's only there to catch the baby. And the baby is you, your whole being, inshallah. This is the work to become all, to become who Allah designed us to be. And at this point in time, I remember being in a in a in a supermarket. This was one of those memories that I forget. Oh, I can be my place myself there at this moment. This husband and wife are having a conversation. She was saying, "Well." What should we, should we eat Italian tonight? Or maybe we should, should we eat Chinese? Should we? They were trying to have a discussion about what kind of food they were going to eat. But it was like, but it sounded like they were saying, well, are we Chinese? Are we Indian? What? You know, but it was, they didn't know what to decide. And the point I'm making is we've lost touch with a natural style of life in which we grew our own food in the neighborhood. We, the average meal in this country has traveled 1,500 miles to get there to our table. It's not, it, it's messed up. <laughs> and it inevitably will bring illness and sickness. All these things, it, it, what? 10 minutes? Huh? Okay, 10 minute break now. Okay, so we can resume, inshallah. saying in a nutshell, the goal is to be whole, and the way you do that is by being present, which would be like mindful of what you see, and what you do. Okay, everything except the last part. Okay. Mindful, yes. Present is not necessarily mindful. A lot of people, they learn mindfulness, and they have pretty much mindlessness. But there's more than the mind that we want to have present in our being. Pretty much saying it's not the mind. And people say, well, mind, you know, mind your body. There's one very famous uh, psych uh, psychotherapist who's a student of someone I do appreciate very deeply. He's a student of Dr. Alan Shore from UCLA. Uh, who's, he understands right brain, left brain much more deeply than other people. And so, but one of his students says, and so we mind our sensations, we mind our body, but he's always going from the mind to the body rather than being there with the body. The range, here's one thing, I'll, the range of sensations available to the body by Allah's design is no more and no less than everything you can find in creation. That's a lot. And that's the material the artist knows about because that's from which they draw. These extraordinary nuances of everything. Everything has a reality, 
And all of those realities, if we even know of them, it has a presence. Bob Dylan, he took from all those things he wrote and just came out. And people would, for years and years and years, people would ask, what's the meaning of this song? And he'd say, it's this, it, the song's the meaning of the song. And he'd get upset because they're not getting the point. So we take a break. Alhamdulillah, I, I hope everybody got tea or refreshments or whatever they need. Um, so inshallah we'll continue and then we're, the next stop will be uh, in an hour for lunch and then duhur and then we'll continue on. Um, you know, one of the, the things that we encounter when we do these programs is we always seem to run out of time. Is there so much to talk about and, you know, Hakim loves to engage with people but we just continuously run out of time and are never able to cover as much as, as we would like to from the participants and Hakim as well. And so, you know, one of the things that we've been working on is how do we remedy that? And alhamdulillah, we've been working on a way for Hakim to interact with people. Um, and I'm sure some of you have seen in the emails we've sent out or online is that we've been creating a platform to allow for that to happen. So I'm sure as we'll see here is no way we can ever cover everything that we'd like to. Um, and so moving forward is we're actually going to be able to engage more and there's going to be a lot more um, content coming out of Hakim being able to, you know, just be Hakim and, and do what he loves to do, which is interact with people. So just keep an eye out for this stuff uh, throughout the day, uh, today, tomorrow. We'll give you guys more information on what that looks like, how to, you know, sign up, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, inshallah, again, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue until lunch, and then we'll pray the and then continue. Um, anything else? Alhamdulillah. So bismillah. bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. So, in respect to what uh, Yasin just said, uh, the topic, what I was saying is in terms of, uh, in, in terms of what he was referring to, in terms of it's my work as a Hakim, and what I said earlier is my hope to develop the principles of Hikmah together as Muslims. And to discover and bring forth, I mean, after all, we're told and we believe that Islam is the last guidance for the people of this planet. And with due respect to all people, that means it's, and also that it, there's healing in it. And, and if we're going to honor that, we have to do more than imitate what came, the things that came before us. You know, it was uh, the Prophet said the Muslims will, will follow the Christians and Jews in their, in their path, even if it means going down a lizard hole. And, uh, and with due respect to the Islamic psychology movement and the wonderful people that are doing it and the good they're doing. And, and, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that because a lot of people here, when I talk about, I try to avoid psychological terms and psychology. They misunderstand that it might, my wife is a pretty rabid therapist with all the techniques, <laughs> training all the time. And, but but, but I, I, you know, I see the shortcomings of that. <clears throat> and I think what I would hope to develop is, like, like Yassim was saying, there's so much to present. Because if we're talking about hikmah, I mean, we're talking about common sense wisdom about everything that's ongoing, uh, ongoing and unending. <laughs> I mean, even in the scientific world, one of the things I mentioned, the, the vastness of the self, I like to point it and I like to frame it like this. At some point, at this moment probably, in some country, there's some person, a scientist or a medical researcher or somebody, and they've just gone, ha! <gasps> Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> aha. They've had this aha. And no, moment where they discovered some secret about some chemics, chemical of the brain or something, you know, like autophagy, how, how the cells, you know, this, uh, we, we get rid of old cells and so forth. Some point at something and, and person saying, aha, I found the secret of this thing and my studies have proven out and now maybe I'll get the, maybe I'll get the Nobel Prize is what they're, <laughs> but, you know, due respect, that will not end. Because again, the principle here that I pointed to earlier is in it, 
in us is contained an entire universe. And the interesting thing, it's our own particular point of view of a universe, which will have more things in the foreground and the midground and the background. But it's so vast, it's no less vast than everything we can see in the creation and everything we can experience, everything we can know about. And there's a lot of things we don't know about. So having said that, that's what I hope for, is, is to begin, and what I've been trying to do in my work is to develop from the model of understanding the vastness of the self, the model of well, what kind of work can we do besides telling our story and reiterating our story in the psychological manner, and like I say, with due respect to them. I mean, there's at least almost 2,000 kinds of psychology, and there's tens of thousands of people who will give testimonials for how wonderful it was for them and how it changed their life. Yeah, that's true. And I'm not, like I said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not degrading or saying less about psychology, but I'm saying there's something more I believe we can come up with. The work, and some of you know that, how many of you gotten any, have gotten these, the, the three primary exercises from me, the, the ground, standing and grounding, Tracking and my chi. How many? Okay. Um, and I've add, I'm adding something to the my chi today. We'll get to that later because uh, I want to do some interactive stuff with it. I'm sorry we can't be more interactive. Uh, we can. I, last the last workshop, what you the, you back in the corner? Sorry, I didn't hear your name. But when you were you were in where you were in home. And how you, were, you just felt like walking rhythm, rhythmically, that's it, you got it, you know. And I remember last, the last workshop I, I shared with the group how my daughter, when she was like, I don't know, I don't know how old she was, I'm terrible as far as age, she was like four, three or four, something like that. I said, and I don't, I like to ask children or my wife or any, anyone to get something for me, I get it myself if, I, if I possible. And I said, could you give me such and such from the other room? to my granddaughter, Jenna, and she said, yes, Grandpa, and she stood on her tip to this way. She went into the other room like that. And I told people about that, and I said, and, I, and so then I, what I did is I got, this was at the other workshop, I won't do it now, but I'll just show you. I got down on like this, and I said, so let's do this. And I got down on the floor, and then I started crawling under the floor, pulling on people's legs, and got everyone to play. Play is something we've forgotten how to do. The prophet says, and played with Aisha, you know, when they were well into adulthood. We forget, but we forget, and we don't understand the state that play brings. Play is a unique thing, and, in, and I, I, I liken it to, play I liken to sleep, to making love, to art, it's all of these arenas that are not controlled and not done by rote rules. There has to be a giving up and a submitting to the state. You have to relax and play and allow the play to take place. It's not random, but it's not, and it's not controlled. And it's therapeutic. Play is one of the greatest therapies and, and unfortunately, we, we live in a world now, back to what you were saying, some of the other, you know, the world now, that children will, will play with guns. And I mean, when I was a kid, we used to play with guns and we'd shoot and from movies. And the, what we knew about the world, we would, we would play, you know, we'd shoot someone with the gun, and, be, oh, and the person would pretend to die and fall down. On one hand, that's, you know, parents say, oh, no, we, you're not allowed to play with guns. Well, they're all playing with guns out there, and they're killing people. And what do you think this natural thing, inclination for a child will be to do? Is to try to process what's going on. Play is the means by which we process experience. Sleep is also the means by which we process our experiences. Someone came to me this morning telling me about this beautiful dream he had in which someone shot him. And I was saying, that's a great dream. You know, and that's processing. You know, the thing that we don't realize about dreams, and with due respect to Ibn Sirin, who knows Ibn Sirin? 
I know, I know you would know this, you know, really. Oh, great. But with due respect to, that, to those principles, while there are archetypal models and metaphors in creation that are solid, like a bear in a dream, yeah, okay, that we could say that typically might mean death. Or there's, there's those correspondences. Every person's dream is their dream. There's a, I mentioned, uh, there's a, how many of you see my Facebook posts? Anybody? Some. Did you, anyone see this recent one I did where I reposted a Mother's Day, a Mother's Day poem from David White? David White is this poet. See, I'm kidding. I'm, I, I'm, I'm feeling free just to go up on these tangents. David White's a poet who's, uh, he had this wonderful mother. And my wife and I were sharing one time when we heard about his mother's his mother and Mother's Day, and we both shared, what must that have been like to have a wonderful mother? <laughs> because someone said, well, we, we hear that your mother was this wonderful person. Can you give us an example? The inter interviewer, he said, well, I was walking with her when I was about three years old, and the sun was out, and we were walking, and, she's, and he said, I looked up at the sun, and it was kind of amazing to see the sun. Then he looked at his mother, and he realized, she was more amazing. And I was so, my wife and I were both with it, and then we said, what must that have been like? Because we had difficulties with our mother, a lot of us too. And he wrote this poem in, after she died, and she, he was sharing it, and he had the poem, you can find this, it's David White, it's, I think it's called A Letter from My Mother, I think that's the poem. Uh, and he, the poem is, was about a dream he had, and in the dream, he received a letter from his mother, and it was very, he was very excited. He went to sit down where he used to sit with his mother on a bench to read the letter, and as he got into the letter, he was reading it, and at about the middle of the letter, he woke up, and he woke up. I woke up. I, I missed that dream. You know, I didn't finish the dream, and he was really disappointed, really disappointed, and then he realized something, and this is the point I'm trying to make. There's a big secret in what he discovered, and he said, he said, I realized I could finish the letter. Why? Why? She was in him. This is a truth that we don't understand or recognize or give credence to as much as we might. He finished the letter. And the person's dream, I remember when I went to one of my teachers, he said, he said to me one night, he said, well, do two rockets, go to sleep, and come see me in the morning. And that sounded like, well, then I had a dream. And I had some questions about the dream. You know, I had, I had a question, some questions about things that I wanted advice from him. He said, do that. And I came back to him, and he said, well, and I said, I had a dream. He said, and? And I said, well, I don't know not sure I know what it meant. I said, yes, you do. And I knew immediately, yeah, of course it is. There are dreams. And to reflect on our dreams, we are the best. We know ourselves both in the best way and more completely than anyone else. And we're hidden from so much as well. Kind of an equal, equal hopefully not equal measures. So, it's something, it's not that we don't seek advice from others, even about dreams, but so many people I've said to, they've said, well, what's the meaning of that dream? And I said, you know the meaning of that dream. And then and they suddenly, oh, then they say, yeah, oh, well, yeah, I guess I do. Because that is, if a person has a dream in which they're being chased, and I've had this happen, people have a dream, people have a dream in which they're being chased by someone. And this is a recurring dream over and over. Recurring dreams are attempts for the self to realize and process completely and finally certain kinds of things. Does that make sense? It's coming up in the dream, coming up in the dream. Being chased, being chased, being chased. And then one day the person in the dream stops when they're being chased, turns around, confronts the person, and chases them away, and the dream is done. They never had a recurring. It's done. It's processed. It's finished. Resolved. 
We seek resolution. Before the break, I was getting to this important thing that's missed in most mainstream medicine. And uh, that is, you know, one of the sayings that I love, it's a, it's a funny saying, I love this, this expression that opium, what a wonderful medicine opium is. It has, it has saved, it has uh, brought uh, the, the relief of so many doctors. And that's the element that, you know, it's part of the human nature. It's not the best part of the human nature to take that tack. But one of the, th the most, one of the most major things that's important, and it's finally becoming a little clear in some of the research now, for example, in, and I'm getting to the point with, with what this thing is being missed. And in some of the research now, there are researchers who are saying, Alzheimer's and dementia is the system attempting to heal itself. It's not that there's something gone wrong. It's a mode in which they've gotten into that they're managing what's happened, but to maybe get somewhere further in that mode. They've gone pretty much, it's pretty much gone to right brain mode. Left brain is gone. The, 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 the cognitive, ordered, logical brain is shut down. And they've gone to this metaphorical brain, which is real. We speak in metaphors, some, some enormous percentage of our language is in metaphors, and we don't even realize that. I don't know if any of you have done research on metaphors, but there's, there's a, several people, one of my dear teachers who passed away several years ago, he worked totally with metaphor and trauma. So, so someone would come with trauma of any sort or difficulties, and knowing, even knowing or not knowing that they had trauma, the person would come and they'd have the problems and they'd express the problems and, he, and he'd say, well, what's that like for you? And he said, and, and this, I've heard this more than once, people would say, well, it's like a wall I come up against. So he would say, and I've done this with people, so tell me about this wall. What does it look like? Imagination. We'll get more into imagination. But let me get back to what I was saying. What was I saying? What? The, the, the single thing, I want to get to that thing about the doctors, the thing, single thing that they miss. So I can get back to my thread. <laughs> so the single thing they miss so often is the symptom is the healing. The symptom, the symptom is the body attempting to heal. Duh. It's like, you, you know, someone's standing on your foot, and it's painful. The, the bind of your foot, and your foot says, get that person off, my, off me. My back, as I said earlier, my back says, don't do this to me anymore. It's complaining. To be able to listen to those body. And how does the body speak? Let me ask you that. How does the body speak? If it speaks at all times, awake or asleep, that's my hikmah. Body speaks at all times, awake or asleep. How does it speak? Sensations. Yes. What else? Pain. Pain is an extreme sensation. Yes. Did you say something? Oh. Emotions, which is sensations. Here's another thing. Sensations are part of the spectrum. I'm, I'm, emotions are part of the spectrum of sensations. Emotions are part of the spectrums of sensations. In the spectrum of sensations, right now, we're all experiencing a kind of sea of sensations, the temperature of the room, the color, the kind of light, the ambiance, the sound, all of these subtle things, as well as the more noticeable gross things. This is ongoing, like a level, basis, foundational basis, baseline. Emotions is when I say something and it makes you angry or it makes you unhappy, but it happens in the body. 
and it is a part, and it's as if waves rose from that sea. Well-regulated person with well-regulated emotions, they have the emotions, but they let them, they're like the sea. They let the waves raise and settle, rise and settle. And it's just part of ongoing being alive, as my teacher said. The whole person is happy, sad, angry, depressed, hopeful, scared, courageous. I could go on and on and on and on and on. And my teacher said, that's called being alive. And regaining the ability to do that is coming back to life, he said. Back to life is, to me, healing, coming whole again. We were all, when, you know, like my granddaughter, when she walked to the other room like that. That was just being present. Or when she saw the earthworm, she said, jumped up and down, seeing it, and then ran to share it. She said, come and look at this, come and look at this. That's being alive. And we learn how to be stoic. We learn how to keep, every, I'm going to keep everything under control. God forbid I should submit and let go. So when we did that play thing, crawling under the sea, people were, they were, I mean, I'm not, we could do it, but you can imagine what, what happened is everyone, they kept doing it and we had to kind of, okay, 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 we had to sort of call them together like the, you know, the, the, the school teacher, okay, okay, class, come on, you know, stop playing. We, we miss play. And we miss having it, I should say. And play is not the reason for being. But it has a function, and it's an important function. Anyone who doesn't play and is not playful, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's a serious thing. There's a time for play and a time for being serious. But one enhances the other. One enhances the other, period. It's the way it works. It, because it's being alive. It's allowing the truth of reality to, to uh, accept its rightful position in the dynamic of the moment. It's allowing reality to accept its place with its living and all, all of its qualities in the dynamic of the moment. And the dynamic of this moment, right now, I am with you and I am taking in what your expressions are, you're nodding. And when I said some other things, laughing and doing these various things, that's what brings the life and that brings the connection back to the theme. Being present and present in ourselves and more whole in ourselves allows the safety to be connected with others and allowing whatever can happen. I like your comments. I like your comments. Comment. Comment. Yeah, that's okay. But the, the, so I'll repeat the question more or less. Two kinds of processing. First of all, back to one of the things I already said, and this is really important. It's in that list that you've gotten. List of hikmas. Did everybody get that? If if you read through those carefully, and if you spend some time on each one, they have far-reaching. They have a lot of implications. One of the implications of one of those is all sensation, all sen the, the, the very bottom line I said, Jalaluddin Mumi said, I am irrevocably bound in this cage of earth, air, fire, and water. When I was in Bahrain at the Quran Institute there, I gave a lecture and I said, I asked people in the group, in the audience of people, I said, um, you know, can any, is anybody willing to share their very sort of remarkable spiritual experiences? And it specifically said spiritual experiences. And four people, I chose four people, and they told, each one told their experience. And then I went back to each one, I said, well, you said this, and I demonstrated to them that their description of their spiritual, which is supposed to mean, it was all bodily. It was all things they felt. It was like this the light came in through my arms and I felt this and it was like electric feeling, like you know, lifting me. It was all bodily expressed, spiritual experience. 
back to what Rumi says there, being irrevocably bound by earth, air, fire, and water, the elemental things of our soul and spirit, non-material, out of time, being here and living in this domain of the body. We, it's hard to get that because we've been trained that the brain, there was a long argument between uh, uh, Henry James, the, the, the father, some people call the father of American psychology, and Walter B. Cannon about where emotions took place. And the discussion could, go on, could have gone on forever. They wrote letters back and forth in disagreement. But we have to recognize that emotions take place in a body. So <coughs> the right brain, left brain. Now, you're familiar with right brain, left brain from, from what source? Yeah, you said you were. Neuroscience. Do you, are, do you know, do you know uh, Alan M. Shore? Alan Shore, UCLA. <laughs> okay. You're a biker now, right? No, I'm just joking. Sorry. Um, well, in any case, the, end, the, the means, first of all, sensation, every sensation is connected to a process. A, a sensation in the body that needs nerve activation of nerves and recognition and all the all that that entails and all the subsequent things that take place from that, including emotions uh, that follow those things. It, it, it nothing nothing exists in a vacuum alone. Everything. Another one of the hikmas on that list is everything in creation is connected to everything else in creation. And that's from Ibn Arabi, you know, a lot of the traditional Islamic scholars and philosophers, amongst other people, many people, including homeopaths and I mean, a lot of people who recognize that. But I go one step further. I say not only is it in connection with every other thing, but it's in dialogue with every other thing. We look at something. We could say that something looks back at us. I mean, however you want to describe it, there is an inevitable connection. And when there's connection, it means a kind of dialogue. Now this gets to, so back to your thing about processing. There's endless kinds of processing. There's cognitive, volitional processing. This is often, I found this in the people I've worked with. I've done this work for over 50 years now, I can say. I've seen very, very uh, advanced professionals, quote unquote, who are very good at their work, international uh, uh, attorneys for corporations and things, they've got it down how to control and manage what takes place. And the regulation is cognitive. They regulate by control. If I do this, and I think this, and I feel this, and then I do that, and I do this, and I do that, then all oh, that's going to be OK. I can function, and I can get the job done. Although my wife, she's not so good with it. Do you get what I'm saying here? When those people realize, those men, for the most part, when they realize that you can't control everything, um, it's very clever. It's a very clever kind of manipulation of feelings and emotions and physical things. This happens a lot in, in meditation things. It's not that we, but, but, but we, you know, there's a final thing of, of, I mean, Islam, what does it mean? How do we start the Salat? It's like hands up, like, <laughs> okay, I give up. You know, you know that's the, the classic posture. You get, <laughs> you get assaulted with someone got a gun on you. You say, okay, I surrender. <laughs> and I give up. It's allowing what wants to take place to take place. It's not a controlled thing, and it's not something that I learn in the book, and therefore I do this. Same with adab. Adab is the way we behave with someone. Adab face comes naturally from good character. It comes organically from good character. One of the models that I've always used, I thought was really a great story, was about Native Americans who had their own very particular adab. You know, in all cultures, all high, what they call high context cultures, and very complex 
I mean, there's some cultures you don't do that with. You know, in the Desi community, you don't put your leg up in front of somebody. Not a not a chief of science. You know, that's, I'll go over here. I had to take care because sometimes I'll say these things and I realize, whoops, that person. <laughs> it's talking about being muscle bound and how is that not a very good thing to be muscle bound? And I realized, oh my God, there's a guy who's really muscle bound. <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a disastrous thing to to get to where you you have to have to cut off sleeves to show off your. You know, I once in Mexico. I lived in Mexico for a long time, years ago in the 60s, and I used to be I used to be amazed that these truck drivers would come down. You're going down a hill, and a truck driver would come in next to you and gear down and wow, make this incredible blast, you know. And one day I was a truck driver and said, oh, "How come these truck drivers? They all seem to just drive up next to you and then shift down and just have this blast." I said, "Why do you do that?" And he said, "To scare you." And I said. Why do you want to scare me? And he says, and he got really serious. He says, because we're all afraid, which is beautiful. And afraid, and being afraid, is an indication of what kind of iman we have. You know that wonderful story, I'm sure some of you have read it. There's a book that's popular these days about the woman who's on a ship, and her husband is a samurai. Anybody know that? And, and, the, and the ship is, so you know it. And, and the, the seas are like threatening to turn the boat over. She's on one side of the boat. She's going to go to the other side to, to, to see how her husband's going. She gets over there, and he's sitting there very calmly with his sword and samurai, you know, the great Zen kind of master kind of story. And he's just very calm, sitting there looking at the sea and looking at the waves. And she says, she, she says to him, well, how can you just sit there? He says, look what's going on. And he draws his sword and goes and stops like this right at the edge of her neck. And she starts to laugh. And he said, why did you laugh? And she said, because I knew you weren't going to cut me. And he said, exactly. <coughs> and that was the trust. I mean, it's fine for the scholar to say, well, if you're afraid, that means you have poor Iman. Well, OK, yeah, but we're human beings. You know, how do we gain the trust, if, especially if we've lived a life in which everyone that meant something to us did bad things to us, and we, we lost trust in other people. This is the modern world. This is. Well, I mean, having fear is a natural quality that we need to have. I mean, I know neighborhoods I would not walk down the dark alley with on my own at night. Duh. That's a natural, healthy fear. I know some people that I'm not going to get, you know, in, get embroiled with financial matters with them, and so on. So there's natural balanced fears that we want to have. But at the core, and this is Dr. Shore, Alan Shore, you should look into his stuff sometime. He talks about the early stages of mother being the one who manages our varied uh, affect expressions. And she's there for that. And how we develop at an early stage, or don't develop at an early stage, a sense of security in ourselves. And then in time, we, we, we reinforce that with our dean and with our teachings. Building, building, uh, you know, more, more uh, trust. And when trust is broken, I mean, that's one of the biggest jobs I have is people that come to me because their trust has been broken. And one of the egregious ones in the modern days is the person that has some spiritual teacher that has done some things, and then they're sort of shattered because they were looking to this person. But that's kind of the story of any, any you know, family member or something like that that, that uh, has betrayed us. There's so much to talk about and so much to sort out and understand, in my opinion, 
in the lens of hikmah, in the lens of basic principles of what we want. We want to feel safe. And it's the closest, that safety is the closest thing we call iman. Yeah. Hold on, I guess, yeah. Uh, going back to Yusuf alayhi salam's story, like you, you're mentioning, an embodiment of uh, uh, Islam, like you brought up. Then we talk about everything is, uh, we are, are internal, internalizing. If that story, he is a prophet, he sees his son seeing a dream, he knows the answer of all his uh, uh, brothers will one day bow down. But yes. still, he loses his eyesight in crying yes. for his son, yes. the loss of it. Yes. And, and all that in his own life experience of um, that Islam, living it, prophet, sabr, uh, embodiment of uh, environment, and yes. jealousies, all of these all things. That, so sure. can you explain that, please? Thank you. And I, I kind of missed the final question. The question was like um, the question of uh, the embodiment of our uh, environment affecting us yes. and hikmah of utilizing that. And how are we to utilize when the environment and the people and the things affect us. We are not, no prophet, but even he ended up losing uh, eyesight. Yeah. Uh, so as human being and being in simple terms, how do we walk through our life with the stresses? And how do we go through our life with, well, it's back to this, what I was saying from, from Sheikh Zubair, to be or not to be is the question. Are we going to be present? and develop and become who we're meant to become, or find our way back to the trajectory where our fitra is taking us to what we're meant to become in this world by Allah's design, how do we do that? I mean, yeah, we need all these things. We need others. We need, we need all sorts of things. We need other people, and we need to develop the wholeness within ourselves. But nevertheless, Allah's commands will come. And the other thing that's important to realize, and a lot of people this is aside from the physicians or anyone, we don't realize that we say 18, at least 18 times a day, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And we, Quran tells us his Rahma is over all things. Do you know? I mean, <clears throat> but we don't recognize that. And we don't know because we're just little ants on the carpet with certain patterns. We can see this, we can see. And as far as hikmah, I'm Abdul Hakim. I have no claim to any hikmah, you know. And there's hikmah. I was sharing yesterday with someone about uh, Albert Einstein, what a hakim he was. He was an amazing hakim. If, you, if people look at his life and look at the, the way he lived his life and some of the things he had to say and things he did way ahead of his time, I mean, from the in, beginning, the first days of Israel, saying this is wrong. And fleeing Germany, knowing that was going to be wrong. And other things. One of, his saying, one of his statements was, God may be subtle, but he's not mean. He's not mean. And, and in the most disaster, I mean, how many people have come to me in, in my career, in my life, of dealing with sick people, and they said, well, I have fourth stage cancer. I'm dying. And it's OK. I've learned something that I'm thankful for in this place that I never knew before. How many, and I see people nodding because you probably know this experience from other people or yourselves. I know, I mean, I know a man who, who went through that. He was diagnosed, he was told he had a certain number of kids. This is the psych, the, the, their, the, the physicians lot, they feel it's a, they're obliged maybe legally to say, well, you've only got maybe a month, two months. I know some guy was going through it for a month or two months, and then they got back to him and said, sorry, sorry, we had all the data wrong. You're fine. What a lesson that was for him. <laughs> you know? 
It was like, really? So, so yeah, all these things happen. Life happens. And to be whole and complete doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah, I, I gave that example of feeling ease with myself. But that was remarkable for me at that time because I remember growing up for the most of my life, I had such fear in public that I, my knees would literally shake and I'd lose my voice. I couldn't, I'd, or I'd just shut up. And then all that energy of what I wanted to say, could have said, all goes in. And there's very specific physiological things that happen when it goes in. It goes to your stomach, most typically. Then it'll go with joints. Anger is one of the most destructive things we can have. But there's a righteous place for it and a valuable, good kind of anger. We know there's times when we need to be angry. And we live in a time where a lot of men have excessive anger. And that's often the anger that's excess in so many men in the modern world, women too, but more men, is covering up fear. Compensating for fear. I have to be the strong man. <clears throat> I'm going to have this car that goes, Brrr. you hear me? You know, I want to go and say, I hear you. What else do you do? But, you know, people, it's like the, the, the truck driver said, yeah, we're afraid. And, and, and so we men, we, we're, we're expected to be courageous and strong. And strong is not sensitive. And then we have men that go to men's groups. There used to be men's groups. I don't know if they still have them. And the men would go, they develop their feminine properties and qualities. And then they come to me and say, well, my feminine aspect is pretty well developed. I cry quite easily. And I say, yeah, well, you probably rage pretty easily too, right? And that's unfortunately the reality that comes with that, that, that uh, prescription. It's becoming whole. And it's accepting who you are and what you are. Now, that's for some people, that's hard to do. It doesn't happen overnight. When we experience shame, or when we betray ourselves, what happens in ourselves is enormous. When, and I say betray ourselves is when, when we very young, I remember, you know, I grew up at a time when, yeah, we get the, the, you know what, beat out of us with something. If we did anything wrong, we'd get our mouth washed out with soap, literally, you know, all these things. And we were told, you know, and this is across the board for most spiritual teachings, across the board, this is for your own good, right? Spare the rod and spoil the child kind of concepts. But inside, it hurts, and it feels like too much, especially when what they thought I did, I didn't actually do, so I'm getting punished for something I didn't actually do. You know, all, when we betray ourselves and we don't speak out, that's a kind of betrayal of the self. I know this, I believe this, but I'm afraid to say it. When we don't speak out and we betray ourselves, that energy, in terms of a biological reality, it's very unnatural. And so it creates a kind of tension that has to be expressed. So when men, and the classic thing I've seen, I've been able to track this with men, when men do things that violate their principles. We have in the Muslim community a huge uh, addiction to pornography amongst the men in countries, the biggest group of people. And, and how many men, they feel, oh, I'm, I'm a bad Muslim, or they, they make an excuse for it, and they, or they go to a therapist, and the therapist says, that's how it's OK. <coughs> You know, in the modern world, there's no, nothing obscene anymore. You don't believe in what comes in, stays in, or needs processing in a deep way, in a way that may not be able to be processed in real life. But, but men who betray themselves and don't speak out, they, they, then that energy that's inside, that's at odds with, each other, with itself, it demands expression, and it'll come out in aggression for the family, usually. Is that? Oh, OK. I couldn't quite make it out because it looked like five, five minutes. OK, now, I've, I, I, are there any threads that I left behind? Back to this thing from the physicians.
I think that's an important topic you brought up about um, the internet stuff. Like, what do you prescribe for that? The for which the pornography thing. Like, how well, if you have you treated people with the pornography? Oh yeah. Problem? How do you oh, yeah. treat it and stuff like that? It's hard. It's hard because it, it gets into the body and into the hormonal system and the hormones and the neurology. And, and it's not, for the most part, in the world, uh, you know, it's okay. That makes a difference in terms of being able to free oneself from it, you know, because the whole culture plays into it in so many ways and amplifies it or keeps the momentum of it. It's a juggernaut. Juggernaut. Yeah, sorry. I'll give you an example of the men and how um, they respond. Oh. You yeah. gave an example of the men and how they respond, but what do women do when they betray themselves and don't speak out? What is their biological response? I mean, men and women are different. And it's important to recognize that, I mean, in spite of a lot of the movements today. There was a woman who wrote a book many years ago called Brain Sex. She gave it that title because she was a researcher who originally started out in her research to demonstrate by her research how men's brains and women's brains were, were the same. And as she went along, she realized, whoops, they're not at all the same. And she lost her funding for the book. But she got it by calling it brain sex and making it a kind of book that could be sold. But women, I mean, all the same things can happen. I mean, we overlap. I mean, text, I use, I mean, we look at, if we look at testosterone and oxytocin, Right? People know that th th this kind of demonstrates some basic differences. But the Prophet said, him, he said, the women, the women have a realm and a kingdom that is vast, and we men have no access to it. And that's, it's, it's really important to get that clear. We have, as men, we have a biological, animal dominance by our voice. If we raise our voice once, to a woman, that's a message. It says, behave yourself. Because if it comes down to it, I will kill you. <laughs> Whatever, you know. <laughs> I know. Sounds funny, but we laugh. We haven't even gotten into this. Why we laugh and what we laugh at and what the laughter does. I mean, it's a, it's a really powerful thing because it's back to that first hikma in the thing, in the alternation of day and night, rising to a peak, Activation and settling. And laughter is when there is compression and contraction, cubbed. And the brilliant stand up comedian plays, works it, works it, works it, works it, works it, and then bam, gives that tweak in the punchline in which we don't, we don't cognitively, brother, city. You know, we don't cognitively decide to laugh. It happens. We can't say, oh, that's funny. I'm going to ah, ah, ah. <laughs> and everybody laughs when I say that. See, what's interesting is they laugh at recognition. Yeah, no, it's, it's a spontaneous organic. It's a kind of orgasm, autonomic system release. And that's why the, the stand-up comedians, they know the topics that will always have c contraction. You know, marriage. No end to the jokes about marriage. Politics, family, gender nowadays, so on. They know how to tweak it and they're masterful in their, it's a kind of therapy. The thing is that the release of laughter is not necessarily, not necessarily therapeutic and it doesn't necessarily heal. Although some laughter, I've seen people laugh. Uh, there's a Moroccan joke I don't have the time to tell. Uh, I told it to Moroccan, and the guy fell off his chair. And it was on the floor. Like, you know, I've seen another a New York man who I told a joke about New York, and he started laughing and didn't stop laughing until he was crying. You know, so that was an example of it going deeper. But, but really, these stand up, you know, actually, we have all these stand up comedians now manage, helping us to manage the insanity of where we are at and the life we're living right now. And they, they serve a good purpose, you know. It's more than the court jester, it's, it's, you know, but it's. So uh, women do the same thing. 
not the same as men, because your, your man, women's mandates are different. Although they're changing in a lot of what women are being led to believe is, well, you need to be more like men. That was uh, My Fair Lady. Didn't mean, how many people really are thinking, no, My Fair Lady? Great. Why can't a woman be more like a man? That's the song. Why can't a woman be more like a man? Like, <laughs> and, and the outcome of that story, because that's from, what's, what's the story it's from? Pygmalion, yeah. Because in the end, she leaves. <laughs> He's done. I'm done with him. <laughs> so women, yeah, they process differently, and they, they don't do the same kinds of things that men do. There are, I believe, they're pretty likely more we, what we could call, um, what's the term they use, uh, uh, narcissists. But in, in the story, original story of narcissist, narcissist was a man, and the woman was Echo. His partner was Echo, and Echo could only repeat what he said. She couldn't have any creative, volitional things from her own self. It was only repeating what he had to say. So we can continue after. Thank you for the attention. I love the nods and the hearing. So, <clears throat> As I said in, with my disclaimer at the beginning, don't expect anything too linear. But um, now that you've had lunch, you know that Pythagoras would not take any students if they'd eaten recently. And basically, with the, I try not to eat when I'm giving a presentation because I know a lot of my energy will be done doing that. And in fact, it used to be if I had any sort of long thing I had to do it, I'd sort of live on just milk. But, but I, you know, I, now, now it's pretty much like almond milk or coconut milk. But. Okay, so now that you've had your food, how would it be for you all to stand up? What I'm going to do, I'm, and, and let me just explain something that some of you have gotten what I call the exercises, and which are all exercises of awareness. And exercises of awareness it means by just consciously paying attention. Mind is also a verb. It became this thing that's up in our people refer to as mind being this brain, but brain and mind are different. Mind is also a verb, meaning to pay attention to something. Mind your elbow, mind the gap, mind your own business, someone told me from New York, right? So the mind, when, when we have pain, someone's standing on our foot, we can say that, oh, I can feel pain in my foot, my brain's recognized it, and there's this loop, pain, you know, get off my foot, blah, blah, blah. I said earlier, the body speaks. So paying attention to something, when we pay attention to something, we amplify it. That may be in that list of hikmas. When we pay attention to something, we amplify it. It's the hadith qudsi. Allah is in your expectations of him. If we expect the best and we believe in Allah's rahmah, it's more likely we're going to find it. As Bob Dylan said, if we expect the worst, we'll probably get it. So we know this clearly. We, some people look at the world half full, half them. We, know that, we, know, we all know this as a basic truth, yes? So, <clears throat> um, the mind, we, you know, our, we could say that the foot, our foot is saying get off. We could also say the mind of our foot is saying get that person off me. Or the mind of our back. My teacher, as I said, I think earlier, we, we, if we, ideally we, we think and understand with our whole body, and we feel with our whole body from our toes to our toes to finger fingertips. And there are people, blind people, where's the dentist? There are blind people that develop the ability to see red and green with their fingertips. I met a man once, that's a longer story I won't go into. I met a one man once because he believed and he followed this principle that the Arabic language, like Sanskrit, the Arabic language is something more than symbols in forms on a paper for something else. They have life of their own, each letter form. 
Some of you may be familiar with that concept in Islamic uh, philosophy. But he actually, well, is, is, I lived, stayed with a man in Pakistan who he demonstrated to someone who didn't believe it, he demonstrated to this man I stayed with by smelling the sentences the man wrote in Arabic and could read them by the smell of the letters. The ability for us to develop our sensibilities is enormous. It's enormous. It's so much more than we realize. Women tend to have it already better than we men by the nature and the sensitive nature. Um, so I had you stand because the, what I, the exercises of awareness, I mean, let, let's just start with this. If you're standing on your two feet, ask, first of all, are, are your knees locked or unlocked? Locked. Who's locked? Who's locked? Okay, that's an unnatural way to stand. We learn to lock our knees. When we're children, if you watch children at three or four or five years old, they don't start locking their knees until usually difficulties in their life. Because when we lock our knees, the dynamic quality and the sense of being on our own two feet and connection with the earth and the ground is cut off. So from the hips down, we're dead. It's hard, if we lock our knees, it's hard to get back to this dynamic in which your legs, listen, your legs feel the weight of your body. For anybody who's in the medical field or know that, have, you know, we, 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 we recommend for women, it, you know, in menopause and when they're uh, getting older, when their hormones have changed for, for ben, bone density to take calcium. Well, okay, you can take as much calcium as you want, but if your system is not assimilating and putting that calcium into where it's needed, then it means nothing. In fact, it could be damaging. You all hear that? It's pretty important. It's not quantity. It's effectiveness and the ability to manage something. Same with what we experience in the world. The, uh, another one of the Hickmans on that list is a definition of trauma that I don't see many trauma therapists using, which is anything that we cannot, that we take in, back to the questions and discussion we had earlier about things, anything we take in that we cannot assimilate into the wholeness of our being or eliminate becomes toxic. The, greatest, the biggest example of that is an arrow in fact, the word tox comes from the Greek word for the poison that was on the end of arrows. The arrow goes in. We can't assimilate that if an arrow goes in. It's even hard to pull it out. Experiences can be the same. Very difficult to, to so, so there's a, you know, there's an art of or manage of how to do this. And that's the art of, like, you know, healing from things of that sort. So anything we cannot assimilate or eliminate that we could call trauma. We could call that uh, 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 toxicity and poison for our system. So the exercises of awareness I, that I give out to most people I work with are three, three stages. One is standing and grounding. And in grounding, how many of you are familiar with this film, uh, a documentary called Earthing? Anybody? Earthing, earthing, two, well. It's worth watching, uh, and one of the, because it's something I've been teaching for years and years and years, which is, you know, the value of walking barefoot wherever you can, wherever you can, and whenever you can. In Pakistan, they used to have a, they used to say, if you have any problems with your liver, you walk on the fresh, wet grass in the morning with the dew, that that goes through the body. The body is much more dynamic than we realize. What we feel with our feet, what we feel with our hands, there's this research someone just told me about recently that our animal nature is so much more vast than we give it account for. Imam al-Ghazali said, we do not deny our animal nature. We honor it, respect it, and we go with it. We run with it, literally, or gallop with it, if you want to think. <laughs> Pounce with it, all these things. Um, but someone told me recently about a study in which people, they were in a situation, uh, they had a situation set up where everybody was shaking hands, and they, they discovered with these cameras that the most people who shook hands with strangers, you know, they'd go away and when no one was looking, they'd smell their hand. <laughs> like, what did I just do there? <laughs> what did I open myself to? And you laugh because, I mean, yeah, there's something, I mean, people, it's, people are strong. 
you know. Anyway, so the exercises of where, and we can develop these sensibilities to very, very high degree. The man that was that was could smell by, uh, you know, when he discovered this man that could smell by reading the Arabic letters by smelling, uh, he said to him, "Well, how do I develop that sense?" And he said, "He said you develop it by doing remembrance of Allah and dhikr of a certain kind, la ilaha illallah, over and over and over." And the value of doing these recitations, whether it's in Arabic or any other sort of uh, uh, kind of practice in which you repeat a mantra that has rhythm to it, la ilaha illallah, it has breath, it has sound, and if it has meaning for us in terms of our beliefs and our faith, it has another power that's very powerful in terms of developing integrity and wholeness within us. Singing, the last workshop I did, I got everybody to raise their hand and speak their name, like I, Akim Archuleta, commit to singing as often I can as I can with my family or with anyone I can find every day if I can do it as much as possible until this, from this day on. And everybody said, yes, yes, yes. Actually, people did it. People, I got emails they saying, I've been singing with my family. It's great. And, and I recommended a book called Rise Up Singing. And it's got all these songs of all sorts that you can sing. We used to, as human beings, sing together and dance together. Every single culture. I don't care how rigid spiritually they were or religiously they were, I should be better say. Everybody has singing and dancing as part of their culture. No planet on the earth is without that because it naturally comes forth from us. Right? Is there anyone that can disagree with that? No. I said this in Bahrain when I gave that the thing I was referring to when I asked people to give share spiritual experiences. And, and I noticed you're having trouble standing on two feet, <laughs> stopping. I'm sorry. We just had a meal too, so uh, I said that I said everybody the same group that I uh, demonstrated that their spiritual experiences were very physical. That same group, a man came up afterwards and after I said everybody sings and dances, and he said, "Excuse me, brother, but uh, dancing you mean like Michael Jackson?" <laughs> and I had this image of this this wonderful uh, you know elderly uh, Daisy. You know, uncle, whatever, doing the moonwalk, you know. <laughs> and I said, yeah, if you can do it, go for it. <laughs> Movement is one of the most essential things. Now, but these exercises, they're not like calisthenics or anything, although calisthenics from the Greeks had with it a very deep understanding that learning was also intimately integrated with the body and body movements. So one of the basic hikmas that's that I work with for everybody, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, is as is the body. This came from my beloved teacher, Dr. Alexander Lowen. The way he put it was, as is the body, so is the self. Because the self and the spirit, the ruh, lives in this body. So a stiff body is a stiff person. A weak body is a weak person. A flexible body is a flexible person. Now, you, I've got you standing still, and some of you are going like this. That's OK. But standing on your own two feet and balanced and with knees unlocked. So the ones that raised, are, your, are, there, are the people who said locked knees, are your knees still locked? Because if you unlock, it doesn't mean bend at the knees. That's, the, that's a deeper exercise. But, but, but not locking them. Your body then feels connected. And standing, and you feel the weight of your body. Your legs feel the weight of your body more fully. Yes? Can you all get that? It takes a long time to get out of the habit of locking your knees. But basically, the energy is shut off from here. Now, the film Earthing that I mentioned is about something. I used to teach science. Is it, so I'm just, you're gonna, I'm going to have you standing here for a while, so until we get to the exercise. Uh, I used to teach science, and I was a science nerd from when I was really, really young. And in science class, one of the science classes I did, I had one boy take a big, thick extension cord and hold the metal ends. And he was in a room with synthetic carpet. I had him walk around the floor holding this. And I had the extension cord two classrooms down and another 
boy was in that room, this is my male class, holding the, the lead on the end of that same extension cord. Or actually had his finger, like this made me half an inch from the end of it. And he, I had this kid walk around. And what happened to the other kid in the other room? Spark. A spark. The spark was generated by that kid walking around on the synthetic carpet through his body, through his hand, through the extension cord, to the one of the this film earthing points out that this extraordinary thing happened in the forties, the name of one of the Beatles albums, Rubber Soul. Rubber Souls came about. And with rubber souls, we stopped connecting to the ground and the earth itself. In the recent studies, to go and stand 15 minutes, even 15 minutes, on soil or grass and earth, the bodies, these, these, these electro, electro, uh, uh, synaptic electromagnetic activities are kind of fire. It's electric, electrical energy. And they do pass through our body. That was the experiment for the kids to see, the building of those negative ions. Uh, but the point is, we used to be crowned on the earth. And if, even before when we were leather souls, there was more connection and more discharge. But 15 minutes on the soil or grass will reduce, reduce in some studies recently, will reduce all sorts of in, in, uh, inflammations in the body. So, you know, I gave this prescription 20, 30 years ago. Walk barefoot whenever you have a chance on anything. And barefoot in the mornings, that's the saying in Pakistan, that you, you know, walk barefoot in the mornings. So grounding is the first exercise that I give people, grounding and standing. And the second exercise is, is what I call tracking. But we'll, get, we'll go through each one of them. These are things, uh, the, the grounding exercise Hello. Is that good? I don't know why that's funny. No. Is that better? Is that better? Okay. I'll speak up. So the first exercise, again from my teacher, Alexander Lowen. I did this one at the last workshop, I, but I don't usually, it's not written in my uh, documents that I send out to people I work with. But this one is just simply when your knees are, you learn and develop the ability to stand on your own two feet. That means not this one or that one, but both feet equally. And notice how that's different than putting your weight on one. Notice how much more solid you feel. As is the body, so is the self. If the body feels grounded and strong in itself, this is what it addicts people to working out at the gym. They feel stronger, their body muscles get stronger, and then they say, hey, this is great, it feels great. I'm gonna do this until I have big, huge muscles and I'm, I'm a disaster. Stop for a look. Uh, because you become addicted to that and, and you become addicted to how you look from it, which is unfortunate. But the point is if you feel stronger, you feel stronger on all levels, not just in the body. Now the way you're standing like this, go ahead, go, ahead, go back. This, this is, is anybody familiar with this posture? Come on. It's called, it's called the, the posture of, of, of uh, power. It's a power posture. It's like, you know, when, when some say, I told you to do such and such. It's not the same as, I told you to do such and such. <laughs> the body speaks at all times and all gestures. And tone of voice. We'll get to tone of voice hopefully before this time is over. We have very little time to do all this stuff. But again, as Yasin mentioned, the programs that are going to be opening after this workshop, that will be open to anyone, to all of you, especially because you're here, will be more in more detail with all of these things that inshallah uh, you, know, you can make use of with videos and stuff like that. And it's, alhamdulillah, a wonderful team. It's, people that are doing this thing for me because I have not been able to write a book to include all this stuff. So, so the first exercise from, from my beloved teacher, Dr. Lowen, 
is one in which you keep your knees unlocked when you stand, first of all, and develop the ability to do that and, and the, the habit of doing it. When you're waiting in line, just notice what it's like to lock your knees, what it's like to stand on one leg, and then notice what it's like to stand equally on both legs, equally divided weight, and how that gives you a better sense of strength in yourself. No, you don't need to strengthen. In fact, letting your stomach go is a goal at some point, but we can get to that at a later time. But it's equally on both feet. We have another, I'll get to another exercise before we finish uh, on, the, on the standing. But this exercise is simply one in which you bend and you bend your knees and you touch the floor with your fingertips. Go ahead. So just bend down between your knees. Touch, but don't rest on your fingertips. Don't rest on your fingertips, but just hold your fingertips there, and your legs are bent. Uh, <laughs> you can get, you, that's better. Yeah, well, actually, you'll spot. So you've got some stress on your legs. Keep your feet on the ground flat if you can. Okay, and just hold them there, and notice what that feels like. If you can't do it, it's all right. Uh, but the whole, the whole thing is, is maybe your legs will begin to tremor a bit. Any tremoring? Now you're not, remember you're not weight resting on your hands. You're just touching the floor. You're every, all your weight's on your feet and your thighs, your legs. Right? Okay, now that's a grounding exercise. Now if you very slowly, slowly stand up. Keep your knees unlocked, and now stand on your toe feet. If you noticed how you were before you went into this, and how you feel now, you should feel more on the ground. Am I wrong? Do you feel that? It's going to be different for a lot of people. Now, the next exercise, the next part of this, there's endless exercises for grounding. When I was doing this at a, a group of people in, uh, who were in trauma, learning trauma therapy, somatic therapy, years ago I did this. And, and I said, well, one of my grounding exercises is what we call salah, it's prayer. Because our prayer is standing, bowing, and prostrating on seven points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven points on the ground. And I had the, the, the and all of these therapists, none of them Muslims, they said, well, can you show us how to do it? And, we, they, and I said, well, why don't you line up? And so they, we all did it. <laughs> and we, we ended up doing rakats, you know, a couple of rakats. And at the end of the rakats, it was the time, Stafferlaw, you know, I, I, I hate to even mention this. It was the time when we first began, it's, it hurts me to say this, began bombing Afghanistan. And one of the women at the end, a couple of women then started crying and said, this is what the people were bombing do as a regular practice. You know, that was a wonderful thing. That they were appropriately understanding from that. So that's grounding. Now this grounding, the other really simple grounding exercise, and this can be done with the hands on the hip. The hands on the hip part of this, I often give this to young people who are going exams. And this is just simply bending at the knees, keeping your upper body upright, and bending at the knees until you feel pressure on your quadriceps and legs, and you begin to, it begins to either burn, hurt, or maybe even tremor. Just that. Any, any tremoring, any burning? Tremoring? The tremoring is a good thing. Let me say this. One of the things we misunderstand about the body is that tremoring is not a bad thing. Tremoring is a good thing. And it's bringing about a better state. The body tremors naturally with stress and it achieves something by the tremoring. So this is the basic exercise. People that do that going into exams, if they want to do it with more for the women, more of this, because the women are the ones have been, you know, pushed down for so many, many years, centuries, or you should say, or whatever, across the board, to do this uh, until you feel the burning, and then slowly straighten up. Notice what your legs feel like, but don't lock your knees, and then notice what it's like. It's very simply and carefully. Make any kind of movements and steps. And one of my teachers said, if you can make three steps 
with total awareness of what's happening, consciously and with that recognizing and experiencing it immediately and fully and directly, three steps would bring some sort of spiritual arrival by that simple act. This is a mindfulness principle that some people, when they teach mindfulness, do teach these things. Awareness and paying attention to the body and following and tracking the body in the, all of these kind of meditative mindfulness, uh, all these various exercises and practices, martial arts, all these different things can be effective providing they integrated and they're understood and they're taught and the person experiences something from it. So you notice I said experiences something. And notice what I did with my body. Now I don't have to do that consciously. I've learned to do it. One day I was giving a lecture in England and I'd been studying these things and I, I realized that I was saying, and not only that, but you know, and I, I, whatever I was saying, this represented what I was talking about. Like, not only that, I, just, I thought, what, what am I doing here? I was speaking with my body as much as I was with my voice. We'll get to the voice because the voice and the modulation of the voice is huge, huge, huge. And just as a head, heads up on that, it's not in the words, it's in the tone of the voice. And women know this because men often don't know it because they have words. And parents often don't know it because the children, it's just words. But it's the tone of voice that tells the message. And it's much bigger than the words. Okay? So that's, <clears throat> now this other, this exercise is so again from Dr. Lowen. In this one, you have your knees unlocked, you relax your arms, you're just there. Could do it with that too, but, and you let your body move, the weight of your body move forward to the front of your toes. To the, the balls and toes of your feet. And notice your overall state and the quality of that. And hold that. And then move back where most of your weight is on the heels. And then compare it again. Forward. Heels. What's the difference? What's your experience? What's, what's the difference in the overall state? Hello? You have to have more trust on your heels. How else might that be framed? For anyone, what did anyone experience the difference? You felt, on forward, you felt you had more control. Well, the forward is, both are correct. Yeah. Flow, what about flow? If you move back and forth, yeah. But the difference between the forward and the back. The forward position is an active position. You know, they, they say on your toes. Ready, get ready, get set. You're on your toes. Now, we'll get the yawning later. That's good. That means you're coming more into your body. So I'll get to that more later, maybe even tomorrow. I don't, how many, I hope you can be here tomorrow because I might like to go more into the yawning and the value of yawning. In spite of the hadith, which is not about yawning to wake up, because yawning awakens us. One of the overlooked realities of living, living creatures, all living creatures, overlooked. Okay? And all I have to do is mention it, and it starts happening. Because it's totally involved with the social engagement mechanisms of our being. Connecting in ourselves and then connecting with others, okay? So this exercise, the forward position is active and the heels are passive. And if I were down on the ground, I would demonstrate the passive. When a person's on their heels, I would walk up to, the, to him and to a, one of the guys and I'd say, so you're on your heels and that means and I'd push him, you're a pushover because we can't defend ourselves on our heels. You know, the martial arts, it's like, this is, yeah, I'm on defense, I'm ready to go. So, but active and passing. Now, one of these workshops I did, okay, so let's do it again. Forward on the heel, on the toes, heels, uh, uh, balls, and then back. Now go to the middle. One of the workshops like this I did years ago, I suddenly, there was one, 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 
oh, oh. She just let out this, and everybody turned and she says, oh my God. She says, I just felt peace. I just felt this, that's this place in the middle that's not going somewhere to do something and not giving up. When I met Mike Sheikh in Morocco, I met all of his muqaddams, all the people around him, each one of them amazing. And I thought it was, and then when he came amongst them, I looked at him and I realized and I saw by seeing him at such total peace, I saw in all of these other people, highly spiritually evolved people, so to speak, there was degrees of striving for something or defeated by something. And in him, there was no striving for or defeat. He was just there. So presence is like, that's one of the qualities. When we, when we ask, well, what is presence? There's many things we can say about presence. To be or not to be was one of the great classic ones. That is no accident has been repeated over and over and almost everybody knows that phrase. True? And, we, and they say the Prophet Sallallahu was the most present of human beings. Present. <laughs> why, why don't? The body speaks with the body by gesture, by sensation, and it speaks of the vocabulary that is regular and consistent for each person. When I say something happened back that time, I'll make a gesture over my shoulder, and I speak about the future. I'm likely to do that. Now, it's unconscious. But all of these gestures we have, I mean, very few people have I ever been with in sessions in which, if they're doing this, if I ask them, what is it you're not saying? They almost always have, well, yeah, this is what I'm not saying. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Now, we don't want to get caught up in, it, in decoding and seeing something beneath, well, that's what I mean. No, because there's variations on this. And we, we want these things to flow organically and naturally and with good uh, uh, good and good adab with each other, you know, with honoring each other. But so so she she found this place of the middle. Now the next exercise is a little more detailed, and this are these are things that I send out. You know, I have written these things out, and then the videos that will be coming out available to everybody if you sign up for them. They I go in with more detail, describing in more detail to do the exercises and kind of the implications. The implications are great. And the implications of all these simple hikmas that I've listed on that list, you know, that's what I'm saying. I hope we can, as a community, collectively begin to develop these principles and use them as foundational understandings. Like one of the ones I mentioned earlier, which is anything that we cannot assimilate or eliminate becomes trauma that's established. And uh, you, know, you don't find that principle in a lot of the people who do trauma. And, you know, the thousands now that are doing it. They don't, they don't try to see that basic under. under. Now, the, the, the yawning is good. Okay, and even in this, yawning wakes us up. I don't want to get to that too soon because later on we'll, we'll, I'm going to have, we'll, we'll talk about yawning. But uh, so the, the standing exercises, so uh, this one, and you stand, it, you find the midpoint. There's forward, back, and there's the midpoint. And from the midpoint, what you do is you put your weight on your left foot. And notice what it feels like, your foot pressing on the floor with your weight. Right? Got it? Shift to the right. Put your weight on the right foot. Pushing down. Notice the pushing down there. And now move to the middle. It's less weight because they're, sh they're shared. But notice what it's like now to have both feet on the ground pushing and the balance is there or whatever else you notice. Okay. Now this next, you move to the left foot again. Feel that left foot once again. But now feel the pressure in your knee and the weight pushing on the knee to the foot to the floor. Got it? Then the right knee, foot, floor. Right? Got it? Maybe might be harder. There's less nerves in the knee than the foot. Less active nerves. Then the middle, both knees, both feet, floor. Notice what you're feeling inside also generally as you do this. Now you're off to one side. Move to the middle. Because a lot of people at this point, they will begin when just by it's grounding. In fact, you experience that you're on the ground. Jalaluddin Rumi said, with our feet on the ground and our heads in the heavens. 
planted, well planted. Very often people will experience in these kind of exercises, good. These, they will experience as if they have roots going into the ground. And the truth of the matter is there is actually a dynamic reality physically between the feet and the ground. The roots, it's, it's like, I, I won't get too carried away on the details, but from a physics point of view, we're grounded. If we feel grounded, there's something happening between our feet and whatever we're standing on. Yeah, I, I, I kind of avoid those terms because I don't want to get confused with these other ideas, you know. I mean, it's not that they're not true, but yeah, we have chakras everywhere, so. <laughs> this the chakra, the middle finger, the middle finger chakra, that's. <laughs> I, that sort of came out accidentally. I mean, finger, fingertips have them, I suppose. Not, not, I mean, not with due respect. I mean, yeah, you can use that method. But, but you know, at this, I'm trying to use, make this very experiential, you know, grounding as, uh, experiences and exercises. So now you do the same thing again to your left. Now this time, feel the weight and the pressure on your hip to your knee, to the foot, to the floor. Can you get that? Some people, it's harder because these are different qualities of nerve, uh, sensory nerves. And then likewise, the right hip, knee, foot, floor, and then back here, both hips, knee, foot, floor. And if you need to take a breath, but take a breath, nothing wrong with that. Can you feel that your body has weight on your own two feet? That's the goal of this exercise. I'm standing on my own two feet equally. And if you do this exercise, you sure there's a little bit more sense of solidity on solid. The other term we use is on solid ground. You know, we, we say, oh, that person's on shaky ground. But we can feel we're on solid ground. So those are grounding exercises. The other one is what I call bouncy knees. And for any of you who might be coming to the Dekker tonight, one of the practices that we'll be doing is the Hadra. And the word hadra means presence. And that is done by uh, Sufis across the world, not all of them. Some do. Some are call it, considered controversial. Some of it scares them because it's pretty dramatic. And, you know, but, but I think we need dramatic worship and dramatic exercises and practices in a more than dramatic world out there <laughs> that's facing us and our children. And the truth of the matter is, when these practices are in place, we find young people attracted to doing them and engaged with their Islam more. That's an important piece. So this one is bouncing knees. Bouncing knees is just, and it can be done. This it's good with the hips, but every time you, every time with a downward thrust, you feel push on the ground, push on the ground. Feel your weight pushing on the floor. Feel the bottom of your feet. Feel that. Feel that weight pushing each time. Bounce. Push, 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 push. And then the hadra and the exercise and the dance, you know, with singing, we do <laughs> breathing <coughs> <coughs> along with it. Okay? So that, <coughs> you do that for a while until your legs begin to feel <coughs> some stress. And when you stop and don't lock your knees, what do your legs feel like, generally speaking? What do you feel in your legs now? Lighter? A lot of people feel heavier. More typically, you feel heavier. They feel bigger. Huh? <laughs> maybe, maybe. But the stress, anyway, more typically, people feel they're like they have. I mean, our legs are extraordinary things. You know, the, the Moroccans refer to the, you know, the number 11 bus. We don't use it anymore. We don't walk. We, in where I live, I mean, you know, you see people walking in the street, you think, what's that person doing out there walking? So <clears throat> that's the first stage. And there's lots of other grounding exercises. Riding horses is grounding. Not because you're on the ground, but because you need that balance. And anytime you're balancing, you're aware, you're aware of your body and your body weight and your center of gravity and all these kinds of things. And if you walk something complex, 
on something complex, the balance and the, the, the maneuvering and the changing of the balance will bring in this whole, this whole business of the feet. From the feet, all these nerves go up and they reach all parts of our body and the, the vestibular mechanisms of balance in our ear, our feet inform us of where we are at all times. And that's how we can walk without, you know, without falling over or walking into a wall, except when I'm really, really tired and there's been a lot of smoke in New Mexico, and then I have a hard time doing that. <laughs> okay, so that's the first thing. The second one, I guess we could sit down for this. How are you guys feeling standing up? <laughs> that would invigorate the whole, <laughs> the whole uh, process, the hadra. But anyway, that hadra, you know, there, it's controversial, but I, I will say this, that one of the local scholars, very well-known local scholar, I won't mention his name, but we were walking along and he said to me, he said, how came you know we should all do hadra? And, and then he realized there were student, his students were behind him, and then he said to me, he said, for our bodies. And uh, I don't have to m mention his name because you probably think of the most well-known scholar in the local area. A, a convert that, you know, anyway. And I've seen him do Hadra spontaneously in places like when we, when we went to visit Bridal Vale Falls, we climbed to the second tier. Do people know Bridal Vale Falls in Yosemite? It's this, it's this waterfall, it's just all this. We got up to the second level climbing where this, all the water is all coming down to mist and stuff. And, and he just started going. <laughs> Started the spontaneous author. We used to do that. We used to do it all the time, wherever we were, in the middle of a supermarket. Or I was in the back of a truck in Algeria, driving down a mountain, curving past, and all the men in the back of this truck stood up in a circle and started doing the hadra. We need these things in dark times. Vigorous worship and strong presence in our bodies, in our worship, that we in turn share with the world and connect with the world through and by. Okay. So the next exercise I give is what I call tracking. So <clears throat> tracking is this. Basically my wife had a, a t-shirt uh, that said, said, what do you notice in your body? Attention, again, mind is Verb, it means to pay attention to something. If I'm interested in VW bugs, I'll go out and I'll see everywhere they'll see VW bugs. Old ones, new ones, whatever. What you're looking for, you'll find. So we, this is something we shared earlier. And we all know this principle. Um, so tracking is a, an exercise that I give people to do, first of all, primarily with positive, resourceful, positive things to begin with, until you get good at it. And this means if you think, like all of you, can you remember a time in your life where things were really, really good for you? Everything was on track. You were really who you were meant to be. Just think of the time. We're not going to try to remember what was happening that time, but just think of that time and the year, how old you were. People have that? Anybody have trouble having that, finding that, remembering? Any time like that? You can't remember a time like that? Never a time where you were good, where things were really great for you? <laughs> no, you laughed. <laughs> right? You know, the worst, in the worst circumstances, we all have by Allah's design. We all have times in which we laugh, and we have good times. And it's OK. Not, not, maybe not overall. Sorry? Our lifetime, the lifetime, huh? The mo a moment in your life. Oh, a moment. Yeah. No, no, not a great, cold, good life. No, just a moment in your life, a time in which you felt that I'm, things are great. Yeah. Felt really positive. Now, take a imagine yourself at that time. In a picture, not try, don't go back and try to remember what was happening and doing the details in your mind. Well, this was happening, that was happening, and therefore I felt this or didn't feel that, whatever. But imagine an image of yourself like a photo, 
snapshot and the place you would be in. Can you do it? I've got a few nods. Okay. If you can do that, then go from that image to your body. What do you notice in your body from that image? Here I am, five years old, on a green grassy field. My brother's there. Sorry? Sorry? Electricity you feel in your body. Where do you feel electricity in your body? A whole sensation in your body. Okay. Anybody else? Deeper breath. Okay. What? Gratitude. gratitude. What does gratitude feel like? What What's the physical experience of gratitude in your body? Physically, not a gratitude's a concept. Hmm? Tears. Tears. Tears that want to come. Okay. Nowhere, nowhere do we turn, but there is the face of Allah. This is a we believe that this. this is the truth. Nowhere can we turn, but there is the face of Allah with all of his manifestations, the good, the bad, the wonderful, the Jalali and the Jamali. Yes? This is an exercise in which we ground our experience and being where we are. We develop the ability to be present with the reality that we find ourselves in at any given time. We start with positive things. And the reason for that is, as we develop this and coming back into the body, we're recovering and remembering something that we left behind from childhood because life was too difficult to feel and be present. And we learned how to shut down. Depression, depression is not sadness or, 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 or sadness or, or melancholy. Depression is the lack of feeling. We shut down feeling because life is too much. The slings and arrows of life, Shakespeare said. The slings and arrows of life, we take arms against it, to it. And that means we recover. Re I equate recovery with spiritual path, with healing, with becoming whole, with finding ourselves, with getting in tune with our fitra, with our primordial first nature, with becoming who we were designed to be by Allah. One, po one poem, uh, a poet wrote in one poem, he said, we live in a time in which animals don't know what animal they're supposed to be. And we're the biggest example of that. We're supposed to be human beings. And that means all of these things that we know intrinsically and we've learned and we've heard about. The Prophet said, his people, his, his, his wives, all of, you know, we know what it means because it's inherent in our DNA. And our biggest problem is that we're not being what we're meant to be. <laughs> Hello? That's why every, every psychic and every fortune teller can say, well, you have a great potential and you're not living it out. Say, oh, God, that guy really knows me. <laughs> yeah, duh. But I, I promise you this. Listen, if you take this principle and recognize I can become what I'm meant to be, and that is going to be unique from everybody else, not different completely because we share all these things as human beings, but unique. We share that quality of Allah, of farid, farid, uniqueness. Because every single thing that happened to us in every moment of every day, of every month, of every year after year after year after year, was designed for that to happen for us, to us, independently, by Allah. And that is a khaliq, al bali, a musawir, building who we're meant to be and what we are now. And our problem is we're not uncovering that truth and becoming what we are inherently by truth. And we're still living in the lies that we were taught us, we were taught to believe when we were young. Three quarters of this is extricating ourselves. And I, and I do this because a lot of people in the somatic work will actually extricate themselves from what are like bonds that hold them. Getting free from our familial patterns, our cultural patterns, and all the lies we were taught at school and wherever we were taught those lies and becoming free. This is, this is my teacher used to say, this is the stretch of freedom. He used to have me stretch my arms and he'd say, okay, your arms is far out, they go as far as, he says, now stretch them a couple of inches on both sides further. And you can do it. And if you take a breath and exhale, 
and stretch them again, they'll stretch even further. The same with if you if you if you turn your head, turn your head as far as it wants to go. Now take a breath and then exhale. And when you exhale, move it a little bit more. And do it again. Take a breath and move more. And it'll keep going quite far. When we exhale, when we inhale, when we inhale, everything in the body contracts. Even the capillaries in the skin contract. When we exhale, they want to let go. When we inhale, our nervous systems charge up and activate. And when we exhale, they want to rest and relax. When the child looks at the mother, depending upon what's happening with the mother and the child, more or less, but even then, even when the child looks at the mother, the mother, there's a charge up. And then when they look away and leave, a settling. If that doesn't happen and the mother is constantly, well, why don't you look at me? Why, if the mother insists, the child will have an aversion to the mother. Same thing in, as time goes on. You know, the danger and the disaster of, of helicopter moms. Mother must be there to minister for all the things the child goes through. The happiness, the sadness, the anger, all this. It's okay, don't be. I'm here, so forth. But constantly being on them, you should do this, you should do that, blah, blah, blah. We know this, yes? OK, so to learn these things, if you learn these things, it means, the, I believe this, the capability of changing and bringing more integrity in yourself. If you do this, whatever you do in the world will improve. If you're doing good things, I mean, it will improve. And one of the principles that I don't know if I mentioned here, it may have been just in quick discussions, is that anything we learn, and learning is something we need to look at more deeply in, in terms of the hikmah of it, learning is engagement. And being present means that we're awake, relatively awake. If we're half asleep, you know, and we, we, we're awakened by dra dramatic things. It's like the example I always give is, for me, it was when Kennedy was shot. I remember that day, and I remember everything that happened. When 9-11 happened, most people can say, and they'll go reiterate to people say, well, I'm, I was in the tower, and I was in this blah, blah, and they'll describe where they were and what was happening. Because that memory is strong by waking up for a moment for that time. Some people have a, a, a wakeness more often, more in a greater degree than others. They're present. But if we develop a wakeness and presence, it's not a scholarly feat. It's not by learning more. It's by being present. And you'll find people who are very present from the work they do, carpenters and uh, car mechanics and whatever they might be, taxi drivers. They have presence. And a lot of that presence from, is from their learning by being present in a world in which Allah is teaching them at every moment and every second of every day. And they're awake enough to be able to take in and be changed by it. Not by, oh, I'm learning this lesson and it's this lesson and therefore this. It's not a, it's not a left brain. Now, the left brain and right brain Principle. I haven't gone into that much. Uh, there is a video I have from Cape Town about three or four years ago. I'm not sure how long ago it was, which I talk about left brain, right brain. But the left brain, right brain concepts. It, it used. To, I mean, it came became popular in the '60s, and then very shortly after that, all the science, the scientific world said, no, 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 this is all myth, and they sort of shoved it aside. And then what came was this neural imaging uh, wave in which demonstrated with the neural Im imaging of the brain and the body, it was demonstrating that, yeah, there's a right brain kind of thinking and being that is broader and it connects more with the body. So, so we can say that 95% of our memory is the, the, the memory created by feelings and experiences rather than didactic learning, left brain. 
with words and principles and diagrams, graphs. This one is an artistic learning. It's a learn it's a learning of feeling. Women are very generally stronger at it, although people say don't be mistaken, it's not right brain, it's feminine. No, no. It's not like that. We need all of these things working at once. Feet on the ground, head in the heavens, Romy said. We need left brain and right brain. And part of these exercises are the bringing about the ability when we pay attention to the sensations in the body, paying attention to the sensations, mean that we cognitively recognize what and where do I feel it? You said gratitude. What does gratitude feel like? You see, gratitude is a concept, and it's a, we can be in gratitude as a state. But what does the, what does that mean in the body? A lot of people say to me, "Well, I feel calm." Well, tell me more about calm, and that's that's going more deeply into it. Well, calm. It's and, and sometimes it helps if I say something like, "Well, calm." It's not metallic and thorny, is it? No, it's warm, soft. These kind of things. I mean, when I first started doing this work, with especially with men, I'd say, "Well, what do you notice in your body?" And they say, "Oh, nothing." My teacher, my teacher, we used to say when men, when people would say that, he said, "So you're dead, right? <laughs> you're dead because you know the, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of sensory nerves, and they're asleep, or what? Where are they? <laughs> because we learn not to." And in some cases, we consider that I'm a strong man. I'm not going to be waved by that. And that's OK to get the job done. But it's at the expense sometimes of having a empathy and sensitivity to others. Empathy in terms of the, the, as much as it can access or can identify, the, the degree of empathy has going, been going down every year across the world. This is the world we live in. Duh. Out there, like I say, out there on the highway, the so-called freeways, with 2,000 pounds of metal careening down the road at 80 miles an hour, you know, one wrong move in your strawberry jam, as my teacher used to say. You know, we can't imagine that doesn't affect us. And the fact that, you know, the, the, again, the saying I repeat and reiterate over and over is one of the Shuyuk in Morocco said, the flood in the time of Nuh was a flood of water. And the flood in our time is separation between us. I'm sorry? Separation from each other. And that separation from each other is it's insistent. The average size of the the, the, the typical, the normal, the, the average size of famine in, in Manhattan 15, 20 years ago was 1.2 people. In spite of all the people sitting on the steps in the Bronx, you know, I don't know if you people know. <laughs> they used to have great communities, people would have gatherings, you know, all kinds of people sitting on the steps and conversations in real community. But that's disappearing. It's disappearing from lack of time and from the just the uh, you know the living together. We used to know neighbors. I used to walk down the road with my father many many years ago. And we'd walk in and say, who lives in that house? Have you ever seen it? No. We'd go to the next house. He says, have you ever seen it? No, I've never seen it. Who lives in it? He says, are these neighbors? We never, we, no, we never have seen them ever. How can we call them neighbors? So uh, one, of the, one of my student, one of the men who called himself my student, and I, you know, I'm much more, he was much more a teacher to me, uh, Dr. Arthur Ali, who some of you may know, because he's from this neighborhood. Anyone know Arthur? Arthur Ali, yeah, mashallah. Just a, one of the best men I've ever known, mashallah. And I went to visit him. He became the he became this assistant director of alternative medicine at Yale. Uh, from UCLA eventually. But I went to visit him and we walked down the street with his son Yasin, uh, named after <laughs> with his son Yasin. And all the neighbors, there was a Saturday, and they're all doing things, and everybody's out there, uh, Yasin, how are you doing? They all wait, because when he moved there, he followed a suggestion. I said, what we should all, you should all do, go to your neighbors and invite them to come in for dinner, have dinner. And if they don't come, go back to the ones that didn't come and ask them again. And he said he did it a couple of times, and almost everybody finally came. And they all got to know the names, and they all became friends, and they connected. 
Now that was deep wisdom and action on Atar's part. And that's who he was. But you know, to go to make these things happen, it's like fighting, it's like swimming upstream. Because everything is asking us to become virtual. I mean, the great lesson of the COVID period was I the way I see it, I, it's kind of like God saying, Okay, you guys don't meet up with each other, try this. If you don't spend time with you, try this for a while. Now, now what do you think? You know, and I know so many people who say that. Now that that's passed, we want to come together. Yes. Ancestral, yeah. Well, there's, you know, the homeopaths have been on to the specifics of what we inherit genetically uh, for over 200 years, very specifically, and tracking them. Only in the past, say, 30, 40, 40 years, the field of epigenetics has come about, which identifies, again, these influences. Came out of the uh, Irish famine, mostly, you know, uh, that they saw the, the results that could be tracked and traced if you were part of that, that the inherited predisposition for that. And, 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 and probably, uh, you know, one of the predispositions was you're going to be real hungry when the time comes. You're going to want some potatoes. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, there is. But uh, by a lot of generosity, these inherited predispositions, by what we know, we were born pure. And these are only predispositions that we're not necessarily going to inherit. But you know, if, we, if, if that was in our family line, it probably would be useful take more care. And it's only the homeopaths that have got into it in detail and can address in a person what they call the miasms, the inherited negative predispositions and the families of those miasms. And then they can address them with homeopathic remedies and change, change the constitution, change the whole trajectory. Now speaking of trajectory, I want to get to another principle here. How are we for time? So can I reiterate what you just said? Tell me if it's right during the pandemic about separation. The pandemic, you were in an industry that in which you had to connect with people, and you said you weren't going to stop. Is that? Yes, I wasn't going to stop. Okay. And uh, actually, um, amongst the uh, builders, we started to do research immediately and found that we were going to ride around with a piece of paper saying we're essential workers in case we got pulled over because, you know, everybody's panicking, and we're like, we got to keep going. Yeah. Um, but in the time of... I guess that span, because that span is crazy. It's like, it's been two years. Yes. Um, the draw that I felt is that the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, has inherited from Rasulullah yes. in a way that is different from everything else in creation. In that, you know, Allah's sending of that event, that final blow, Yes. Once you've reached this certain distance from behavior, and yet we have the, you know, the coming of Rasulullah sallallahu allowing us to go into the end of time. Yet us as an ummah, we're supposed to be an example of this connection that you know you really see it in the Earthro series, where it's like you think that they were Arabs, the way they you see it in the what I'm in the Earthro series, the uh, Turkish series. Oh, oh, okay, this TV thing. I don't yeah. yeah. Where, you know, everyone is as if the Prophet Islam belongs to them. Yeah. You know, and, and it's what draws us together. So that's, you know, kind of like what we were saying in earlier. So just that, that separation thing. Like, we as an Ummah really got to realize that, like, we are connected by choice that Allah chose us to be Muslim. Yes and no. I mean, yes, because we should be. But we're not, we've not taken that lesson as deeply as we might have. I mean, um, people used to say to me, can you come to our community and talk about Islam for the youth or something? And I'd say, what community? You mean the community that gets together maybe for Juma, maybe once a year for Eid, and you have to drive a half hour to see your friends? I mean, we have to accept part of what I want to say, and the reason I say yes and no, is this is our mandate as Muslims, you know, to do that. 
But we haven't been doing it. Not the way we could have. I remember I was in Pakistan, and the, 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 when I was studying, the man who ran the big sugar company, Bawani, Ibrahim Bawani, I don't know if anybody knows his famous family, uh, he invited me to come to dinner at his house. And this, I was just in downtown Karachi, and I went to his house with him. And it was this apartment building in the middle of Karachi, just a plain old apartment building. You know, and we went in, he was on the, like, the fourth floor or something like that, and I thought, what's this, this guy, he's, he's a mag, you know, this, what they call them magnets, right? Mag, you know, mag, no, like a like economic financial magnet, whatever they call it, you know, big, big dude. Uh, and and uh, I thought, how can he be living here? And then I realized, and I found out that this entire apartment building would have had a common courtyard in the floors, and floors. it was all his family. One family, and that, that was all these extended family it was like you know, a thousand people all living together. All the children could go and play with each other. You know, that is a community. And in terms of, I don't know what your project is, but you mentioned, but my wife, when she was in England, she joined a co housing community. How many people know co housing? Co housing community? Nobody? You know co-housing. Co-housing communities are communities of people. It's not like hippie communes. It's usually professional people who can own a house or be part of a community in which they have common grounds and they all have a kind of, they have rules they will live by, like the, the community she was in, my wife was in, was the oldest one in, in England, in Straub. And they, no drugs or, or, or alcohol is allowed amongst that community. But they all can, you know, every day communicate with each other. They have kids to watch. They all know each other, and they have common ground. And every every member of the community has the opportunity to, to make a meal if they want to for everybody or not. And it's very kind of well managed and regulated. But you know, I, I know someone who is one of the major people involved in Zaytuna. She really kept Zaytuna running back in the early days. And she left, and she went to a co-housing community, and she said, she said, this is the way we should be living as Muslims, but no one's doing it. Well, maybe down the road, inshallah. Maybe that's, I don't know if that's a, your project, but. What's the, like, the biggest problem with what Twitter and everyone talks about, like, how they, you know, like, they're, like, Well, they do, I mean, I think they, they do, like most people, they, they manage. I mean, at the start, most of the people are well, well enough regulated for being socially, you know, managing. And then they do these things on their own. But I mean, very few people you find that are, they're not damaged in some way and don't need some help. I mean, I, I don't think it exists. I don't think it exists. And, and, and the question is always, well, are imams? There's an interesting study that's done by this man. I don't know how useful this is for any of you, but I think it's interesting to reflect upon and to know that there's a man who did a study on outcomes. And he has an organization of therapists, mental health workers, if you, you want. I don't like to use that term, mental health. I think it's, it's pretty short-sighted. It's not, I mean, that's kind of, it's, it's, it's got a stigma that's, you know, mental health. It's, and, and the DSM, you know, the Diagnostic Manual, and, and qualifying and naming all these psychological illnesses, just a poor attempt to be quote unquote scientific, like the medical field, which is disaster because it's not the same. The human being has endless, unnameable, and unrecognizable factors in what's going on. They're whole beings, you know. So uh, I lost my track. Oh, and the problem, yeah, so they deal with it individually, you know, just like people do here. But they keep this community part going. That, it's, the, thing, the thing is, traditionally in Muslim, you know what happened in, during COVID in Morocco? People, who knows what happened? Some of you know, I know some of you. Anybody familiar with what happened during the COVID time in Morocco? I mean, it's indicative of something really, really important. They all, when they were locked down completely, they couldn't go out. They went to their rooftops and they sang poems and chasidas from building top to building top. 
across the cities and the villages. I mean, well, what kind of, I mean, that's, that's a response. That's a, you, can't get, you can't do better than that. But it says something about their basic, you know, they weren't in there getting, I mean, in this country, what are they doing? People were going out buying as much toilet paper and guns. <laughs> it's like toilet paper and guns. Like, what does that say about the society? It's not good. And, and you know, in terms of what, how is this, what I'm giving you is, how is this meant to be back to, how is this meant to be useful? It's for all of us to wake up. Wake up and recognize that Allah gave us a mandate that's extraordinary. And by our lean, get the guidance that if we take it, take it on, and use it to transform ourselves and serve others, it's remarkable what it can do. And, 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 and I, I suggest that we must do it because it was like many, many years ago, there was a gathering, there was a gathering that was probably 30 years ago or something about all, with all these scientists and doctors and all these different people. And they got together and it was an international gathering. And the thing was, well, what do we do to deal with the future? And it wasn't about climate change or anything. It was about how do we manage the insanity that's coming about? How do we sustain ourselves emotionally, psychologically? How do we keep balanced in this world that's coming because it's going off the rails? That was 30, 40 years ago. And it's not gotten any better. One of my teachers in an old, old, in an, and with due respect, any therapists in here? I can say this to you, huh? And I don't mean this, I don't mean this to, do, to belittle therapists because thank God they're filling a gap uh, in, a, in a society, international society, that's bereft. We don't, I mean, one little, one young girl that was my, I worked with her from the time she was eight years old and she's about 14 now. And her both grandfather, her, both of her grandfathers died during COVID. And she said to her mom, this, and, and this moves me to tears every time I repeat this, she said to her mom, she said, can, can, how can be like my grandfather? And can we have regular sessions where I just talk to him? That's what the therapist has done for people. Carl Rogers. Carl Rogers talks, talks about how, you know, the, the therapist is this person that a person meets and they finally can tell their whole story because they know it's going to be kept private only between. They can let it out and speak to someone and they can trust they can not kind of spread it. They can say whatever. And that, for so many people, is like, ah, oh, thank God, you know. And that, ah, oh. it's like my teacher in Pakistan. Remember that this what I said earlier is that when we breathe in, the nervous system charges up, and when we breathe out, it's supposed to settle. My teacher in Pakistan, he people used to come to him for herbs and plants, whatever. They'd come from Germany all over the world. And then when they were leaving, he'd, if, if they were the right kind of person to do that, he'd maybe put his hand on their shoulder and say, as the final after, or give the prescription and everything as they're leaving, he'd say, you're going to be okay. And they would go, oh, thank you so much. And I'd look and i think, that's the medicine. Because <laughs> they oh, gave this great sigh of relief. It's trusting that you're going to be all right, but really trusting, not, you know, talk. We know more than talk because we hear beneath the talk and we believe beneath the talk. This is the great advice I get for husbands and wives. We have to go, huh? Break? Okay. Sorry? Oh, I left you hanging. That's that's for the next episode. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> well, the problem is, all of if, if I give this thing on the husbands and wives, all of the women will be going, yeah, and all the husbands will be going, I don't know about that. Yeah, so inshallah, if we're going to take just a 10-minute break just to uh, get outside. Have some tea if you'd like, and then be back at 3.15, inshallah. So we're in the, the final stretch of 
of uh, today. And one of the things we're going to pass around is one of these things. And for everybody online, we actually sent a link. Um, but if, if, for example, the exercises, you found them helpful, um, some of the things that are going to be coming out uh, on YouTube that, uh, you know, the team that's been uh, uh, basically creating this platform for Hakim will be providing. Um, go to here, hit subscribe. I know that's overused and it's, nobody wants to hear it, but um, it seems to be the best method to reach everybody. So uh, we're going to pass this around and again, um, just sign up because this is going to be the best way to get the videos. Um, that are coming out. And we have so far done, I think, 12. 12. There's 20, but 12 are sort of. Yeah. yeah. So 12 are going to be ready. And uh, a lot of information, like I said, like the exercises um, and other things and information that hasn't been out there before. So I know there's a lot of old stuff from, is it Mecha Centric or old videos? Uh, yeah, I'll go make those things. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's some, some old there. videos, but alhamdulillah, there's new 15, material. 15, 20 years old. Yeah, 15, 20 years old. So this is new stuff that's coming out, and alhamdulillah, it's, it's going to be just out there for anybody who wants to. But again, if you want to, you know, get the stuff as it comes out and as we edit it and as the team edit, edits it, uh, you know, I hate to say it, subscribe. <laughs> like, hey, guys, it's Hakeem. Hit subscribe. Um, and yeah, so, so alhamdulillah, just, just do that and... And you know we'll do them as quick as we can, and then we'll talk more about the curriculum that's going to be coming out of out of this stuff. So inshallah, but I'll I'll pass it over to Hakim inshallah. All right, sit down. Okay, my energy is beginning to wane a little bit, so I'll do what sometimes happens is just sit here. I I get very when I speak I like to use my body as I said earlier. And uh, don't underestimate the level of connection that you make with people when you are embodied. So the principle of connecting and being present in yourself, the principle, it's, it's, it relates to a huge reality. Because what I was saying earlier about all the data that we take in, Look at that 40,000 synaptic connecting, learning connections per second in the first two years. That continues as we get older. It diminishes to some degree because we begin to, you know, the, the connections have to do with language, learning language, learning to, learning to do more uh, involved and more detailed movement. Because all of these things mean building, building patterns and capabilities and memories, building memories in ourselves. And everything we learn, and I, I use this thousand and one nights because a thousand or someone mentioned Ertigal. Ertigal, these these series, they're all designed so you watch one piece, ah, well I've got to see what happens next. Ah, I gotta see what that's life. We don't always have the enthusiasm we need to recognize that every single day is a new day. There is no such thing as same old, same old. The amount of new material that comes in at every moment, in fact, is so much that if we were to take it in appropriately and fully, uh, to be honest, we probably wouldn't be able to walk down the street. We would be so overwhelmed. It's like I say to people, sometimes I feel like my biggest problem is not depression. I mean, I've, there's times when I feel depressed. There's times when I feel angry. There's times when I feel hopeful. We, we want to feel and be alive and all the things that that implies. And that's called, my, my teacher said, that's called being alive. And, and recovery in that is, is called coming back to life. Depression, as I said, is the lack of feeling. This is in my old videos from 20 years ago. And being alive is feeling. And feeling is too hard, so we shut it down, and we learn how not to not to have it. But if we could begin to appropriately, you know, take on being so alive that we experience things. Some people experience more than others. Certain types of people, and the homeopaths have been able to identify those hypersensitive people that when something happens, they experience it very deeply and fully. 
And then there's another side. And these are mizaj. These are different kinds of mizaj, mizaja. You know, they're different states and different maqam, different constitutions, we you say. But, but we're so much more complex than the constitution of earth, air, fire, and water. I mean, we're so complex, we can't measure it. And there are so many factors involved. And what the scientists have been trying to do for so long, the social scientists, they've been trying to scientificize their practices and their understanding by doing and using the medical field as an example, as a model, and then creating the DSM, that is the diagnostic manual, in which they can name this, this, this. And if you've got these qualities, you have, you know, borderline personality disorder. If you have these, these, you've got your schizophrenic, your psycho, you know, all these names. And that was an attempt to become more scientific. But the truth of the matter is, like I said before, I believe, like Carl Rogers said, I believe that the biggest thing the therapist brings to a client. How many therapists are? I asked, how many times have I asked this? I keep expecting to see all, all these hands go up. Usually there's a bunch. Uh, like he said, to have that one person that finally hears them. You know, they finally hear. You know, someone says, well, here's someone that hears me. Because one of the big, and back to the, the men and women, so we get to that one. I, I, there's other things I was going to say, but we did kind of leave off as the next episode. Well, the Prophet said, he said, woman has a domain that is enormous and women have no access or entry to it. Jalaluddin Rumi did a lot of com a commentary on that. And many of the Shia through the years have made commentary on what that is. A lot of people have gotten upset. Even one woman time, one time, you know, 15 years ago, somebody got upset when I said these things. Because she was looking to man as being, men as being this, you know, it's a difference. It's not one over the other. But we have to see, realize that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was Hanif. Hanif, he was Hanif in the sense that he went to the caves and meditated. And he got his revelation. And what did he do when he got his revelation? He left the cave, came back down to solid level ground, and he went to Khadija. And he didn't, he didn't ask to be comforted, which she did, wrapped him up. He asked for advice, for counsel. Am I crazy or I'm not crazy, basically? That's a significant beginning to this whole drama we call Islam. That was the first day, the first day of it. And that's why Ibn al-Arabi, the great Sheikh, he said, the path to God for men is through woman. That's not a little statement. The path to God is through woman. Now that, that could we we could we could see it as mother, but I know I mean I could give you examples and stories of men, men who have been transformed by their wives. Alhamdulillah, what a blessing. And finally healed of things they were never able to heal with from whatever spiritual practices, whatever therapies, whatever they might do. That was the final missing piece. And the, the, the wives and the women that are there and they're doing this, they know what I'm talking about. Because you know things and learning to trust what you know is the secret of your wisdom. Your God given wisdom and hard-earned wisdom in many cases. If you've been pregnant, if you've given birth to a child, hard-earned wisdom. We will never know, we will never have a clue of what the experience truly is like to have a menstrual cycle, to bleed every month. We'll never know that, let alone have a baby for nine months and give birth to another human. Along with all the other things that are involved by Allah's design in the creation of man and woman and the differences. But we men, so when, when couples come to me, and couples come to me with problems, I have had it for years, and the classic thing that one of my teachers said, he said, well, of course, it's always the 
couple comes and the man says, well, she's the problem. And she says, well, he's the problem. Duh, it's going to be like that. But my teacher said, and he's not a he wasn't a Muslim, he said, the onus is on men. The onus is on men to be able to see and to have the sensibility to understand the needs of this person, to really hear. The onus is on men to be able to hear, fully understand, and recognize the needs of the person they're in charge of, in charge of caring for, not demanding from. There are, there are lineages of scholars from Ibn Arabi, the scholars who say to their students, never ask your wife even to get you a glass of water. If they do, without you asking, you know, let alone demanding, woman, get in. I mean, it's a sad, and I have a very dear Libyan friend, Libyan friend, uh, who is a very, he, he's very knowledgeable. And he said, well, all of that, he said, all of that stuff was never in the traditional Islam. That was inherited from the misogynistic colonizers. It was never part of it. It was. I remember there, there, there was a man here today, I, maybe some of you, I don't want to mention his name, but one of the strongest men I know, standing on his own two feet, traditional knowledge, friends, all of the, all of the shiyukh used to come to his house when I was in Damascus. They all came to visit at his house. He didn't go to them, they came to him. And I remember once going into, uh, I was staying at their house, I once going into his living room, and this strong man with great wisdom and extraordinary family, he was sitting, he was, his mother was in his chair like this, makes me want to cry because that's the kind of people they were. He was sitting next to her on the floor with his arms around her legs and his head on her lap. And I thought, paradise at the feet of the mother. Mama. She was a mama. So this reality, to grasp that, and I've seen their stories, and I could give you examples in more time if I had more time of men who have had that final transformation come from finally a woman that they're able to hear and listen to. The balance is men have to be able to come down from their frightened place of abstraction. Where's uh, yellow shoes? Hear, hear me? I, I, mean, I just wanted, I wanted to be sure you were there. Men, we men have to learn how to come down from our abstracted left brain places of fear and abstraction to be safe from feelings, to be balanced on the ground, and not to be like a woman, and not to be, you know, on, uh, for them to be wearing the pants. It's nothing like that. Nothing like that. Say? Well, yeah, you, that's understatement if I've ever heard it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't argue with that much. Yeah, in one of our lectures way back in the day, I said, people say about women, they're, well, they're too emotional. And I, my comment was, well, thank God, they've probably saved humanity you know, through the years by at least expressing something. So my exercise that I give men and women, this is in response to that, and you can take this to your husbands, uh, and some of you men may take it off, but a lot of men don't do it. They don't even, they don't even share it. I said, well, share it with your wife. Then later I found, did you share it with your wife? Well, no. It's asking your wife once a week on a scale of one to 10, how am I doing as a husband and a father? Have you heard this from me, anybody? You've heard it. Some of you heard this. And when they say three, two, five, one woman said nine. I was shocked. Then you say, why? And the man, then the instruction, because the, the, the balance, <laughs> see, because of the voice, all we have to do is one time, as I said earlier, one time we raise our voice and we get that voice. And in the voice, we can carry the aggressive message, I'm in charge here. I'm alpha. <clears throat> That's our animal. We have to honor our animal nature 
Imam al Ghazali said, we honor it, we don't deny it. We run with it and we use it and we recognize it to our, to our, to our benefit. And as we get further in this, a little bit more today and tomorrow, if you can make it, inshallah, our animal nature in one of the hikmas, it's our animal that heals our animal and ourselves. It's our animal that heals our animal and ourselves. And if we try to use this brain, this thinking brain, it can affect the animal enough to do change and bring change. But in the end, it will be the animal that changes. And Allah designed in this as animals everything we need to heal from the most severe trauma. In the same way, not all things, because we can also reset bones and do all the stuff that we can't do. You know, when you get a cut, we don't have to demand the white cells, the blood cells, or the granulation of tissue. We don't have to order that and cognitively make that happen. It happens. And the same thing's true of most severe trauma, providing we allow it. But we've learned, mislearned, and we're taught to intervene for everything to be in control. Because we live in a, a paradigm of the world of control. And that is the result of fear. And the, the response to fear is, well, we have a problem. Let's, let's exert more control. And the sol problem will be solved. No. It doesn't get solved by more control. But that's kind of the existing paradigm. We have problems in the street. Well, let's get more police out there. Doesn't work. It's, he's got to get down to the root. You know, and I mean, same with all these social problems. And all of the social, political, all of these problems have the same character in that they're, they're configurations in reality. And they all operate under the same pattern of the sunnah of Allah, the, the custom of Allah, and the pattern of Allah in ourselves, in ourselves, Jimi Hendrix, and out there in the world, the same. We go out there in the world to learn about this, and we go in this to learn about that out there in the world. That is established principle, especially in the world of Tasawwuf. But it's the basic wisdom. So in marriage, men have to come down to earth, as the Prophet did. Women have to, and women have to come down to earth and, and, and develop the ability to hissen, uh, listen and hear. And men have, uh, women have to learn to trust what they know, discriminate, and not speak everything. But trust what they, what they know inherently and have the courage and the discrimination how and when to speak it with hikmah. And that's the wisdom of woman that must come forth. The number of women who are awliya probably outnumber the number of men as awliya way <laughs> far above the, all the others. And the men are the ones who, I'm this, I'm this, shake this, shake that, shake your booty. <laughs> but women have a natural inclination to just do it, not to make a big number out of it, not to become sort of, you know, not to be, you know, get some aggrandization about it. Do you, you follow what I'm saying? I, I see a lot of shaking heads here. It's important. Yes. Yes. Like to not trust her to be like in control when she feels comforted or something. That if I if I let this feeling be validated for not me, you think it's okay to just be uh, viewing emotions everywhere. All the time, yeah. 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 Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? And the truth of the matter is, if you learn if a man a man hasn't is it has it mandate to care for that woman, which means he has to be able to 
whatever they've gone through whatever they've gone through you know and 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 women have gone through a lot more abuse than men men have gone through a lot of too i mean but it's different kinds of abuse in different circumstances but even if they know that and that's a history the ability to stand strong with yaqeen and with compassion and to have the wisdom to be there for that person and to hear it be all right with it validated as you said because my teacher my teacher my beloved teacher i always say this about him he was a beloved man i mean the little time i spent with him and everybody that met him he wasn't a muslim but he if he discovered islam he would have loved the hadra i was always disappointed that he never had a chance to experience it but um um i forgot what i was going to say something that he told me yeah i can't remember now what, what was i saying before i said like no sing it validation yeah I'm, just, I'm sorry i lost that thread it was Yes. So did you all hear that? Did the people at home hear that? Just that he was saying, and I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, we're not, it's, it's not just that we're not trained, but, but the training that we would hope to have had is to become the kind of people who intrinsically and organically know this, to validate what a person's feeling and that it's okay. I mean, the great, the great thing that mothers do to child, to babies when they were young is all the emotions and the affect dynamics they go through. The mother is there saying, it's okay, you're being okay, it's all right, dear, you know, it, it can be angry, it's all right to be angry, it's all right, it's all pass, and blah, blah. you know, just consult consolation. And if we didn't get that and we, we didn't grow up, that's hard to learn it. But it is intrinsic for us to know it. I mean, it's in our being. Allah gave us everything we needed inside. What I was going to say from Dr. Lowe, and I remember now that I left off, was he said we have three kind of basic fears. The first fear is being open because it's vulnerable. So, you know, like I said, we, we go to a therapist or we go to somebody and we find somebody. I mean, how many times, and I'm sure all of you have someone who's come to you and said, I've never told this to anyone before, but, and then they'll tell you something true. Because there's a bunch of it. that's and that's that that's good sign. That means you're a trustworthy person for them. You know, they'll say that they trust you. And he said, so there's three basic fears people have: is being open because of the vulnerability. The second one is reaching out because you may be rejected. To be rejected or shunned is one of the most egregious things that happen to the human animal, to any mammal. 
to any any mammal when they get rejected by the by the flock, the tribe, the, the you know the herd, whatever it might be. You know all these different names. It's interesting we have all these different names. I love that they call it a group of lions. They call it a pride, a pride of lions. And and when you were, were shunned and were rejected from that group, when I was at UC Berkeley and I was working in the film department, there, the most popular film was uh, Baboon Social Behavior. And it was a long documentary defining and, and demonstrating all these complicated social patterns these baboons had. Each generation, his father, uncle, cousin, and it meant all these things that things they could do and they couldn't do. And it was, you know, they didn't read it in a book. They didn't get it from Margaret Mead. Who knows Margaret Mead? Anybody? They didn't get it from Margaret Mead or any, you know, sociologist. It was in their DNA. Very complicated. And if you went to a baboon and you wanted to give him a banana, you know, some tourists intervening, you know, coming in, you know, it may be that that person that baboon there was not allowed to have that that they'd have to go to that uncle or that person. <laughs> And the point there being that the, these structures are so are are complex, and the same thing with the structures that we've built in the past historically, and especially high context cultures when they were intact and healthy, were awesome, and from them came remarkable things and remarkable people. The problem is, the modern world came in. With the locomotives and engines, that <laughs> crashed all these things, destroyed, destroyed. You know when the, there's the uh, what do they call the people that were the uh, in Manchester the, the 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 ones that were against the the, the machines coming in. The what? The what? The Luddites. Yeah, the Luddites are still a mystery because there's no there's no Lud. Nobody knows who's, who who starts that movement. You know, it's a, but it's a really interesting story because the Luddites were not a, it wasn't they were afraid of losing jobs. What they said, the Luddites, they said, no, this will ruin society. To have machines making and doing the work that we used to do by hand. It will rent the fabric, and that's basically what it is, it was fabric makers, weavers and stuff. It will rent the and a lot of those Luddites Luddites became shunned and excluded. And they went to East Africa and became Muslims and pirates. But that was <laughs> also, <laughs> but it was an interesting story. You know, I mean, it's an awesome thing that took place. So being so being open, so being open and reaching out, reaching out as if we fear because we'd be shunned. It's terrible. And so children, what is this thing that we have in, in our youth these days in schools of bullying? I mean. It's, I mean, it's just it's, it's beyond belief. It's not okay. You know, there's some things that I, if I just speak about it to people, and I realize that as I'm speaking, and how egregious it is, how terrible it is. It's like the number of people that died from their own hand, then died in the Viet War, Vietnam War. I mean, how can I say that without being, you know, wait, something's really wrong here. More died than in actual war. Same thing. How these men and children are bullied. And then they, it's the worst thing that can happen to a person, to feel shunned. And anyone who's felt shunned, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, it cuts so deep because our nature is to be connected. And like I said to you, some people have said the opposite of addiction is connection. Because people, that's what they're missing. They're missing real human connection with other human beings like themselves. You know, that they feel part of. Are we all ready for time? Okay, let me just finish this. Lowen's third fear. His third fear, and this relates to what we're talking about with women, his third fear is, he said, the third fear we have is speaking out. And he said, and his, his genius, I think it was, he said, and we fear speaking out. He didn't say not because we're not heard. He said, speaking out we fear because. We feel will be destroyed. Because not being heard 
is like a message that says, you don't exist. I learned in Urdu just this last year. I probably didn't learn it because I can't remember. But the phrase is, what do you know? You're just a woman. What do you know? That's it. Anybody know that Urdu phrase? Huh? I don't remember it, but yeah, but you know what I said, and it's just, yeah, what do you know? Yeah. And that says, basically, because that, that message and that exchange and that configuration, it's not like you're not bearing here, it's like you don't exist. That's about validation, too. I'm feeling and saying, oh, you'll be all right, you, you, gotta, well, just, you need to do this, you need to do that, you know, blah, 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 blah. I mean, learning, like you said, we don't, we've never learned. Like, like what, what is it? Tell me. I'm sorry you feel that would be, but more, that exercise that I give, asking your wife on the scale of one to ten, then you listen to what she has to say. You don't say a word. You don't interrupt, especially. And when she's finished, you say, what else? And then, men, you take away what happens in your body. What do I feel in my body? What do I feel? How many men have come to me and we've done somatic work and I say, what do you feel in your body? And he says, nothing. Like I said, my teacher said, so you're dead then. That was Dr. Lohan who said that. He said, so you're dead. Yeah, and a lot of men are dead in terms of nuance of feeling. So questions and answers are questions. Let me just say this. One of the secrets of questions and answers is you know the answer to the question, if you have it. That's a long, I don't know if we'll have time to get into that whole thing, but it's a, it's a, it's a kind of deep truth about these things. Yes? Uh, as alaikum. <laughs> oh, sorry, what's the one? alaikum. <laughs> I thought, what happened to your voice? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, now, I was wondering, because you were talking a little bit about mental health and stuff like that. I was just curious, like, what would you say is, um, if it's not scientific necessarily, like, how would you treat things like bipolar and schizophrenia? Because those are very common nowadays. A lot of people have it. So how, how does the Hikmah tradition treat those? Ill, um, well, the, well, the Hikmah tradition has been lost. But you find it, you know, where you find a, a tradition of hikmah is usually in, in cultures that have not been damaged by the modern world so much. It's like uh, the story, I'm trying to think of who this, Johan Hari, does anyone know that name? Johan Hari, Lost Connections. He's got a TED Talk or something like that, but he's got a book called Lost Connections. And it's about connections and losing connections. And I, I probably should have that more details about that. But that's a book worth reading, Lost Connections. But it's about mental illness. And he talks about uh, visiting a, a, somewhere in Africa where this person was depressed. They, something happened, or maybe it was India. I've forgotten now the story. But the person's land was taken from him. And he was a farmer and had this land. and. Uh, the land was taken from him, and he was in grief because he couldn't live his life anymore as a farmer, and tradition as a farmer. And he was there for this event and what was happening. And so they, their medicine, you know what their medicine was? That healed him from the depression that he had? They gave him a cow. And he took the cow and he made it into his business and got milk and he got other cows. and. I mean, there were in place ways of dealing with difficulties that we've lost. In, in, in Algeria, I stayed with a man who was the, he was the warden of a prison, high security prison. He lived in the top floor of the prison with all the prisoners down below, the murderers and all these, you know. And uh, he was dying of a, of a fatal, a, illness of some kind. I don't know what it was. He was, he was dying. He was meant to, and the tradition there in Morocco and some of North Africa was they would do what they call the Laetal Shifa, uh, 
a healing night. And they go out and they got, get as many of the poor people as they can. The more the poorer they are, the more they are. They bring them in and they feed them. They sing, they, they sing, they make dicker. They sing casitas, they do all that, they make dicker, then they feed them really, really well, and then everybody makes dua for that person. And they, and this man I met, he was the warden of this prison, they all made dua for him, and they all these poor people and all these all the friends and you know, all all levels of the people. They all made dua, not only, you know, heal him. And also give him a really good job. <laughs> For them, that was the ideal of getting a job. And he became the warden of the prison. You know, he was there. Chico Ablocator was his, was his name. But that, there were these things that were in place. The therapist, 100 years ago, was called uncle, auntie, grandfather. They were people that we can. Nowadays, you go to a therapist. And the therapist has a schedule. Well, you we, ten sessions. You've been in twelve sessions, so it's time to. I'm going to have to let you go. It's, it's, this is it, and and I and I'm not I'm not allowed to to be friends with you. It's like what what happened there? You know, it used to be the doctor would come to the Sunday dinner in America. Yeah. And feelings. Yeah. Yeah, well, you see, I mean, there you've got a, the, the essence of a good therapist. A good therapist, I mean, th therapists, you don't give them advice, do you? That, that, that's any therapist is worth his, what, what, what is a therapist worth? <laughs> worth is, you know, the expression, worth something. Yeah, you listen. And you let them give advice to themselves because their healing is, they know. We all know what we need inside. And you give them the courage to make that journey to what they know they need and where they need, that where they know they need to go. But that used to be the grocery seller. I mean, when I used to go to Morocco, we'd go to these shiyuk and these scholars and we'd listen, we'd go, oh my God, you know, they then it would be true, it would be just overwhelming, your heart and tears and you know, amazing experiences to hear these truths. And then we'd go and get the cab and the cab driver on the driving the cab back, he would he would be too bitter on them. <laughs> By the time we got to the thing, we'd be <laughs> even more because he would be talking about whatever happened from the place of wisdom. These things used to be in place as a matter of fact, in communities. And even before the so-called mental illness, I don't like that term because I think it's, it's misleading, especially if it leads us to the idea that we've got something in the brain that needs to be altered with drugs. That, that book, Johan Hari, Lost Connections, it's about his journey when he discovered SSRIs, antidepressants, and tried to convince all of his friends, oh, this is the greatest thing at all. All of his depressed friends, SSRI, this is the answer. Ah. And then when it stopped working, he said, whoops, wait a minute. And then he began this long journey of research across the world. And he came up with this book called Lost Connections. That that's what was missing. And there's no, there's no single, it's not like one, you know, shoe fits all. It's not like that. Because hikama is about uh, arriving at some place in yourself where you you trust what Allah has given you and you use the wisdom that you've gotten. I mean, Allah says in his Quran, it says, he says, Allah will purify you, purify you. Or he will purify you, referring to the Prophet said, so will give you the guidance to purify you. You will the kitab, the, the principles in Quran, the Quranic principles, and the hikmah, which is considered by some uh, uh, meaning, some some would see the meaning of that, 
is it's a product of those other things. They all come together. And it's a li living thing. It's a living, alive thing. Do you know, I mean, I, I mean, how many times I've asked myself, well, what does this person need? And I, and I was once working with a medical doctor, and I had proper prescriptions with the license number on it and everything. And I used, for six years, I did that. I wrote prescriptions, and I, went, I wrote this prescription out for this man. I said, I said, I'm going to give you a prescription. And will you promise me you can do your best to follow it, even as hard as it might be for you to do this? He said, yes. And I wrote out, ride horses. I gave it to him. The guy turned white. <laughs> and he said, I've had a terrible fear, this incredible fear of horses my entire life. He said, I'll do it. But that, where did that come from? Allah is the one that heals. Whether it's antibiotics, even, I mean, there's even a place for psychotropic, you know, for uh, those drugs. There's Allah's mercy is in all things, including the antibiotic. And it's one of the things I teach people who are into natural medicine. Because a lot of them say, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that medicine. I'm going I'm to treat it naturally. Well, you know, I've been in situations. There was one man, I, I mean, they called, people called me to his house. The guy was dying from a perforated ulcer. And I knew, I said, this guy, you need to get him to the hospital. I said, no, no, we want to treat him naturally. Isn't there something we can do? Some yogurt or something. <laughs> I had to go and call the ambulance myself. And then years later, I met the guy up at random, and he, he was with friends. He came running over and said, friend, come and meet. This is how came. He saved my life. His mercy is, and, and, and the mercy, I once had a conversation with the head, the head of the British Pharmaceutical Association. He was the head of it. And he said to me personally, he said, well, personally, I believe 80% of our drugs are useless. And I said, oh, and he said, and I'm conservative. He said, my teacher really believes 90%. Allah is the one that heals. And there's much too much confusion about what a placebo is. And what, what's the other third term people use? Nicebo? Nocebo? Is that the other term? There's confusion about it because people don't understand. We'll get to this, and I don't, we may not get to it today. There's so much on my list of things to cover on the unseen. I mean, People, Muslims, we believe in the unseen. Dali Kal Kitab. Allah says at the beginning of his, the beginning after Fatiha, in the beginning of Bukhara, we believe in the unseen. Okay, let's believe in it. Let's not become New Agey and believe in willy nilly imagination. No, the unseen is a greater, greater realm than this aftermath, which is the result of the unseen. So Allah's generous. And he's generous in the sense that we can recover from all of these things, including the medications that become almost like a trap in some way. They become a dependence. But I've seen it through the years, many people. It takes some time, takes some time and some skill. And we could say artistry. It takes some artistry to move someone out of an addiction, knowing who they are, and knowing what will support them. And homeopathy as a medicine is, it, it was developed, the whole way in which homeopathy was produced, the way the medicines are produced, came from the Arabs. And the man who developed homeopathy in the modern times pretty definitely was a Muslim before he died. People don't know that. The Muslim, the Muslim doctors don't know that. And, and you go to Wikipedia, and the page on homeopathy is closed. You can't add anything. And it says, homeopathy is a pseudoscience, period. That's the first line. That's the first beginning of it. So there's lots to be done. Um, and I believe, personally, that understanding these basic foundational principles, the hikmas, that list, look over that list and look at each one and say, well, what does that mean? What does that imply? What are the implications of that? 
What does that mean about anything? This, that, this, that, or this, that. Like I say, the, the, the hikmah of anything we cannot assimilate or eliminate, that's a deep hikmah that relates to trauma, food, people, experiences. It, 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 it applies to so much. Everything we take in that we cannot assimilate and remain whole from. I mean, I remember this terrible experience, Yassine, where we were driving with some friends, and uh, the, the, one of the, the young boy in the car of our, the family that was with us, he went out and had to go and pee in the field. And he went out there, and he found the, a pornographic magazine, Allah. And he took that in. And his mother's reaction when she discovered the trauma and the drama that came from that. I worry for the kid because how does he integrate that? You know, uh, Sheikh Alalui. Who, who knows Sheikh Alalui? Uh, that's good. Mustafa Alalui. Radi Alalui. He said, he said, our path is in the Istinja. It's in Istinja. And Istinja is is a really beautiful practice. And it teaches us more than cleaning our butts and washing after being. You know, people, people say to me, well, don't tell, you know, don't talk about civilized people. There was a recent discussion about, you know, Muslims not being civilized or something. And, and some one of the Muslims said to me, well, you know, does civilized meaning think that you, you don't have to wash your, use a lota or something. You know, is that civilized? And wearing shoes on the floor in the house? No, that's not civilized at all. But the, the principle of a stinja is whatever you take in, the food, you assimilate what you can, nourish yourself with it can, you let the rest go, you wash, done with it. Same thing with all experiences. We want to be able to take in and be with whatever, not let it overwhelm us, or destroy us by toxicity. Take what we can from it. People who have come from, uh, you know, Me Too shakes, and they, they, they come to me and they say, oh, my, you know, and I can see they're totally destroyed by, by the betrayal they feel. I thought this guy's a high spiritual thing, and I still haven't gotten over him. I still really want to be with him and love him, but yeah, this other thing, you know, and they're struggling with it's a good example if you take in what you can, you assimilate, and you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You take, because the other deep interest, important secret is Allah's Rahman Rahim. Whatever it is you happen, whatever affliction, whatever so called mental illness you have, this in the end can be the gift of wisdom or compassion, or something that you yourself will discover when you pass through it and come out of it. You hear me? Your purity, your beauty, your magnificence remains intact. People come to me and say, there's one man that came to me, this makes me want to cry. I said to him, you can change, you can come out of this, and he said, What's the use? I'm going to go to hell anyway. That's a terrible belief. I said, only Allah, only Allah knows who's going to hell. You can come out of it. He told me about a dream he had. And in the dream, he couldn't open his hands. He could not open his hands and close. And when in the dream, either in the dream or afterwards in a session, he was able to open his hands and he realized it was his ability to ask Allah, make dua, to pray. The first step in the 12 steps, which is still one of the best therapies for addictions of any kind. So coming to these things, you know, the hikmah is coming in a deep way to oneself, first of all. And that means these disparate parts of our being begin to come together. Allah designed it to, that way. And the trouble we have is we want these things to become whole. One of the videos I send out to people and I, you know, in, I, is, a, is a video of an impala who is caught by a cheetah. And the, the cheetah has its, 
has its jaws on the neck of this Impala, and the Impala is effectively dead. It is in the state of what we call the mammalian diving reflex state, which means its heart stops, its breathing stops. It's effectively dead as a protective possum. You, me, all mammals have this capability. Which is called the mammalian diving reflex because when they discovered that if a person drowned and there was no heartbeat and there was no breath, they would pronounce them dead and it would be after a half hour. But now they know it, it can be longer. You can sustain that longer period if need be. And, and, and so you've got to give the chance for them to come back. But we do it in, in degrees. We shut down. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. More questions. Yes. We have one. Oh, sorry. Um, so um, I'm a person who kind of like overthinks things in my mind. Oh, really? Like the rest of us, you mean? <laughs> I, I yeah. don't know what other people are having in their minds. But like sometimes if I'm alone, I'll have the instinct to be like, speak it out loud. Yes. And, and I used to like really like not try to fight against that because I'm like, that's kind of crazy <laughs> to like just speak. And sometimes I'm like just talking out like a story of what happened and it's like, okay, I already know what happened. And I guess I sort of... I let myself do that now um, because it's, it's almost like I'm thinking about it. It's almost like you're playing, like a child will play out a scene or, or it's something that I need to say. It's almost like journaling, but it's like out loud. Uh, yeah. It's not like written. So I'm just curious as to what you would think about that. Or so, I'm like, is this like a sign that I just really need friends and I need to talk to people? <laughs> You know it's a, I mean? Or it's a sign of what? That I need to have more connections with humans so oh. that I can express this that way. I, know, I don't but know. It, sounds, it sounds interesting to me. It's like, the thing is, here's a principle too, I believe. Everything we feel can and really ideally must be expressed. Everything we feel can and must be expressed. Now, some things are more bigger than other things in terms of that need. But there are big things. If it's not, a, if it doesn't come out from us, it will destroy us. That was uh, Albert Camus, the French poet that said that. I mean, and I, whatever else he said, that's a principle. And everything that we feel can be expressed if it's done with compassion and hold, as much as we can, and holding to, uh, with, and, and done with some hikmah. There's ways, and we can learn this. People, some people are better at it than others. It sounds like you're learning a method to express what you feel. That's, that's, that's a great thing to be able to learn, and it's an artistic aspect of one's being to be able to express what you feel. I mean, the artist is the one that expresses what comes from within them. And it was Picasso and Freud both at the same time in the world who said, if that doesn't happen for the artist, they won't survive. It has to come out. Yeah. Really? Yeah, that's nice. I, I worked for a while with a, with a Jewish doctor under his licensure. And we only did homeopathy for years. And he was disabled. And I helped him with his disabilities so he could learn to walk and stuff like that, speak, somewhat speak. And he was so impressed with homeopathy, he said, let's open a clinic. We had a clinic for years. In any case, he once fell down when he was trying to walk. And he was so angry at God, that he gave him the finger. And I said, David, what are you doing? <laughs> Can't give God the finger. <laughs> and, and then I realized, wait a minute. There's a kind of 
very personal intimacy there. And that's who he was. And I kind of, after that, I, I thought, well, come to think of it, yeah, I'm, I, I'm not recommending it for anybody. <laughs> but with him, you know, I, I, I realized it was something that demonstrated his, his being sadiq, genuine. Do you know what I'm saying here? So, you know, artists, I love artists. My wife always complains that I know artists. If she sees some sort of hippie person that's like really new agey, she says, I know you like those kind of people. I say, well, no, that, that's not true. <laughs> but I do love one, definitely one kind of person in particular, the person who is struggling with themselves. I have a genuine love for that because I struggle with my own. And this is how many therapists, how many therapists have become therapists because they had some success in some way. And they said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this for others. Duh. But I love the person that has difficulty because I can do my best to help them to discover that they can do it themselves. And one of the things I love from one of my teachers is, is his line. It says, his line was, of course you can do this. Of course you can. Of course you can. Because you want it. And these people, these are the special people because, when, like I said in, the, in my lecture from Cape Town, I said, when a person comes to me to say they're depressed and ang have anxious anxiety and this problem and that problem, you know, what I recognize is that's because they're not accepting the status quo. In most cases, they've been hit and smashed by the world, by the family, by the culture, by the school, by whatever. And, and people who come with addictions, you know, one of the important things for them to know is their purity and their innocence is not only intact, but Allah says in the Quran, when you leave the path and come back, you come back at a higher place than when you left. This is a deep, absolutely wonderful principle. It's true. And that's true in husbands and wives. When you fight and you come back together, and friends, when you fight and you separate, when you come back together, the Prophet said, shall I tell you something better than prayer and fasting? You all know the answer to this, right? Maybe not. Shall I tell you something better? Well, of course. He said, it's reconciling the differences between people. Bringing peace between two people, or three people, or countries, or whatever. Family members. If we knew the value of family members and what we can do with them. One of the things, one of my new approaches to a lot of healing I'm doing is I call it allies and healing. For someone who's working to heal in any way, to find the ally in their family that can assist them in that journey, or more than one. My sister, God bless her, uh, helped me on my journey dramatically. And I saw that Allah was with us, because I would do something, and I'd share it with her, and then she'd tell me something. And the coincidence was so dramatic that I could see it was Allah's hand telling, you know, affirming, yes, you do this together. And this is the, the beauty of family systems therapy. My wife did family systems for years, in which we have, she worked with suicidal teenager. The suicidal teenager come in, comes in with as many family members as they can. And the very first session, almost always the first session, that suicidal, what they call the identified patient, not really, you know, discovers, hey, wait a minute, it's not me, it's this. It's the whole configuration. This is something we have to see and be able to discriminate who we are and what the world is. And that doesn't mean we become these exiles and you know rebels and all that. No, but we begin to discriminate and understand how do we how do we work and manage this insanity out there? What where where will we set our boundaries? What can we do not do? You know, I mentioned earlier about my, my wife 
we, we used to be, you know, for watching a television thing and then something happened. The other thing is the violence, the same. We don't watch it. You know, we just click fast forward and, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't take anything from the plot. But even to set your eyes on it, we don't want to, there's, you, you know, there's ways to manage this world. It's, it's what I, and with children, it's important to get that. How you debrief them effectively and successfully in the world. Because they'll go out there and they'll get poisoned. And how do you get that, you know, how do you, how do you enable them and teach them in the process? Because you, they will be learning in it. It's one of the great ways to learn. Providing they're fully debriefed. So it's, it's not just something, well, you should do this, you should do that. You're this is a good Muslim, this, blah, blah, blah. No. It's got to be real for them. So we have a lot of questions online about okay. mental health. In particular, um, OCD, depression, ADHD. What's a holistic approach to these? And how do people go about identifying <coughs> and healing from them? Okay, so OCD, ADHD. Well, all of these, how do we go about healing from them? I mean, the thing I mentioned earlier is a lot of people say that, I mean, the thing we're missing is connections. And the thing we're missing is connections with healthy people, healthy on all levels. And there was a movement some time ago, still, it's probably still around, in which people would treat these illnesses, the so-called illnesses, with uh, a setting in which there would be at least five therapists, quote unquote therapists, five clinicians to one person. Now that's hard to do. But if we look at that thing of genuine connections with, and I will add to it, not just people but with animals, real connections in which people begin to feel safe with that other. This is one of the things that can bring back a sense of security in, in, in a person and bring back balance and a clear understanding and viewing of the self and an integra integration. Our bodies and our beings are driving for resolution and integration in the first place. That's why we're quote unquote depressed. And we speak it, or anxious and speak it. When a person comes to the problem, it's better than someone who has no problems. Oh, I'm fine. Then they turn on the TV or take another drug or do another drink. I mean, we've got to look at this. We live in now, someone uh, named it this culture we live in, the, the post-alcoholic era. I mean, people are surviving. By drugging themselves. So, I mean, OCD, all of these things can be healed if a person were in, and this is easy to say, but almost impossible to bring about. They were in a healthy environment with people that were loving, that connected to them, that listened to them, that spent time with them, and interacted and engaged with them. But that's hard to bring about. But I will say this. The more we look at the things that bring people together, this is why I say, vicar, we need to make vicar in groups. We need to make it aloud so that we hear the voices of each other. The singing and the voices affect all of the nerves. Every, every pore is a nerve and an ear. This is the headquarters of ears. But every pore feels that. Every, and all these nerves, when we're singing, in, People to, and we're singing particular things in which the meaning means something. We know the meaning of the songs we're singing, the poems we're singing. Praising God, praising that reality. And especially in some cases where the things we're singing actually carry the messages from a cognitive point of view that to do what we need, what we need in terms of healing, whether we recognize it consciously or not. Coming together, and being with each other, feeding each other, drinking together. Uh, 
That, that's not exactly what I meant. <laughs> huh? Rumi? Well, yeah, drinking wine. I mean, the, the Sufis refer to this, this thing in which we can speak about certain things. And if we speak from our heart, other hearts respond. I mean, I remember my sheikh and the teachers in Morocco, they would give discourse about things, and people would break down crying. You know, that's what it's about, communicating with another person. Not communicating, connecting with another person, heart to heart. So these things can heal all of these things. And if we, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with a lot of the techniques that people have come up with for OCD. And I mean, although the OCD handbook, I looked at that thing one time and I thought, well, I don't know, I think this is a good idea to go through these exercises. It's affirming the fact that you have this thing called OCD. I mean, we have to realize that the, the psychological community at some point decided that it needed to be more scientific, so they wanted to take on the patterns and the modes of the scientists with definitions and, def and, and, the, and they created the DSM, the Diagnostic Manual. But I've had many people come to me and say, like someone said, well, I have, uh, uh, you know, I have ADD. And I said, no, you don't have ADD. Okay, first of all, I wouldn't say this to everybody. Because some people, some people feel a little portion of relief when they told, well, you have this or you have that, and it's named. In fact, there's a term that they use in, in psychology, they say name it and tame it. You know, which I say, well, yeah, but sometimes naming it is like fixing it too, you know, fixing it in place. And I said, you don't have that. You, you, you're, you, you're Fulan, and you're struggling with this and that and this, that, that's, and we all struggle with things. And the product of that struggle, when you succeed and get past it, will be a gift from Allah. And that's the way it works. And I say, well, I promise you, I know this so well. And if you speak with a person with certainty like that, they believe it. Because they, we recognize certainty in another person's voice. We know when they're saying, <laughs> they mean what they say. I remember a lecture I went to, and people were talking about the environment. environment one, got, one, one man was this, what's the guy that wrote, uh, uh, by, uh, Vidana Shiva, does anybody know Vidana Shiva? She's a Hindu woman, Vidana Shiva. I always, I'm always pleased when people, people, yeah, Vidana, she's a very extraordinary activist. I went to hear a lecture with her and the other man was uh, in absence of the sacred, you know that book? They were both talking about the environment. Santa Fe's always been in one of these places. They were both giving lectures, and the, and the two of them gave their lecture, and then she gave her lecture. And they both, some of the things he said was the same thing. But when she said it, bam, sorry, it went to my heart. When he said it, it was like I was, he was being read from a book or something. Do you get what I'm getting at here? And that's why the, 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 the Sufis in Morocco, the Darqawiyya, some of them say, there are wine is in our speech. It's not in the singing. It's in what we have to say heart to heart. Because that's where we, and I've seen people, you know, fall down from a lecture in those cases. When we make dhikr, we do dhikr in group, and that opens your heart and opens your being so that when you do that, after the dhikr and the hadra, the very vigorous exercise of expression of alhayu, you know, living, when you do that and you're hoping, then you hear the words. You, your, your state changes to a place where we can hear. That's what I was saying. For the husbands, it's not that you listen, it's that you hear. It's a, it's a step deeper than that. So OCD, I mean, uh, one of my favorite people, I love this man, he had OCD, he used to wipe, uh, his, he, his brother always wanted to borrow his car, and he had a car his brother didn't. He always wanted to borrow his car, but he cleaned everything. And he was afraid, mostly afraid of the things that weren't clean that, that would infect his family members. So he'd clean his car, and he wouldn't let his 
brother borrow his car because it would never get never get clean enough. He would use baby wipes, and if he wiped it once with a baby wipe, uh, it would be dirty, so he'd have to get a new baby wipe. And he said the hardest part is around the gas pedal. You know, it's hard to clean around that. And he was going on for this for a long time. And I gave him homeopathic homeopathic remedies, by the way, are one of the gifts of Allah. It's a hikmah of medicine for our times. Period. Nothing more to say. And that's another whole workshop upon workshop. But this things that we're talking about signing up for, these are things in which I talk more at length on these individual subjects. And we've got, you know, a lot. We have a lot coming, possibly, inshallah. But this man, anyway, one day I said to him, well, what, you know, what, uh, how's the cleaning going? And he said, oh, the cleaning. He said, well, I'm, I'm not bothering with that anymore. Excuse me? Wait a minute, it's been years. It's been a couple of years that I've been working with him. He said, in fact, I loaned my brother my car today. I said, really? And he said, yeah. And, he, and I said, well, What's what do you account for that? And and he's a really intelligent guy. That's the thing, people who are really intelligent have some of the worst difficulty. They're brilliant, and all you have to do is move them out of that place in which their their gifts are available for them and others. Shaul. So he said. I said that, and he said, well, you know, I think it was that exercise, and I give different exercises for different people, but one of the exercises they give to people, and this one I gave him, was that you take two small dumbbells, maybe three pounds, five pounds at the most. He's strong, so five pounds he can manage. And you use these dumbbells, not like this, to build some muscle or something, but you use it in terms of exploring your range of motion. Back to what Dr. Lowen said, he says, as is the body, so is the self. Okay? A stiff body is a stiff person. Right? A flexible body is a flexible. You're, there you are, flex, flexing, stretching. I hope some of you can come to How much more time do we have today? Oh, okay. Well, I hope you can come because tomorrow we're going to, I want to get into another exercise that's really interesting. And basically, I don't think you'll find it anywhere. That's my, that's my next episode. But a, way, a body with a wide range of motion is a habitat for the self with a wide range of motion read possibilities. Does that make sense, body guy? Yeah? So he said, I think it's that exercise. And I, he said, I particularly like this one where I stretch all the way around here in my body. It has a wider range of motion and movement. A body that can move in flexible, many different directions, translates as a person that has many possibilities. As is the body, so is the self. That's a very simple. The hikma that describes how and why that can be affected. Anyway. So there's ways. Allah is generous. That's my answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I hear what you're saying about like giving, like say that 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 um, the hakim that would give the herbs and then say, I really I think you'll be okay. Um, that concept, it makes sense because when someone else kind of has confidence in me and is encouraging, you feel like, like you can do it more, right? Yes. But um, so I'm a student midwife and I've been in people's labors and, and, and have tried to give them that confidence, but then you're like, I think you can do this. And then they can't, they end up in a C-section or something. And I feel yeah. like I've let them down uh, because I didn't know. Like, Allah is the only one who knows. And it's like, I want to say, inshallah, you can. But that almost, you know, astaghfirullah, like, that almost feels like you're doubting in a way. Like, yeah. so I struggle with this, I guess, in terms of my care for women in labor because I don't want to, like, give them false promises and I have no control over yeah. 
if it's going to happen or not. Well, well, uh, well, let me ask you, do you know absolutely with some women that they're going to go through it fine and they can do it? I never know. I mean, you never oh, know. Oh, you don't right? never know. You, there's not some I mean, that, really, that's interesting. Usually, if everything's going fine, they don't need encouragement. It's happening, right? Yeah. Um, but if a woman's in labor for 12 hours and you're like... Yeah, but I mean, she, the, the, the kind of person, do you have is any sense of the women who are supple and kind of in their fitra enough that you can sense they're going to do all right. They could be out in the de desert and they'd, made it, made, they'd do it. No? Um, I probably am not good enough at that yeah. to sense well, that. Well, the, the art of obstetrics, if you want to use that term, the art of midwifery mm. has been... My wife, my, my, not my wife, sorry. My daughter had two births that were half hour, 45 minutes. And she said it was mostly because she read this a book that I gave her to read with a chapter on the misogyny of doctors and men who convinced socially and collectively women that they couldn't do it without, you know, there was the, that one, it was the most difficult pain ever. And that, and that may be true, but that's not the point. Yeah. And, and the, the overriding, the, over, the overarching Belief. Ina May, Ina May who even spoke about this a lot, you know. Yeah. You know, Ina May. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that concept that, you know, it's an impossible, unnatural thing. Uh, I mean, we are mammals and we've lost our mammalian nature. And we will never have full, full, and our full, we'll never have full animal nature because we're humans. Mm. And that means we're a very particular kind of mammal. And will never achieve absolute animal proficiency. That's true. But that whole business of, you know, what we believe collectively becomes so powerful. You know, and you know this. Uh, if you're a midwife, then you know this. You know, I mean, I work. My clinic was in a mid, uh, birthing center in a midwifery co college mm. for years in Taos, and. You know, the, the, the woman who is the midwife there, I mean, I don't think she's, I mean, because, yeah, people have been affected. My daughter did that, but my other daughter didn't do it. She had disaster birth, you know? It was difficult. Let's say not disastrous. I'll be honest. My, my granddaughter came <laughs> far from a disaster. But it was, you know, the midwife screwed up, you know? But in any case, um, it's a hard one because that, that thing is so powerful, but, but basically it's one of those things we have to deal with that, that the world is really demented. It's, it's not only demented, it's diabolic. Is that all right to say that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> but every one of us has the capability as Muslims and as human beings to muster courage and bring the truth and bring light to all this stuff. But recognize it and seeing it for what it is. And we see it and we have a more balanced view of it, the more integrity we have within ourselves, the more connections we have with ourselves, that all the despair. We grow up, a we have a life of contradictions that we have to live with. I love my father, I love my mother, but they did this, and they did that, and they did this, and they do that. Okay, <laughs> how do I reconcile that? How do I bring that together in wholeness of myself? And when we begin to make that kind of wholeness and connecting and healing, that's a heal. Heal means to make whole. It comes from the word whole. To be to heal means to be made whole. And that was my first workshop was coherence. Co the first workshop was the coherence in the self. The second one was vibrancy. Vibrancy in the self, lively, being alive, fully alive. And what I'm, we're talking about here is this next step of wholeness in the self and connecting with others as a result. So I don't have an easy answer for that, you know, um, because I think that's probably a, a pretty major thing. I mean, there are a lot of things when you understand the fluidity and 
capability. I mean, the fact that a, a mother, a woman, can have a baby in the first place is pretty awesome. And when we begin to understand the body, when we begin to understand the body and the necessity for the equilibrium of the musculature and the structures, equilibrium in the sense that we have chronically tightened, am I right? Chronically tightened muscles and chronically lax muscles. And this is disparity in this in, in, in balance gives us posture and, and, and body shapes and all these things. You know, it was Ralph Waldo, Ralph Waldo Emerson again who said the body, we can, he said we can understand it, the body by understanding a huge tent in which we have a central pole and then we have all of these poles around the side, ropes, the tie lines, and each one of them has to be at the right tension, balancing the other one. And these people that get in there in the, in the, in, in the gym and they do this and they do this so until they have these bulging biceps. You know, and I feel badly for them because it's not helping. It's probably going to damage them because they could become muscle bound. It binds their sense of self rather than being the strength. I mean, one man that I recommend that didn't have this resources out is a man in Australia. His name is uh, uh, his name. I can't. I have trouble with names. But he says the strength of the body is in the flexibility. And these, not, not the hardness of the musculature, but the extraordinary equilibrium of the musculature comes. That's where strength comes. And the, and the, the flexibility and the agility and the grace of that. My cat, I learned this from my cat. I learned it earlier because I've studied the body from when I was very young, very young. And my cat, I used to watch my cat jump from the floor to a seven foot loft on her own. And I, and I looked and I watched and I realized she did it because she used every hair on her body from her whiskers to her end of her tail and every muscle and every part in harmony and in coherence together to do that one thing. She did it. It's amazing. But that's an animal, you know, some uh, athletes get that. They can get that very highly developed. Yeah, so that's a hard one. I used to, I learned that and I delivered uh, my first son. And then afterwards I said, okay, this is the work for women, not for me. And not because it was overwhelming, because I just realized that I'm not supposed to be here. They're supposed to, you guys are supposed to be there. And my, one of my daughter's best birth was uh, with other Muslim women reciting Quran during the birth, aloud. Clearly allowed, and the people in the hospital—they were it's the hospital. They were just people who don't even know what Quran is. They 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 love it and they respond to it. Sorry, done. I'll be done. Um, so there are people who sigh a lot, and sorry. There are people who sigh, sigh yeah. a lot. Yeah. So other than it being perhaps a coping mechanism or a type of release, is, there, is that an indication of something deeper? Like why do people do that? Well, I mean, it's a style in the homeopath realm. It's a style indicating a particular remedy. But that usually means a situation in which there has been emotional, something, emo something that's taking place in which they're emotionally trying to release. Because the sigh is a sigh of relief. When we inhale, tension, activation. When we exhale, should be settling. Should be. When there's not settling, I mean, if we had more time, we could do these experiments, experimenting with different breath frequencies. You know, two in, eight out. Four in, four out. Four in, two out and so forth. All of these will bring different states. And so people say, well, just breathe. No, it's not that simple. Breathe for some people if they just start breathing. Uh, and breathing and feeling, Dr. Lowen, breathing and feeling and sensation come together. Anyone who's depressed, even if they're on meds or not, they'll be only breathing slightly, very slightly. And we, we, limit, we delimit our breathing. 
and we shut down our breathing to manage the world that's too difficult emotionally. If you come tomorrow, we'll get into some, some other things about breathing and breath. Um, I, was, I wasn't, I wasn't going to let it out of the bag yet. But yeah, exactly. So, but the sigh, yeah, sighing is good. A lot of, a lot of times I'll sigh, my wife will say, are you okay? And I said, I'm sighing. Isn't that, a, isn't that a sign of being somewhat okay? Yeah, but it's usually a lot of, a lot of very high, high emotions that are not, that need processing, need letting go. People when they start breathing, people when they yawn, people when they stretch are coming back into their body. Coming back into their body, we can. We this this culture in the world's living out not in so-called undeveloped countries, but in the developed countries, everybody's outside of their body. I mean, what, I mean, there's a new thing which is virtual. These things to make umrah, virtual umrah. Wait, what? The, what? Excuse me. Something's wrong in that picture. Yeah. The what? Oh, okay, got it. Um, so you've talked about healing. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about healing through forgiveness. About forgiveness in the healing, or what? Yeah, healing through forgiveness. Well, um, how much time do we have? Okay, less than five minutes. Well, one of the things that's really important, I think, to recognize is that. Allah is the healer, right? Allah is the one who is kind. Allah is the one who is loving. In other words, it is a reality that we may or may not take, partake in pieces and parts of, parts of that. Allah is al Ghafur. He is the absolute in terms of forgiveness, and he dispenses that and allows it as he chooses. Our ability to forgive is not ours. Our ability to be forgiven is not ours. It's Allah's. So that's an important piece that we must recognize. We can pray, Allah, give me that ability to forgive. But I tell people, forgive the people that you did wrong. Not, you know, ask forgiveness of the people that did wrong to you. If we knew the value of that, and if we knew the value of forgiveness, we would be forgiving of everybody. But if you've been wronged, it's very natural to be angry and to not allow that and not be able to accept the principle that if I forgive, it's condoning. It's not condoning. It doesn't have to be. So there's that tricky kind of contradiction that takes place. You're all with me on this one, right? And there's a period of time when being angry is useful and valuable. There's a valuable point in most cases as people are coming out of being wrong terribly, feeling wrong terribly. There's a point at which forgiving, in, but it's not just forgiving because you're a spiritual person, you know, mashallah, but, but there are some people, who, if for, I mean, I've seen, I've seen people forgive the most egregious things, killing of their children. I know more than one, you know, person who forgave people who murdered their children. And it was real. And the one man said, you know, he was, he, he was at a convention, a, a gathering in which they were making peace between the Bloods and the Crips in L.A. And he was a Muslim who had worked with gangs, and he was living in Atlanta. And they invited him to come back because he'd been working with his gangs. And he went back, but with his, his intention was to kill these people to kill his son. And the thing, he got caught up in the, what was happening. And he got up on the stage and he said, he said, I, I want to be honest here. He said, I came and I wanted revenge on the people that killed my son. But he said, right now in front of all you, I'm going to forgive them for what they did. And he said, what came to him was peace like he'd never experienced. He said from that, by saying that, he walked outside and was just 
drizzling rain a little bit. He said he'd never believed it was possible to feel such peace in his being. But the reality is when people do wrong, I mean, to be honest, I've been dealing with trauma for years and years and years and years, and I've been, been dealing with trauma in which there are people who have mistreated. Mostly it's been, I mean, I had some men, but mostly women. And I honestly, my, in myself, I've had this image of a, a, a it's a metal, a wood, hardwood club. It's about this big, like this. And I had this image of taking this club to those people that did those things. And I make no bones about it. I, you know, yeah, I meant to beat the you know what out of them. So, so we, you know, there's a line we want to follow here, and we want to re honor and recognize our animal nature, which is to get angry, fight back, and to be angry in appropriate ways, but not to let it get out of hand and create worse than what happened in the first place. I don't know what else I get. It's a, a lot more that can be said about forgiveness. So, but the first thing I want is I want to underline is this thing. It's a quality of Allah. A, a kind mother is a quality of Allah that is coming through her to someone else. And all of these things. He is the actor in all of the world, in all of the things, whatever they might be. He is the, the one that acts. Alhamdulillah. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. Allahumma salli. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al Abdika wa Rasulika al Nabi al Nabi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Ya Allah, uh, bring blessings to this group and, and bring the best of intentions and rewards for the intentions by which everyone came here and satisfy their hopes and efforts. Allah, heal us all, heal us all, and give us the courage to see the ways in which we can bring our, our people together and how we can give ourselves the courage to do what's needed, to know and discriminate and see what it is that's needed and act upon those things and have the energy and the belief that you can support us in all this and protect protect us all, protect our children, and protect our children, and protect our children. And keep us on the path, and, and show us your mercy by making it even more beautiful and rewarding and wonderful than we could ever even imagine, inshallah. Subhanahu wa bika rabbil izzati amin asalim wa salamu ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillah wa ala alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Well, thank everybody uh, for coming in person and, and online. Um, inshallah, we'll continue tomorrow, 10 o'clock uh, here, and it'll be 10 Pacific Standard Time for the people online. Um, so just quick question. Did everybody get the link to sign up to do the subscription for YouTube? OK. Um, if you didn't, let us know, and we can get you the, the information. Um, so uh, a couple other things. So basically, we're looking at unrolling or rolling out a few. Um, you know, as, as Hakim said, we we indicated some some videos um, and some other information that are going to be coming out. The other thing that we are working on, and it should be available soon, are interactive courses. So it's something we talked about when we were in SoCal about unrolling classes, um, and these are online only courses, but they're with Hakeem in person, but also include recorded material. And so we're just curious as to if there's an actual interest in that. Um, so if there is, you know, let us know. We're just, you know, we don't want to be pushing stuff out there on people that, you know, feel like, hey, we don't want any of this, that's fine. But if you are, you know, we definitely want to hear from you. Let us know if there's an interest um, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, let us know through however methods we got in touch with you or let us know in person, all that stuff. Um, so, inshallah, we'll meet back here for everybody that's coming for, as Hakim indicated, a dhikr. Um, and it should be from around 7 to 9.30. And for men, it's, it's preferable to wear a jalaba or a thobe or something. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, tradition. It also helps. Uh, 
and um, what else? There'll be food, thanks to Merchie Cafe. Um, Lila, they're always amazing when we come and, and have Dikr here, so we're excited about that. Um, but yeah, we look forward to having everybody uh, come, bring people, if you know. Again, there's absolutely no cost, but uh, you know, we'd love to see everybody here. We'd love to have people here to join, do some of the things that Hakim indicated that are healing. So let's get together. Let's do dhikr together. Let's remember Allah together, do the salawat of Nabi, and uh, you know, inshallah it'll be something good. Um, yeah, so I think that's about it. Uh, we have to, again, thank our wonderful hosts, MCC. I've worked with many, many organizations doing, you know, programs like this and many over the years and years. And MCC is always, you know, one of the best at everything. So, you know, big, big thanks to them. And alhamdulillah, please support them if you're local, if you're online, support them any way you can. And again, we just want to extend our thanks to them. So, barakallahu feek, fiman Allah, assalamu alaikum. I know I'm not the only one to regret the things I've done. I miss my mother, I miss my friends. <laughs> oh yeah, we planned that. <laughs> I, no, that's all right, I'll just push it out of the way. I think I'll just stand. I'm sorry? Yes? Okay. Well, well, can we kind of converge a little bit in terms of space? Just because, of, so the... Uh, oh, because the chairs has to be on top of the thing. Um, yeah, that's fine. No, I mean, just moving. Oh, yeah, move. Yeah, yeah you can move. Is that all right? Move forward, yeah. Move forward. I don't think anybody's going to bite. No, we're not going to bite. It's all right. I not that I know of. <laughs> Maybe it's all right. So the second day, I guess, it's inevitable. People may show up in time. But um, where's me? the ideal place for me to be is in the center here? Huh? It's okay. Let me calm it down. Well, salam alaikum. So uh, we have, at some point in the beginning of the day here, someone who wants to make shahada, and they will arrive, inshallah. But in the meantime, yeah, this is a smaller group than we left with yesterday. Um, I, there are several topics that I wanted to cover yesterday and didn't have time for. And we have at least one new person that wasn't here yesterday, a couple of, a couple of people. So um, the, today is meant to be a more relaxed, open discussion, much more questions and interaction and discussion. There are some things I want to do that are very specific uh, exercises and kind of explorations for everybody to take away. And that I'm hoping there'll be more people for that because it, I think it'll work better with more people in Java. So we we'll wait and save that for a later day. But to start with, for those of you who were here yesterday, uh, questions and commentaries or topics that came up from yesterday that you would like to open up and discuss. Okay. Yeah. This, this. Oh, Mike. Okay. So, yep. yeah, I mean, last night was just out of this world. So I was, I felt the collective power, love, energy. Um, I felt like weight lifted from my heart. Um, and I couldn't sleep. I was just buzzing. It, I felt the presence of, you know, the angels and the, everyone's. Sounds right. Yeah, like if other people were lifting weight or healing, it's like I just, I felt the, the collective relief, I think. So. Well, that's what it's about. Yeah. I mean, it's about waking up. And yeah, I couldn't sleep. I and, I, 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 well, <laughs> and when you wake up, presence was is the topic. And I reiterate and come back to this question, well, what does that mean? It means being there, being here, being present. Very simple. I mean, we all know what that means. Sometimes we're not there. In the Quran, it refers to the kafirun at some point as propped up blocks of wood. 
That's the other extreme. That's the opposite. But now we live in a time in which people are basically asleep and in various ways. A lot of the ways we're asleep is our bodies have shut down. From my teacher, beloved teacher, Dr. Lowen, he said, one of the basic things that is overlooked that's so important is that breathing and feeling or sensation come together. And every depressed person will only be breathing that much. Because the more we breathe, the more we feel. Duh, it's a very simple thing. Very few people <coughs> sort of put those two together, which is, again, what I'm trying to do is develop these hikmas, these principles that are elemental and foundational to understanding so many other things. We could, we could look at depression. I mean, that's, it's the result. It doesn't mean if we're depressed or if a person is depressed, it doesn't mean we just simply <laughs> start breathing like the hadra. That will wake us up. That'll be more of a sensation. It'll hyperoxygenate the blood and all this stuff. But we stop breathing and we become depressed because the depression is a, is a survival strategy. Life is too hard. It's too difficult. So I'm going to shut down. I'm going to be that much alive or that much alive. Or I'm going to avoid all the things that trouble me. And I'm going to avoid and I'm going to do all kinds of things I can to avoid it. Addictions. So many addictions are like that. It's, they're, they're, they're alternatives to being present emotionally for the most part, especially with men. How many men, I mentioned yesterday, how many men come to me and we start the work, the somatic work, what do you notice in your body? And they say, oh, nothing. And I say, well, you're dead then? You know, and that's pretty much the, the lot for us men. We shut down. And we learn to shut down, unfortunately, at a very early age. The, you know, the young black man community is, is noted for at about, I think about when they're about eight years old. They're kind of taken from being sensitive, feeling human beings into these various arenas where you are not required to be human, feeling with empathy. You know what I'm talking about. Well, they're not feeling something. It's the fun, it's the it's the product. That's the in the end. They're, that's, they're, significant in their mind. that's significant in their being. But but I mean, <clears throat> we seek alternatives. You know, to distract us from things we can't face. The elephant in the room, so to speak, ourselves. You know, we can't face ourselves. Men are hard. Bit more difficult. It's much more difficult. I mean, women are courageous. Men are cowards for the most part. I'm sorry to say that. I mean, and, and I know a lot of men would disagree. And yesterday I was saying, how many men have their final healing through their woman for their wife? How many men are already remarkable because of their mother or sisters? Even a lot of you, what I said yesterday, even a lot of you said, the path to God for man is the woman. A lot of people have problems with that. So, yeah, I just want to clarify. So, are you, would you say that addiction is a lack of presence? It, well, addiction. Yesterday, I, we, we talked a bit. I was mentioning a few things, which is some people say the opposite of, of addiction is connection. We all have a basic fitra as human beings. We come out with purity into this world. We seek to love and be loved back. Connection. And connection that happens from the very beginning, from the birth. And from every moment, every, that, that thousand and one nights, that thousand and one days in which the brain is, is, is formed and the beginning foundational memory is established in enormous number, 40,000 neuro neurosynaptic memory connections per second for the first thousand days, or thousand and one nights, I use that as a reference. 
So we, we all want to love and be loved. And we all, as human beings, as mammals, we need the connection with others. That's the biggest thing we've lost in the modern world. We have no community. It's like, like I said yesterday, people used to say to me, can you come and talk to the youth in our community? And I'd say, what community are you talking about? The one that has, you know, maybe Juma, you have members that go to the Juma, maybe Eid once a year, and then you drive for a half an hour. The automobile is a deep, horrible curse. Anybody that can't see the reality in that. You know, I mean, anybody that can't see that can't, cannot connect with some basic principle and elemental aspect of our human nature, our fitra. And empathy is going down across the board, across the world every year. And in, in, in whatever, by whatever means that can be measured. But we, we, for us, we know it's, we know it's going down, don't we? We never used to have this issue of bullying in schools. Or we never had this kind of aggressive automobile driving on the highways and so-called freeways. True? I mean, do you all know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I, I mean you, you live in California, if you're in Southern California more so, but the freeways, it's like going into some sort of battleground. And if we don't have a perspective and can't see that and feel it, but what happens is all these things to feel are so painful. So what we do is we selectively shut down. And one of the one of the shutdowns is life that, that I can find in all the aspects of life that I can find are so difficult. So I'm going to alter my consciousness. Some people even consider it a spiritual goal. You know, I'm going to be something different than what I am. I'm going to alter this. I remember back in the 60s, people were getting high, which is altered consciousness on anything, anything they could find. Banana peels, you know. And I remember there was a thing that happened in which this guy bored a hole in his skull. Because when the, the skull was open to the air, there was this altered consciousness. You know, things, yeah, no thanks. I guess he probably had a cork he'd put in there sometimes. So the need to do something other than be present with each other in the world is a terrible demand and an unnatural demand. Because as human, this is, this is a part of our Islam, the community is a reality that we don't have anymore except in some places in the world. And, and the implications of that are huge. They're huge. But yesterday, like we were saying, there were no, now there's over almost 2,000 kinds of therapy. There were not therapists 100 years ago. And I remember I asked some, a group of therapists, they said, well, why were there no therapists 100 years ago? And she said, rightfully, she said, because we had aunts and uncles and friends and neighbors and community members, and we learn who we are from others. So what we did, that practice, as I said last night, the practice we did was in who, who was there, who wasn't there? Who was there last night? For the ones who weren't, weren't there, uh, it was it was the Hadra. Some who do you know the ones who weren't there? Do you know what Hadra, you know what Hadra is? It's a very intense. Yeah, actually, what we were missing was singers. You know, I like to get singers because there's supposed to be singers that would carry that whole <laughs> that whole thing, that whole practice. The singers uplift the spirit, and and and, and it. It, it, it informs the spirit in our, our soul of, of what's happening. Like you said, this thing out of this world. You know? But it's, our, I mean, that's one of our basic dilemmas. We, our soul is from out of this world. And here it is, Jalaluddin Rumi said, it, it's here in this cage of my body. You know, 
and it'll be in this cage of our bodies until Allah frees it from the body. So what I the thesis that I'm trying to say, we have to meet the modern world and its intensity, and its intensity isn't just like a hurricane, which it is, that sounds and the noises and that that terrible rushing madness of the freeway, but it's insidious because it sneaks in under the... Hamza Yusuf, Allah bless him, you know, he had talked about, uh, you know, getting rid of your television years ago. And so many people said, I, we got rid of our television because of the thing in Hamza's lectures. And then it snuck its way back in through the computers. Same stuff. Insidious. And I mentioned yesterday that these things that people watch, you know, the, the episodic things, you know, like here's the first episode and it ends, oh, that's a Thousand and One Nights theme. The Thousand and One Nights story, people know that story. The, 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 the Thousand and One stories are told because each story ends kind of on the edge. It was the precursor to all the TV episodes, the seasons and episodes. Erdogan or any of the others. And uh, the, those episodes that we watch, it's like rabbit holes. I think everybody knows these terms at this point in time. But we don't realize that, you know, it's Marshall McLuhan's, Marshall McLuhan, does people, people so know? He, was, he, he had a book called The Medium is the Message. The Medium is the Message is basically how are we getting our data? I mean, there was a man who, I, I've been a science nerd since I was very young and I had uh, subscriptions and I get magazines like Scientific American. Most of my life, either Scientific American or New Scientist, which were just simply, for the most part, they were uh, journals that would report the various studies that were happening in the world, the remarkable studies. And uh, one of the writers for uh, Scientific American for years was a man, man named Martin Gardner. Does anybody know who that is? Anyway, he wrote a book. And in that book, he did a study himself on the amount of data that is possible to access by television, by educational television, through documentaries and PBS and whatever it might be. And he compared it with the amount of data that a person can have when they go out into a forest. Abdullah, right? This is, a, this is one of our ongoing discussions. And there's no comparison. And another person, I can't remember who it was, he compared educational, quote unquote, educational television to, to a, a situation where the, the, the burglar sneaks, breaks into the house and gives the dog a piece of meat to keep him busy so they can loot the place. The medium is the problem. We know this about our computers, don't we? Even if we wear, you know, you know, blue glasses or anti-blue anti glasses or whatever. Does anyone know this man? Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Huberman. I forget his first name. You know, what's his first name? Andrew Huberman. He's an interesting guy because he's both a neurologist and he's very on spot and up to date. He does his research and he, and he makes it a part of his business you know, to report it and have regular podcasts and all that. But he's also an ophthalmologist. So, I mean, it's this, I mentioned it yesterday. He's the one that said this beautiful thing. And I, I heard that. And I said, oh, well, this guy I've got to listen to. Because he said, our eyes, and I've known this for, for decades, the eyes are the most, one of the most remarkable things that we have as human beings. And one of the things I wanted to do here was find a room that was dark and do a camera obscure so we could all recognize how light rays, it's not just rays that come in, it's the world comes in through the eye. And our eye processes, he said, the eyes are like parts of our brain pushing out through the holes in our skull. 
And why was I saying that? <laughs> why do they even bring that up? See? The medium is the best. Thank you. And so television, I mean, I think, did I share with you yesterday the, the, the young girl in Bahrain, in, in Dubai, with the cell phone? I have to remember what stories. I could tell my stories. My son knows most of my stories. He said, yeah, yeah, I know that one. And my wife, too. I, I start feeling like an old, one of these old people that's even, and you know, this thing, and constantly retelling these stories. God forbid. I'll protect us. Yeah. And, uh, but I was asked, one of my students in, in Dubai, a homeopathic student mostly, she said, uh, I was doing a workshop in Dubai, and she said, could you come for dinner? Yes, I'll come to dinner at your house. And she said, well, and can you talk to my daughter about, because she's being bullied, because she doesn't have a cell phone and all her friends do. And I said, okay. And uh, I said, what, I'll come to dinner, but I don't, what can I say to a 14-year-old who can't have a cell phone? Or what? And, so, and, so I, and she said, no, please. And I said, oh, okay, okay. So we sat down, and the, th the three of us sat there. And I said, so you, your mom tells me that you're getting bullied because you don't have a cell phone like everybody else. And, she's, and she rolls her eyes. I did talk about this yesterday. Because, and she rolls her eyes, and I mentioned yesterday, I'm going to repeat it for the people who are here. It, and that's the teenage BS meter. You know, instead of, instead of a needle, the eyes go like that. You know. And she said, I said, well, why is that? And so, so what, did I, what, what did I say? Yeah, yeah, I asked her, do you know why? And she said, yeah, so you jumped ahead. Yeah, she's. Yeah, serious. Huh? Yeah, and she said, because my mom loves me. And I said, well, if she loves you, why she would not? And, and then she got raised and said, devices divide. And the fact that we have such a thing as virtual Umrah, where we can put on some goggles and then some, some contraption, as if we're doing Umrah, <laughs> and go up to the Black Stone and things. But this is not a little, we laugh because we know how, we, not just absurd it is, but how it's crazy. And I think I mentioned this guy that wanted me to endorse his business uh, uh, that had this pill that would keep you from being hungry in Ramadan. Did I mention that? Yeah, he came to me and said, if you could endorse my project, I'd be really happy because I'd really sell good sales if you endorsed it. And it was a pill that you take so you're not hungry in Ramadan. Excuse me? We, what's wrong here? <laughs> what I'm not getting. So it's a difficult time. It's a difficult time. And, the, and uh, you know, we make dua. And a lot of the dua yesterday, it was about our children. And, um, you know, so many people share with me the fear for their children. And I mentioned yesterday that it's a very difficult job, but we must be on the task of debriefing them. That is, enabling them to manage the insanity that they encounter and the, the perversions they will encounter and the distortions they can't make sense that they can't make sense of. Because it's not meant to be made sense of. You know, it's, it's, it's too unnatural. And we can do it. And we can do it. And the primary way, let me ask you, if we're going to debrief our children appropriately and thoroughly and well so they're managing the insanity, that is probably going to get worse. Allah Adams in Allah's hands. But what's going to be the most important, I'm asking you now, what's going to be the most important thing to make that possible and make that effective? Connection. <laughs> High five. <laughs> it's not going to be explaining. It's not going to be left brain explanations or political commentary or psychological theses. 
it's going to be being there. And if it takes being there and just simply to be able to say, I'm here for you. I know it's difficult. And I will always be here for you. If you believe that. But if it's not true, they'll know it. Especially the 13-year-olds. Especially the 13-year-old girls who have an incredible, extraordinary, high degree of spiritual potential at that point in time. But from every age. When I was in uh, Australia, they set up a workshop for me on a, on a uh, what they call a natural, uh, natural habitat present preserve. So everything in there, was, everything was left wild. And they called it the art of living. And so the first day I went around and there was about 35, 40 people. And I said, well, what is living? What, what is this workshop about? Because I thought, well, I love the title. It wasn't my title. And so we went around one by one asking, well, what, is li what does living mean? And so people said, well, something that grows, something that has a birth and various things come out. And we got to this eight-year-old boy and he said, death. <laughs> death is an essential part of living. And everybody stopped. <laughs> and the thing I'm pointing out here in terms of this thing of debriefing our children is every generation knows something that the previous generation is, doesn't have a clue about. You hear me? I got some nods. What do you think? And Allah designed it that way. It's a beautiful thing when we recognize, and this is the thing about all the real true hikmas, I believe, are things by recognizing them, they give us a foundational basis to understand phenomena that we can get confused about, complicate, overcomplicate, and, and then get lost in the details. With me? The basic things of being alive, of being a human being, are very essential. Connection, love, to love and feel loved back and feel it as if you belong. I went to one of my somatic therapists at one point in time. I grew up in Southern California and I considered my, my, my brother-in-law who married my sister who was a beatnik poet. Does anybody even know what beatnik poet means anymore? <laughs> there was a period of time where a beatnik poet, <laughs> you're, you're uh, what do you call it? You're dating yourself. I'm trying to think of the term. Oh, okay, well. Yeah, there, there will inevitably be old beatnik poets. There's still beatnik poets there. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. And and what's his name that had the bookstore? Uh, Ferling Getty. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I we used to have. Uh, coffee and stuff with him. Lawrence Ferengetti. Daniel Moore, of the High Moore, who was part of that. Um, so, how did I get onto that notion? <laughs> yeah, and it was, it was a wasteland. It was a wasteland, and I left it. Um, and I'm not sure why I even brought that up. Huh? Talking about which? Lulu and, Lulu and Greg. Oh, no, that was a different brother in law. <laughs> that was the surfer. There was a surfer. And that man saved me from Southern California, the poet. And I became a poet. That, well, I loved poetry at that time. And I used to go to beatnik poet readings in Malibu. And, you know, anyway. So this need to belong, I never felt I was a part of that culture, is what I was going to say. I never felt of, like, you know, Disneyland being built was the biggest thing in the 60s when I was there. I, you know, I thought, as an artist, I got to the thing, we used the term Mickey Mouse to describe something that was really cheesy and from commercial, you know, it's Mickey Mouse, we'd say. And, uh, so I never, really, but I never felt I was belonged to my family and what we were interested in their reality and the culture around me, the 
the so-called culture where I grew up. There were there in, in the culture in, in the town I grew up in, the city I grew up, Manhattan Beach. There wasn't a black person that I know of. There probably was not even an Asian. There were some Mexicans maybe that did gardening. That was about it. And that was the school I went to. And thank God some of the uh, Mexican Americans from Redondo Beach nearby became my friends and my protectors. So, but a therapist I went to, the therapist I went to at one point was a somatic therapist who she had worked with the Inuits and, and, and did somatic work. And at one point in the somatic work, we we kind of got into it a bit yesterday. It's it's paying attention to what takes place in your body in different circumstances. And that's it. that's an exercise in being present, quite simply. The more you do that, the more you will develop the ability to be present with the nuanced, the vast nuance, nuances of sensation in the body. And back to this, one of the hikmas, is the number and the spectrum of sensations available to us by Allah's design in the body are innumerable. We can't number them because the number of sensations, if listen to this, the number of sensations in a body are as great a number as everything in the entire universe. I have a question on that note. Um, I know you were also, and I just wanted to understand, you know, I think you were saying the amount of information or data you could pick up in the forest is, yes, this was it more than like on a computer or less than? Way, way much more. Way much more, right? So, okay, so that was Martin Gardner's, but he had a lot of data that would sort of prove it from, for a scientific Americans audience, you know. So, yes, yeah, so I wanted to, I wanted to ask about like, I don't know if the right word is like ilham or gush, but like. The idea of openings, right, yes. as they yes. come, and it's some yes. sort of like, I guess, realization. And I don't yes. know if that's a thought that comes, but I was also curious, what's the tie-in of openings with bodily sensations? Yes. or and, and also, are sensations, some, the second question, like, are also sensations something you can pay attention to at any point in time voluntarily and learn something from it? Or it's like an opening thing which would tell you Great. to look into your body? Perfect. Good questions. I have them on my outlines as something to talk about today. So you're so you're spot on. We're like that. So Elhama revelation or openings, we have it all the time. Um, and well, not all the time, you know. But when we have them, one of my teachers in Morocco said something I, that I took and took importance to, which he said, a genuine opening has fruit. For therapists, there's not therapists here except for one that I know of. But everybody is a sort of do-it-yourself therapist. Oh, sorry. But I didn't answer yesterday. You didn't, but you're, and you're a good therapist because you work with the body. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, and so there's very often people, a person like last night. What you were saying about last night, you had this out of the world experience. Now the thing about it that is, which is important, is how does that blossoming of reality for you bear fruit? You know, I have a poem, I've, I've written poems for years about, but there's, you know, what happens with, with blossoms and fruit is if the, if the chill or the freeze comes at the wrong time, no fruit. That's New Mexico all the time. We have apricot, great, the best apricots you'll find anywhere. But it's like only every three or four years do we actually get in many places the apricots because the freeze comes, stops it. So the key with openings is to capitalize on them. And I think a good therapist enables that person and encourages how they capitalize on it. And if nothing else, that would be, and this is true for the, for the do-it-yourself therapists with friends and people that have difficulties and they're going through it, if you make one tiny step in a beautiful, positive direction, you affirm it. You need to validate it. And back to this other Hikma principle, 
if we pay attention to something, we attend to it, we will amplify it. So capitalizing is, okay, you've had a hard time doing this and this and this, but then suddenly you're able to do this. Wow, that's great. How does that feel that you can do that? Blah, blah, blah. You know, and the, the, there's the usual therapeutic things. Or we can say there's usual things from the empathetic, compassionate mom or auntie or neighbor that says, well, that's great. I'm so glad to hear that. You've come from that point to that point. Wow. How does that feel? What's that like? I'm so, so happy. Blah, 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 blah. And it has to be real. It has to be real. I remember many, many years ago, a therapist that was one of my clients, and I said, well, what do you try to do in your therapy? And he said, I try to help people get real. You know? and, and I knew what we, he meant. I mean, it, it's one of those things be hard to describe from a clinical point of view, but we all know what that means. Some people are just not real. Now, we, I spoke a little bit yesterday about this natural thing that happens for us mammalian humans. When a baby is very young, we, we don't, no one has to, we haven't read that in the book, but our inclination and our impulse is to go up and say, oh, hi there, how are you, kitty? And talk with a certain voice and make certain gestures and movements with the expectation and hope that that child will respond. And babies can respond within minutes of birth to something like opening the mouth from another. That's the beginning of this. It's not the very beginning because the real beginning happens in the womb with the sound of the mother's voice. That's why we called it what we did, the practice last night, we call it sama, hearing. Hearing the voice of the other ones next to us singing will change our nervous system because every pore and every hair is a nerve that hears. We hear with our whole body. I don't know if you know uh, Evelyn Glennie. Do people know this woman, Evelyn, Evelyn Glennie? Uh, there's a YouTube worth watching. It is this woman who was deaf and at the age of 12 decided she wanted to become a musician. She was knighted by the queen, or whatever, knighted, ladied. She was ladied by the queen because she's a deaf woman that teaches music. But she teaches it with the shoes off. Or this young uh, singer, Angelina Jordan. Anybody know that? Remarkable prodigy in singing. At the age of eight, she was singing like a, a, a very adept operatic singer or jazz singer at the age of eight. But she sings. But she, when she first started singing, she met someone who was homeless on the street, a young girl. And this girl had no shoes. And so she gave her her shoes. And the homeless person blessed her for doing that and she decided she would never sing with shoes on. But it also says something about that thing that we talked about yesterday, grounding and earthing. Barefoot. Barefoot is a beautiful thing. So, revelations can come. They can come and we can be, and, and then we can waste it. That's the Sufis talk about that. You may have an evening of dhikr and you're uplifted like that, and then you go, if you go clubbing, then you've blown it. <laughs> not necessarily. Not necessarily. But, but the point is capitalizing on it, protecting what comes in openings, and paying attention to how we capitalize on these things. The other thing was, um, what was the other part of that question? Revelation and opening. One of the hikmas that I have in there is every thought, revelation, opening, insight, everything that happens in that way has a physical, bodily component connected to it. Absolutely. Back to what I said the, in the Quran, Allah speaks about the creation of Adam, the first human, and how he placed the spirit in Adam and Adam became the first of us. Same, and we're the same, the spirit in it. That out of time, out of this world reality, trapped in this body or contained in this body, it can be trapped 
or it can be delightfully contained, of course. I remember now that the second part of the question was, like, can you, so when should you be listening to your body? Like, at any time or? Okay, that's a good question. So when should we, and, and this whole exercise of what I notice in my body and paying attention to it, it's something that we don't want it to be the kind of thing where we're having a conversation with someone and they say something remarkable and then we suddenly dissociate from them because we're in our body. We want to do it as much as we can so that it's not something we're learning that's new. It's something we're remembering that we forgot. That's the key. It's recovering something that's already it was there in the first place by Allah. And it was there, at, like I described my, my, my four-year-old daughter, granddaughter, you know, when she saw the, the, the worm, she jumped up. She, she did that. That's typical little kids. I mean, anybody knows, you know, three or four-year-old kids, they jump up and down. We jump up and down when we're that age. And when she was running around the room, and I saw, and I was studying this whole principle of how we breathe, because we, we breathe, let me ask you this, about to, back to breathing. What do we breathe with? Lungs? Your whole body. We breathe into our lungs. And what do we breathe into our lungs with? Now, you know these. So you're cheating. <laughs> what, do we, what do we enable our breathing with? Sorry? Space. Well, that's where the, where the, the, the breath itself exist, isn't it? Mus the muscles of our body. There is, a, there is a nervous system, autonomic nervous system possibility for the breathing to happen when there's total exhale that will in, in, enable without thinking or without muscular, will, the nerves will excite the expansion. But that's not typical. Typically, is we breathe. So this, my granddaughter, when I was looking, because my, my teacher taught, we breathe into the lungs, and then we have to the body. We have to allow the body for that to go into our body, and that's this wonderful meeting, this extraordinary meeting between the heart and the lungs. Part of what we do when we do liquor, la ida ha ilo together, la ida ha ilo la or Allah, Allah, this rhythmic thing that you find in all these cultures, is we're bringing together the harmony and the synchronization of our breathing, a wave, and the heart, so they're in harmony. And when they're out of harmony, they're out of sync. We don't feel well. It's, 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 it, we don't feel okay. We don't feel in harmony. The RSA, they call that. It's this, it's this harmony between the breathing. So when she was running around the room and she lay down on the floor, I looked at her. I was studying this thing myself from my teacher. And, and I looked at her and I realized she was breathing. And as she took a breath in, she, she'd been running. So as she breathed in, I could see her head was moving on the floor, her chest is moving, her arms are moving, even her feet were moving in and out slightly with the breath. Her whole body was moving. My teacher used to say, we breathe into the body, everything contracts, and he said when we breathe out, that breath enables a wave to pass through our body from its peak to its Letting go, and that wave moves through. If our bodies are fluid enough, supple enough, supple and fluid is one of the greatest strengths we have and capabilities. Not muscular bulk and strength. And you know, I say, don't go dead. I think do stretching. I hope that's okay. <laughs> you got to agree with that one, right? Suppleness. Ago. And equilibrium, equilibrium. 
So, yeah. So we're recovering something that we've forgotten. We were alive. All that thing that we talked about yesterday, we were alive. And as life and its slings and arrows assaulted us, we learned how to shut down selectively. And boys, more, more, than, more than girls. And the girls' bodies being, generally speaking, nowadays it's changing a lot, being more soft. Um, and, and boys, you know, it's changed a lot now. But um, because we need the body to feel. A hard body is a hard person. Dr. Lowen used to say, don't, get, don't try to get six packs. A round belly is a healthy belly. You tell that to women, they don't want to hear it. My wife says, look, I'm getting some abs. I said, no, 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 no. I don't want you to get abs. Useless, what I say. So, So what else? So anyway, we're, we're, when we're, so the, oh, he left. But the, the, so the, it's not something we stop and do. We can, and whenever we can, pay attention to what's happening in my body, physically, in terms of physical sensation. And the more I connect that with the with whatever I experience in the outer world outside of myself, the more that that natural connection and being present in the body develops. That's pretty important. And that practice that's done over time, I try to tell people to do those exercises at least four times a week. Because it's cumulative. Like I say, it's not learning something new. It's not some new technique that I've learned, and it's now in my procedural memory. No, it's remembering something that was already there in the first place that we avoided and we turned, uh, covered over, and we, 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 all, we went, you know, to an alternative. But what else? Well, I think those, I mean, the question, the, what he said is that I, I didn't actually say previous generations had more empathy, but the, the fact that empathy was coming down. And he was saying the previous generations were also more stoic. Yes and no. Uh, and, and so how we define that and, and, and whether we recognize the people as being stoic or conservative or uh, more well-mannered. I mean, there's so many sort of tw uh, twists we can put on it, you know, to understand how what's changed. <laughs> In a healthy community, uh, I don't think it was stoic. It was very loving and open. Uh, and that, that means more connection. And it means it, especially, and another thing that you have to look at in terms of traditional communities is time they had more time, and the professor said, time is contracting. That's a, that's a pretty deep principle. I mean, if time is contracting, yeah, it seems like that. I mean, I've never met anyone that doesn't feel like it's, everything is going faster, and we have less time. But that's the thing, I mean, so, I mean, it, it depends. I mean, there are healthy traditional communities, and there's variations in those cultural styles of how they connect with each other. You know, the Native Americans, where, where I am with a lot of the tribal peoples there, there's eight northern major tribes that live around us there. And one of the things they like to do, and they love to do, is spend time with each other. But that means I'm sitting here, Leroy's sitting there, and Uncle Ben is sitting there. And then they say, they've, one, one said to me, why do these white people have to talk all the time? Just the presence of them. They love. 
I mean, look at that. What does it say? We've lost so much from the fragmentation and the shattering of societies. And the implications of it are so enormous. And the connections. So the, the, so the, the theme of this workshop is connect, you know, presence, first of all, being who we are, where we are at any given time for ourselves first and then for others. And then the connections, that is, the integrity and coherence in our own self body that will enable that more easily and more naturally and organically with others. So, I mean, we have to look at the whole picture. I think that's maybe what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Thank you. So, just to add to what the brother was mentioning, um, maybe stoic. I, I think I see where 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 you're coming from. Yeah. Um, but you know, you mentioned like if we look at the last hundred, two hundred years, there's a lot of trauma that that humankind has gone through a lot of displacement a yeah. lot of generational changes yeah. um, and so you know when we do look at older generations and we consider them culturally when we look at them as stoic I would say maybe that they've been now trained to perhaps not show emotions shut off their emotions as a again as a coping mechanism kind of yeah. what you were alluding to yeah. and you know and it's kind of like well this is the way we're supposed to be and that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. You know, you, you're talking about again, uh, things hit us in life and we kind of shut down. Yeah. That that can happen to an entire generation or to a certain people in a certain area that have gone through a lot of hardship as well. Yeah. And then that's passed on vicariously or generationally. Yeah. Yeah. And that's true. And and the 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 high cult, the high context cultures were not stoic, but they had a very precise and detailed behavioral pattern that went with that culture. And it often wasn't expressing emotions or over expressing emotions or as people have told me as American, well, you Americans like to let it all hang out. You know? But we have to remember too that if there's coherence in the community and there's love in the community and there's connection in a family, for example, and there's neighbors that care and neighbors down the street, if that's taking place, it's very different in terms of what the needs people have are because they feel held. They don't need this sort of acute you know, fire engine kind of need to manage the trauma. By the same token, you know, there's this... Uh, I can't remember his name. He's a philosopher, kind of sociologist, and he says, well, it's a mistake to think that we have all this trauma in the modern world. There's much more trauma in the past, and that we're just, you know, the first world problem, kind of, we're babying each other too much. And the only problem with that argument is, yes, I mean, you know, hordes rode through cities and, and killed everyone. We, we know this happened historically. But people also were there for each other to deal with it. You know, the Vietnam War was an important turning point in the sense that we brought this up yesterday. To me, I still have a hard time grasping that more people died by their own hand than in the war. And that's because they were not prepared to go to war like they did in the Second World War. Second World War, they came back and there was family there for waiting for them. There was, there was a context of others. That changed it a lot. And when, when, for the people who were doing trauma work back when I started, which was over 20 years ago, we all agreed, well, this, is, this whole thing with Afghanistan, stuff for law, I don't like even mentioned, or all the things that's happened modern, it's going to be worse because no one's connected to other people. They don't have a context to go back to. I mentioned the thing, same thing in terms of the tr traditional Tsavos, the traditional Sufism. My sheikh had four generations of students and each of those generations families knew all of the other 
generations families well the youngest ones were grandchildren but, you know there was, there was a coherence to all the people in that community and he was just a piece of it a fulcrum or a center of it but he had all kinds of people around him too you know it's like the prophet said, said, said you know my my any one of my companions can guide you like us as if they were the stars solid fixed dependable and you get something different nowadays where you don't get uh, you know the the the, the sheikh duda the, you know the, the important sheikh you don't find the same sort of level and numbers of people with the wisdom typically i mean that's not across the board because there's so um, yeah, the modern but the modern world has its own peculiar, traumatic realities. I mean, I consider I grew up in the in the fifties, and I went to school in the fifties, and I suffered the trauma. Uh, in school, nowadays it's nowadays if you go to school at a certain level, they have these uh, shooter right, uh, drills, right? And the shooter drills means, you know, there's a whole protocol that you do. With it. And when I was that age, you know, the teacher would be teaching math and, and the long division is, and then she'd say, drop! She doesn't shout, drop. You familiar with that? And we'd all drop, put this hand over here. I remember it, put this hand here and this hand over there under our desk. Crouch down for the blast, for the nuclear blast. And we'd never know if it was a drill or really. we wait, we wait. We know there'd be a flash of light waiting for the flash of light. And then the wind has to blow out and God knows what follows. And that was a regular ongoing thing. So the modern world, without a doubt, I don't think either individually or collectively, we've grasped the extraordinary traumatic reality of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And what happened there? So I think it's pretty, I think some of these things are obvious, you know, the lack of community. How many people have come to me for so many years and say, I just want to be part of a community, right? I mentioned my wife was part of a, the oldest co-housing community in, in England, in Stroud. And we have a member who went from a from a say, tuna community more or less to a, a, a co-housing community, and she said the same thing to me as my wife said to me. She said, "You know, with due respect, I mean, the Muslims are still the the best people I know of on the planet, but not all of them." <laughs> and my wife, my wife said the same thing as that she said, which was, uh, "You know, their people here are really nice." <laughs> Anyway, I'm doing that. It's all good. So what else? Yeah. Thank you. Would you mind expanding a little on Quranic healing and in relation to what you were talking about, um, rhythmic healing of doing like vicar in yep. a group, and in terms of its rhythmic healing as well as. Um, I've just heard many different opinions on how we can use that as a source of healing. I'm sorry, as well as Quran, so uh, Quranic healing, yeah. but as well as, and you said um, in relation to you, you were talking about doing vikr as a group and how yeah. that rhythm, that rhythmic, yeah. has a natural healing ability. For well, us. well, Quranic healing. I mean, the Quran is this is an extraordinary thing. We know this, and we've heard it over and over, and that is healing for the modern time, that it's the hikmah, all these various things, that it's medicine. My teacher in Pakistan, he said that the recitation of Quran, to simply hear it, can heal so many things, especially things that break down structures, like, like snake venom, like all cobra venom, what it does is it destroys the structures. Bleeding into bleeding into bleeding, and, and so structure is lost. And he, there is all these examples of someone who has had a snake bite, and the people recite Quran, but vigorously. Remember that so Quran is a recitation; it's to be heard, and its hearing affects the ones listening, and it affects the one 
speaking it. How many people, I tell them, I give them one of the prescriptions I give so many people is, do you recite Quran? Yes. Do you do it aloud? Well, no, not usually. Okay. Quran is, 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 Uh, the poet Mary Oliver, I re always refer to as a wonderful. Yes, Mary Oliver. She's worth reading, really worth reading. Uh, she she has a poem, and she said she's out in the forest one day, and she finds the spring, and she picks the the water up with her cup in her hands, and drinks this ice cold water, and she says then suddenly she hears her bones speak, and they say. What was that wonderful thing that just happened? Quran. I have I have been with numerous non-Muslims through my years, and I've recited the Quran. They don't have a clue what it is, but it heals them, and they have amazing responses for acute sort of states and sort of forth, and so forth. I get, I mean, that's long stories, and I want to go into those stories. But when a whole class of children that weren't Muslims from the Midwest who were studying the right, on a writing journey with their teachers, and I got them to do dhikr. But the sound of dhikr and the recitation of Quran with tajweed is the another thing that will regulate this RSA, the harmony between the breath. Because some ayats you have to do, it's an extended, you have enough breath to finish it, right? It will, it will, res it will uh, regulate the, that harmony between the breathing and the heartbeat. And it will regulate the polyvagal system, which is the system of nerves that goes from our base of our brain to our heart, lungs, and our social engagement mechanisms, the muscular social engagement is all this thing that happens up here. And we'll get to that later because when it, I want to do with when more people arrive, if they do, <coughs> I want to do some exercises in which we explore that social engagement system, connecting with others in a very particular way. So yeah, this is powerful medicine. The person, many, like I say, many people, I've recited Fatiha. And they've come out of extreme kind of like seizures of self. Groups of people that are in panic and, you know, uh, collective or uh, what do you call it, like trance states or like fear, you know, student, a group of students and stuff like that. So it's powerful by a lot. And the example I was giving yesterday about the, the, the Quran and the Arabic language having realities beyond symbols of letters on a page, the Arabic letters having meaning and realities to the individual form, the alif, ba, wa, all these things. <laughs> and that is part of this thing. I mean, there are stories about people who have had ayatul kursi on the wall, and they're not Muslims, they don't know what it is, but you know, this subtle influence that was took place. So we must not underestimate that, and so when someone when I meet someone, uh, particularly like classic things, Desi Yantis, I say, recite Quran so your bones hear it. Recite Quran so your liver hears it. Recite Quran so the walls hear it, because they do hear it. If it's done audibly, because vibration affects a place. In Morocco, you know, one of my dear teachers, his name is Colonel Muhammad Atta Rahim. And he took the name, he was a sheikh. But he never took that nomenclature. He never took that on because he he didn't like to have that thing of you know sort of aggrandizement of it, that sort of thing. Like he's not special. He's just a colonel from the Pakistani army. But he was this amazing man. You know, I never sat with him. I never sat with anyone with him, and we didn't have tears. And I never sat with him that he didn't recite Rumi in its original form. And help and bring tears. And he was in London on Edgware Road. And every time we went to visit him at the end of this, he'd make dua for us all. And he'd say, then he'd say, and Allah, make these people around here Muslim. Anybody know Edgware Road in London at this point? Anybody? No? 
Well, you know Edgware Road in London? What's it like today? Any Muslims there? Well, oh, okay. So I don't know. It, well, that's true. That, other than that. So this is the this is the absolute true reality. He said, "Make them Muslim." He didn't say, "Make them real Muslim." <laughs> but the street signs are in Arabic. That was never the case. There were no, there wasn't any Muslims there. Halal shops and hookah bars. Okay, unfortunately. But Colonel Rahim, he said that you know that the context. This is back to that thing with the my sheikh had four generations. You know, the context of things um, is an important reality. It's an important, the context and the, the, the connections and where we are, even the geography. I was mentioning yesterday about this man, Alfred Tremadis, who is, has a whole discussion in some of his research about how the geography of a place affects the language, the way they speak. So yeah, it's powerful and it's underused and it's often misused. One thing uh, I had a chance to this Ramadan, I was uh, like researching sound healing. Right? So I was watching some videos and there's people you know who use different like tuning forks and Tibetan bowls Gongs and all that. And, and I, I can't remember exactly, but the idea was that something about the right. Frequency, effect, like using sound, you can affect things in your body, which would otherwise you use pharmaceutical substances for, but it actually has a more a greater efficacy or something of the sort. Um, and then it helps. I, I completely forgot what it was, but it was something around like some actual science, like mechanism that's happening inside the body that it helps facilitate. So, in, in respect to that, one of the, I didn't get this workshop, but one of the things, can I borrow this piece of paper? One of the things, I taught science for several years to high school students, and I always wanted to use exemplar, uh, experiments, they would call it, three things to demonstrate certain principles. And one of the things that I taught them in one of the classes is this. If you hold a piece of paper like this, it's likely, it's likely not to be still. See how it's just going a little the body, when it's our hands, when they're still, where's our body person? Okay. Um, thank you. Even when our hands are still, they're not still. They're vibrating at 12 hertz, more or less. 12 cycles per second. And then, in turn, all of the other parts of our body, the bones and the heart and the, all these other things, are in harmony or disharmony. That's why when we get together and we sing, la, you know, you know, we do the ha, we do all this, and we hear each other's voice. Like you could feel the singing of the people around you, couldn't you? That's why it's called sama. It's called hearing. The, the practice is much more of one of hearing and the effect. When I went to Tunisia, uh, I first went to Tunisia, and I was sitting in a circle of the and these they started singing the casitas. Uh, I thought, my God, this is so loud. What is this going to do? And it was odd to start with, but then I realized when I left, my body was still vibrating. From it was like the singing continued in my body, and it was affecting every cell. That's the kind of medicine it is. So that's that's sound healing, you know. And the gongs, with due respect, I mean, I know people have done that. I I used to know a, a man. Who played music for deaf school, people in deaf schools, and he had big gongs, big heavy drums. And then there's this thing called the echo locators. I always bring that up because it's important. Do people know the echo locators. Bat. See? Bats. Yeah, bats. But there was a group of young men. There was a young black guy in New York who started this group of people, and they're mostly teenagers. And he would. Uh, he he had the, he developed the ability to ride his bicycle down a New York City street in his mind, and how did he do it? By clicking his tongue and hearing the echo. The ability to develop 
our senses is huge. The ability to develop any aspect of our presence of being is so great. I mean, the Prophet I mean, by Allah, he had coming through him, by him, by who he was, but he had one of the stories I love from him is the story about, and where are the scholars in here? The story about, I think the man was Fadullah, was his name, something like that, who was sent to assassinate the Prophet in, at the Kaaba with a poison bag, or maybe didn't know his name. You probably know the story. Fad Fadullah, I think it was something like that. But the point here is, uh, I heard the story many, many times. It was Habib Ali that I heard it. And he got the message. But he told the story about how this man went, and he was he was with the Prophet Sallallahu going around the Kaaba, and suddenly the Prophet stopped and turned and said, what is it you're concealing, Fadullah? And he said, I'm just making to walk with you. Now, that's an indication of how you must know, people must know, uh, 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 what's his name? <laughs> Sorry, my nominal aphasia. The guy that wrote the book on, uh, on uh, you know his name, the, the, the new, A New Science of Life, Rupert Sheldrake, who was at UC Berkeley and did a study at UC Berkeley called The Sense of Being Stared Back. And that study created a book. And it was a pretty obvious, the studies he did at that time, that when someone's staring us, we can feel it. But we don't notice that. Sometimes we do, sometimes you don't. But the Prophet said, turned to this man behind him said, what is it you're concealing? Not in name with what? That there was something happening. What are you concealing? And he said, I'm just doing this. And they continued a bit more. Then this time, the Prophet Sussan turned and put his hand in his chest and said, Fadullah, what is it you're concealing? And he hesitated for a moment. And then he said, Wallahi, I came and you were, you were the most hated man in the planet, in the creation. And now you're the most beloved. That's connection. And every single one of you, of us, has that capability with our hearts and genuine, true care and concern for, all, for another to simply touch someone with that feeling. We have that capability. He, we say about the Prophet Laka Ja'akum Rasulun Min on Fusikum. Right? That ayat is, surely there's someone who's come from amongst you. He's one of us. And all of his qualities we have as our nature. And we can either ignore them and do something completely against it or away from it or avoiding it, or we can take it on and develop it in ourselves. And it, had, and it doesn't have, you know, one of the unfortunate things is people take these things and go to these things for some kind of aggrandizement. I have a hard time saying this one. Aggrandizement to make themselves something special because they don't feel special. Because we were not, you know, we often, so many of us grew up, you know, with, again, that statement I said yesterday, you know, what do you know, especially women? Women were considered unintelligent. You know, thanks a lot. So, take a break now. Okay. So, so a little more open discussion. I hope more people come because I want to get onto this social engagement exercise uh, that I think is pretty fascinating, and hopefully. If Meaningful. I'm supposed to drop this now, right? <laughs> Say again? Yeah. But it should be like this for their lacked arms. Yeah, yeah, no, like perfect. But there's something I noticed was that I've heard of you, I mean, even seeing the smiles and posts of you, or just facial expressions. Uh -huh. He was doing something for the experience. Something. Like I might look up, but she's smiling. And really? She look, and she's, you know, her eyes are closed, but I feel like that is your yeah. exchange. 
I mean, there's, a, there's some of the people who have done that for many times who have more the science of it. There is a science to it. There's a best way to do it. And there's, I mean, there are people who have taken it on. They just do sort of willy-nilly kind of boy, hippie dancing or something. But it's, it's meant to be very contained, very grounded. Your feet are never meant to leave the floor. Your body's meant to be supple and relaxed because it's primarily the breath and that excess grounding and breathing. Alhamdulillah. How are you? Sit well, down. so nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, good. I want to introduce you to somebody very special. Okay. Kobe. Kobe Co is Kobe. Uh, uh, Batarik is your chosen yeah. Muslim name, yeah. and he's been studying Islam with Yassin for a while. He's a high schooler. MashaAllah. 17 years old, and he's like a Shahada. Alhamdulillah. Aloha, Akbar. Alhamdulillah. Beautiful. Alhamdulillah. Okay. So are you all hearing that? I uh, Kobe. Yes. So I understand that you've shared enough to have a sense to know what it means to make shahada, to enter Islam, and you know the basic principles, the foundational things. I I I, I know that because of what's been taking place here. So if you want to, let's do, take my hand. And just repeat after me. Okay. A shadow. A shadow. In la ilaha. La ilahu. La ilaha. La ilaha. Ilolo. Ilolo. Wa a shadow. Wa a shadow. Anna Muhammadan. Anna Muhammadan. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Okay. One more time. Listen very closely. Just repeat as much as you can. Exactly as I can. A shadow. A shadow. In la ilaha. La ilaha. In la ilaha. La ilaha. La ilaha. La ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa a shadow. Il a shadow. Anna Muhammadan. In Muhammadan. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. One more time. A shadow. A shadow. La ilaha. La ilaha. Wa a shadow. A shadow. A shadow, sorry. A shadow in La Ilaha. A shadow in La Ilaha. Yes, La Ilaha. Illallah. There is no God but Allah. A shadow, once again. A shadow in La Ilaha. A shadow in La Ilaha. Illallah. Wa a shadow. A shadow. Anna Muhammadan. Anna, Anna Muhammadan. Anna Muhammadan. Rasulullah. 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 Alhamdulillah. 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 Allah Akbar. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Allah, 
Muhammad Rasulullah Lahum La ilaha illallah la la ilaha illallah la illallah Bashiru Muhammad Rasulullah Siluni ala mabi Fa'ini liwasnikum Ida la akun ahla Fa'antum lahu ahlu La ilaha illallah La ilaha illallah La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Salamun alaykum sharrafala huqarakum Wadamat alaykum ni'matun wa sururuha La ilaha illallah La ilaha illallah La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Famata batil ayah Mu'ila bidhikrikum فأنتم ضياء العين نحقا ونورها لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله Muhammad Rasulullah Iza nadharat ayin Wujuha ahibati Fatilka salati fi Layali raghaibi La ilaha illallah La ilaha illallah La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Wujuhun ila ma'as Farad al-jamaliha 
أدعت لها الأكوان نؤمن كل جانبي لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله Why doesn't he just greet everybody to start with? Come in and greet your brothers. Just greet your brothers and sisters. Alhamdulillah. Welcome. We're your family. Alhamdulillah. Yes, please. Alhamdulillah. Let me let me be, let me give you a hug first. <laughs> This, this is, goes way beyond any COVID. Alhamdulillah. I just wanted to maybe give him salams. And, uh, oh. One of my kids, they got to go. The exams were winning, so I just wanted to have some say goodbye to you before. So oh, okay. we were driving on the way to the highway, and then we saw the brakes, so we turned around. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, good to see you. Oh. No, you don't. But you do. You are. That's good. Weddings are one of the best things. So Munir, so you, so you wanted to tell this story? Does he want to? Yes. He asked him. Yeah. yeah. Once, once he finishes, I mean, and, nice. and and the, uh, really story and, about his and the and the name. His name is his. He's chosen the name Tariq. Tariq. Uh, Kobe is his given name. And uh, yes. As you like, I'm recording it here too. Yassin is his friend. Yassin has been um, in high school and his yeah. Dai. Oh. Yes. I wanted to do. I think what I want to do after this is uh, I know. He's, Idris is saying to translate that for us a little bit of time. I wanted to do a group shot of that. Yeah. Because he's done his and with him connecting too. Do you know? Is that good? Because most of the people don't do that. They've never done that. Once it goes out. Yeah, no. Everybody's going to ask him the same question. What was your journey like? So it's, it's easier sometimes yeah. you find sure. that they just yeah. do it. Yeah. What was your experience like? Berkeley? Is it Berkeley? Yeah. Is it Berkeley? Berkeley? That's a different era. Berkeley in 69. 69? SubhanAllah. That was the day, that was the, the, the year of the big People's Park episode. People's Park. That was right before Free Love. <laughs> I'm kidding. That was a lot of changes. I think, that, I think that was. That, that, was free that was Free Love? That was part of it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Maybe you did. Okay, and just tell people your story if you'd like to. It might be easier if you tell it one, for everybody at one time because everybody's got the same question. Is that good? Cool? Yeah. What's the question? Just if you, you know, how did this happen? How did you? I think that's. Um, if okay. you like. Can I talk without the mic? Yeah. yeah. You yeah. can hear me? I can hear you. But you don't get to drop the mic at the end. Oh, my damn Muslim. So I like I grew up under no religion, but we we stayed in like in Oakland for a long time. It was just a mosque next to it. So as I'm growing up, my dad and friends always walk in the mosque. People online that want to hear. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> that's right. Um, it's right there in North Oakland. Um, by by Children's Hospital. No, one down. It's like on Sacramento and Market. It's like the same street as Market, but as you go towards. 
No, go to back towards Berkeley by Alcatraz coming down. It's the one. Um, yeah, I just pretty much grew up like that. And, yeah. And that's probably it. Like, just growing up, and I just wanted to take it serious. Get it together. That's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's pretty much how I grew up around. Like like our block it was just Muslims really and black like black Muslims. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you did get to see that. A little bit. Travis. Does he know? Yeah, he knew I was coming today, but he had work. God bless you too. No. I'm the luck. Very nice. There you go. I'm the luck. But you probably have been saying I'm the luck here and there, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm the luck. And Yasin was a big part of your. Yeah. Kind of making the final decision. I'm doing that. Beautiful. I just can't, like, I mean, I tried, like, I tried doing the Christian stuff with my mom, but it just didn't work. That's where I feel like I fit in at. Like, it just didn't work. I'm doing that. That's good. Yeah, it's like somewhere I fit in. Yeah. Yeah. You said you felt like the peaceful prayer. Yeah. That's it. We can talk forever about Islam, but if you make the prayer, that you, you, you hear something else from inside from Allah. Yeah, inshallah. If <clears throat> I don't want to. You probably may may or may not have heard the things like this sister said. When you make shahada, the things that are said about how how blessed you are, you've heard that. And these things are true. The the thing that makes Islam different from so many other paths is that things are true. Like they say, <laughs> they're true. <laughs> we pray for someone, and the angels pray. If we pray for someone else, the angels pray with us, and they say for what the person's asking for that person, give it to the one. But, but the other one is the Prophet he said, when you make the shahada, that moment, yes. it's as if the sun came up for you. Okay. And all everything is purified. We've all, we come out pure, we're born pure, and then we, you know, we all do things we regret, Adele. Right? Uh, but <clears throat> all those things are forgiven. But without, with, well, without being too new agey, one of the things is you have a unique thing. I mean, you grew up with a father who's Muslim. But you weren't former Muslim. But a lot of people here grew up as Muslims. And what I discovered as a convert many years ago is the people who grew up as Muslims, they never had a chance to formally do what Tariq did just now. Yeah. So I'm going to do some, I'm suggesting what we do is that we all join hands. Yeah. And the, 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 some, one of the women can join hands with one of the men. So we're all connected. And we take the baraka. <laughs> if, you, if you don't mind, we take the baraka from you. So can we do can we do that right now? So what, what I'm saying here is Tariq has a blessing from Allah and a gift by this moment. And to be, you know, kind of 
we're going to take advantage of it. <laughs> we're going we're to get all the blessings we can from you. So by holding hands and connecting with him, and by everyone together, by everyone together, <laughs> doing the same thing of repeating the shada. For those of you who have not done it formally, we'll do the same thing for all of us. The Prophet said to re to improve and increase your iman, he said, make the shada. Simple truth. So let's do it again. So, a shadow. And la ilaha. Illa Allah. Wa ashadu. Anna Muhammadan. Rasulullah. Ashadu. La ilaha illa Allah. Wa ashadu. Anna Muhammadan. Rasulullah. Ashadu. La ilaha. Illallah. Wa ashadu. Anna Muhammadan. Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. I've been seeing the shahada for a long time. Did you? You have? Yeah. Very good. They where? Come, they come from a place where there's people. We, we, uh, there's, 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 we try to go to the gathering, right? So bring their friends to the gatherings. So people can tell each there's always people. Yeah, oh, yeah. Out of there, you know. Alhamdulillah. 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 So we try to make it a point to go to the gatherings where people are more, where there's someone that's going to be. Yeah. Did you repeat it? I did my best to mouth the word. Hey, then that means you're a Muslim now, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm indoctrinated. You got it. This is my baptism. Now it's too late. That's it. You know, it's, it's beyond the point of no return. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Are you going to be taking the stand again? Are you going to speak some more? Assalamu alaikum. Allah Akbar. Curb your enthusiasm, as they say, a little bit, but contain it. Don't let it go or leave it back, because this is a blessed moment for everybody. But let's come together, because I've been told, Hello, Akbar. Hello, Akbar. I'm being the high school teacher now. Hello, Akbar. Everybody, come on, you kids. I can actually say that to you, because I'm probably twice most of your age, at least. Alhamdulillah. Okay. I was told that we want to do some exercise. I don't blame you. So I'm going to do a really interesting thing. Now, let's see. You know that the corporations do these kind of exercises where they instruct you to do something, and then they observe how efficiently or how badly you do it. <laughs> so I'm going to say, first thing you want to do is to divide yourself into groups of four with people that you trust and you can be with, which should be anybody here. There may be some odd, not quite four. And do it as simply and easily as possible. Okay, and now you've, you have your groups of four. You have your groups of four. Low Akbar, you have your groups of four. Okay, now move forward here more. So that, come up. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Move forward here so we can have, so I can be more with the groups. Okay, what about you guys back there? Okay, stand and come up. Move up, move up here. So, are you come in here? Okay, now the point in this exercise is you're going to be able, for just four, just four where you've got 25 or something. Groups of four or five. And the point of this is you want to be able to be facing more or less. I mean, we can still, you know, honor a little bit of the COVID principles and little, little, you know, distance, but we want to be facing each other, okay, in the group. Each group of four, each group of four, come on, you guys. You're going to be fired from the corporation. <laughs> okay, 
Okay, and not holding hands or anything. You can keep your distance. Here's the thing. You want to be able to look. You want to be able to see the other four people. Okay? You hear me? Listen closely. Come on, you guys. Uh, you're going to flunk the class. No. Okay. Oh, okay. All right, so everybody, this night, look, look over here. Here's a perfect model example. These guys got it. You want us to be able to see each other's faces. Okay. Now, what I want, what I want to do here, is do an exercise. Can I see everybody? Now we're talking. We got it. You want to be able to see each other's face. The two that are hugging each other. You are one. Okay, I'll buy that. I'll buy that. Okay, now this is an exercise that relates to social engagement. Do you hear me? Okay. Listen, 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 please. Because we only have limited time. And I think it might be worth exploring this a little bit more. And then we can have lots of discussion about it afterwards. But right now, this is an exercise that relates to social engagement. Is there anybody that doesn't know what we're talking about? The ability to connect with others. And this is part of our animal nature, our mammalian nature. And I could go on for days, too much, too much. I could go on much too much about it, like how a herd of, of deer, the leader of that herd will turn its head and all the other deers will turn in. will turn, turn in unison. So this is an exercise about social engagement, engagement, and it's about something else that our bodies are designed to do by Allah, and that all living creatures do, fish, birds, fish, birds, dogs, cats, you name it. All of us living creatures do this thing, and we've been doing it for some of us, from the time we're in our mother's wombs, any any com any comments? What, what am I? What is it that I'm getting to here? Yes, what is it? Oh, I just like to, I just say, any ideas? Well, yes, that is, that is the first thing we do in the mother's womb. We begin to listen and hear her voice. But no, this is something else. So I want you to look at each other's faces because to see the other people doing the others doing this exercise. You almost did it already. It, it's connecting by yawning. Okay. Now there's something that will. Now let me just say very quickly, and I go to more detail. The re, it, all of my neurology books that are on the shelves. If you go to yawning, it'll say, "Well, this is a mystery. This is a mystery." But how can it be a mystery when we know so much about all the details of neurology, and yet all these textbooks say, well, we don't quite get it. Well, the new research, some new research is coming out, and I've been doing it for a couple of years now, and I've been following it across the world. And, but there's a few things that are really obvious, which, which indicates or, or suggests, as they put it in that kind of literature, that it's a really important thing to do. Now there's a hadith about yawning being from Shaitan, that that's the yawning in which is what we're doing is we're, it's a, an issue of adab, where the, where the person, but the primary thing that we want to discover is I want you to pay attention in your bodies and to notice what you feel in your bodies. And when we go away from this workshop, if you do these exercises in which there are ways in which we can begin to promote and elicit yawning. Because yawning is not something we do volitionally, right? We can't just, okay, ah. it's not just taking breath in. It's because it's taking breath and it's reaching a point at which we could call there as an overflow. There's an autonomic opening of yawn, which is, we could say, it's a kind of orgasm in the sense that it builds, 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 and then, ah, and then it takes place. But what happens when it takes place is remarkably, <coughs> remarkably uh, effective in, in terms of what takes place in the body. So 
there's the way we can elicit this yawning is by, by first of all, it's the collision between our animal nature and our social expectations and the social uh, 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 pattern, the social expectations put upon us. Does that make sense to anyone? Our animal nature, because yawning across the board is considered rude. And we all do this, but we all do something else which you can never see a yawn, which is called polite yawning. And polite yawning, I, we can give it more disuse, but polite yawn is where, is where, you know, when someone's ready to yawn, you kind of keep your mouth closed and kind of tighten your lips and then you draw the air in. So go ahead, draw, tighten your lips, draw the air in, tighten these muscles, you can tighten, and even arch your neck. Now, did you yawn? Now, don't, now, in this case, please. Let's see if we can do this therapeutically and scientifically as an exploration. Let that person be able to see you yawn. You hear me? You guys with me? Okay. So if, you, if anyone feels like yawning, I'll start it. So I start it by. We all did. Who are you with? Are you just with me? <laughs> we all did. We all yawned. Are you yawning? Okay, watch the person yawning. And don't hold back the yawn, but notice what it does. Notice what it does in your body. If you, could, if you, if you need to cover your mouth so you can let your jaw go open as far as it can go, notice how that yawn will open and stretch the muscles in the jaw and around the eye sockets and even the back of the neck. And if it helps, Archer, yeah, yes, yes, go for it. See that? Watch her. Watch her. And let it happen yourself. We'll get to that. Let's, let's, I mean, we know it is. Let it, be, let it contain you right now. Did any of you guys yawn? There. There. No, you covered your mouth. That's okay. Go for it. You don't have to, but, you know. And let them continue. Let them continue. And if your body wants to stretch and you want to arch your back, listen, 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 listen. Try not to get caught up in conversation between you because we want to be as much as you can with this. Excellent, excellent. Jimi Hendrix. Okay? Arching the back. There you go. I'm good luck. Look at the person in front of you. Look at them yawning. And see what it does if it, if it instills yawning in you. Discover the contagion in it if you watch another person. It takes place. Yes, yes. Let it happen, let it happen, let it happen. Notice what happens. Are you guys yawning? I'm sorry. Okay. So in case anybody's doing this online, if you guys are yawning, let it happen. Let it happen. And notice that one, uh, the freedom to let yawning freely come is, it, it can kind of cascade. It can get continued. So again, stay with it. See that, see that per, the thing I'm doing with my mouth? I'm closing it. I'm, I'm beginning the, the, the polite yawn. Idris, you here? Yes. You look like you're in your, your world. Well, yeah, I've yawned about eight times. <laughs> Have you? Eight yawns. Yes, yes. Okay, good. So we've got that. So sometimes when there's a repeated yawning, yeah, and don't hold back, hold back and arch your back. You remember this, the lion there. The lion awakens with a yawn. The child awakens with a yawn. And both of them often, not only with a yawn, but with a And the lion can be a dramatic roar. Yes. And what happens with the yawn is awakening. The brain activates, and endless physiological things take place from that yawn. Anxiety will be overcome in most people with three or four yawns. There you go. Notice the, notice the jaw and the, around the sockets of the eyes. Pay attention to him or each other. You were yawning. 
try to try to yawn, try to avoid conversation with us because we want the autonomic system to do its job as much as possible. Yeah, and if you want to stretch your back or any other stretching, try not to keep, try not too much talk talk because what we want to do here in this exercise is yawn and discover what takes place in your body because I'll tell you right now, we can go into more detail, what takes place in the yawn. Okay. Settle down, bro. <laughs> That's all right. It's good, but I want to focus on this yawn and see if you can get a natural thing. We want stretching because we all yawn to wake up. So it's not people say we yawn because we're bored. Yeah, but we yawn in a boredom because we want to wake up. You guys have it going over there? Any yawning? Okay. Alhamdulillah. See, we've got we've got a we've got a, a serious yawner here. Yeah. That means there's a lot of the monster. If I may say that, you know, it's a release. It's a release, and it's a release of muscular tension that we don't ordinarily have control. And if we have social, you know, oppression, it'll be more. Like I said, start with it's in some way we can look at it as the animal nature meeting the social constraints. I mean, that's one way I, can, I, I look at it. But it, I mean, and that's pretty deep principles, a pretty big deep thing that's taking place in terms of our own experiential discoveries that can happen. Yeah. Um, Beautiful. Like that. Ever since this started, I've been feeling like that. Something where I just bask in that feeling. Beautiful. Yeah. Nice. I don't think I was picked up by the. See, this. You guys are online, by the way. <laughs> what does that say about you? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Uh, maybe over control. Over control? Well, yeah. probably. Okay. Maybe. I mean, I'm saying maybe. I'm not making. I don't. I'm, what do I know about this? I'm discovering. And part of this is is what they call citizen science. <laughs> I've gone to the books and I've gone to the studies, yeah. but now I'm. You know, okay, you guys tell me. Yeah. Yeah. What do you notice here? What's what do you discover? I love the principle of citizen science. We discover for ourselves. Share. Alhamdulillah. Any is there anybody here who didn't yawn? Okay. Now someone asked me. Someone asked me, "What does it mean if you I can't cannot yawn?" And I said, "I don't know. Probably over self control." And does that feel right to the people who haven't yawned? <laughs> oh yeah, so you you've had that. Well, and, and but that's how that when you don't yawn when you're reciting Quran or something else's or when you're talking to someone. But children, those same children, when they wake up, they yawn and they probably make a sound even. Uh, right, right. Right. Uh, people did mention to us that when the sleep comes over in the middle of it, that's also angelic. That's when the what? Angelic. No, what comes over? Comfort the sakina in the heart, even while listening to more through the lecture. But you could, you know, so for me, that's also like other of knowing your your Lord is. All sorts of things happen in terms of states changing. Okay, shall we come back together here? We've already got some kind of yoga class going on. No, I was asking, is there anybody, wasn't, I only got it, anybody over there, that did, anybody that didn't yawn? This one. Yeah.
Anyone else? Two, three. You didn't yawn. Wow. Uh, no, I mean, that, that's interesting. That's all right. Some people have had very strong constraints by practice and reiteration that it's poor Adam or that it's even Shaitan. You know, and if you've heard that over and over and over and over and over, it's hard to yawn. But the children and the fish, I mean, the fish, are, it's not poor Adab when a fish yawns, right? Or it's not poor Adab when we yawn in our mother's womb. Good, good. Now that's good. That means you're releasing, you've been giving license, your body has been giving license to let it go. Does that make sense? Nice. Yeah. Well, uh, falling asleep is one of those many things. It's called falling asleep. It's not. It's not getting up and then sleeping. It's giving up and letting go. Falling in love is the same way. You have to let go. To fall. Play is the same thing. One has to submit to play. Play, genuine, honest, spontaneous play, only comes about. With a, a, a lack of not not control, it's, it's spontaneous. It comes out naturally, and it processing. It's processing now. <clears throat> what's what's relevant about this? The reason I did this exercise that I've seen through these years. I have a practice called Mai Chi, and we can go into that a little more. But all of some of you have gotten my documents that I sent out. This exercise, and the Mai Chi is where we track the sensations in the body, and then we move very very slowly in response to what our body is, body tells us that needs to happen. Not by imposing, as in Tai Chi, a pattern or a formula, but listening to our body, which always tells us what it needs to do, wants to do, and usually must do. Now that's the whole principle of that exercise. And it's done very, it's by slowing every movement down, stretching it in time, and letting the stretch that wants to take place do uh, what it wants to do. And that will very often release short-term anxiety. And it will bring forth, with many people I've seen it through these years, bring forth buried memories in the state of process and change for those memories. Is that, you hear me? bring forth memories that are buried in parts of the body that come forth in their processing of being resolved. That's the beauty of it, my G. Yes. So I wanted to say this yesterday, but uh, I had an interesting teacher who actually comes from there who's called Baba Rudy. And one of the things he was suggesting is called shackle. Shackling? Shackled hand. Shackled hand. Where you basically have your wrist. Uh, oh. And you stretch in all directions. Keeping the contact. Keeping the contact. Yeah. And it's, it, it's mimicking what enslaved people had to do. MashaAllah. Very interesting. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. And and we have to ask, you know, how much of that is inherited epigenetic memories that have come to us from those times. Of course, then along with the slaves, I think about just generally prisoners. <laughs> People are but but we're all prisoners of constraints that are unnatural. I mean, we're the only creatures I know of. I I, I mean I mean, I'm not an anthropologist, but I don't. I don't know of any other creatures that lock others up. <laughs> I guess they take slaves. Ants take slaves, and things. but anyway, don't want to get lost in that. The thing I've seen, and the reason I'm exploring this, is because I discovered one 
that if you go to yawning in the textbooks, they say it's a mystery still. Although there are several studies, and some of the basic studies are partly remarkable in terms of what it describes takes place physiologically and neurologically in the body. It's a big thing. Actually, flow in the spinal cord is increased. That's pretty major. So there's lots of implications. I think there'll be a lot more studies. You know, these kind of things, they suddenly burst out in common. That's the Rupert Sheldrake principle. You know, one person discovers something, and then suddenly everybody's coming forth with the same thing. The, 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 the morphic connection that we all have. And that can get to one of these other topics that I want to discuss, which is the, we talk about connections in ourselves. Uh, one of the hikmas I have in the body, in the, that list of hikmas is everything in our body is connected at all times to everything else, and everything that happens in our body really affects every other thing. Are you about to yawn? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I wasn't getting to that, but Rupert Sheldrake spoke about this morphic resonance. We have morphic resonance all the time, and the resonance right now for all of you who are here yesterday and here today, by the things we've done together, the shahada, the singing, the yawning together, all of this increases the common resonance together. When we make dhikr together, there's a particular vigor effect I used to do <coughs> from, excuse me, from the <laughs> Jimi Hendrix, always commenting. Um, a particular vigor, and we could do this. Let's just try it right now, even though we're all standing. Listen, this is important, to listen to the other. Because vicar, come on you guys, come on you lovely, lovey dovey mother daughter. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, to see that with mothers and daughters, I, there's nothing I can ever say. <laughs> MashaAllah. But <clears throat> let's see if we can. The key to dhikr is not, it's, it's often called sama, mean listening. In other words, we don't just do it independently. Where's the red, uh, there's the pink sock, uh, orange socks. <laughs> it's listening and being part of that whole. The whole is always in a has a reality at any given time that we may or may not be aware of. So this dhikr, it's called the ismu farid. It's the name, it's the unique name. And it's done, it's a dhikr that's done, and what, and it's done more or less at the timing of the heartbeat. So listen to me to lead, to lead but we we'll stay with the group and try to make your voice blend with the group. Become part of the whole. Yeah, you can do that, yeah. Good, good point. Come, come in. Just so, and and again, don't try try to take care in terms of speeding up or slowing down. And listen and keep it going. Okay. So this is, <coughs> and this is the and it's the recitation. I, I have to move into my high school science teacher mode periodically here, but that's all right. I have no problem with enthusiasm. <laughs> okay, so this is done. It's what the it's the divine name of Allah, but it's done like this. Allah, 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 Allah. Almost like a resonance here, like a like a heartbeat. Like a heartbeat. 
chest. Together, together, listen, listen, hearing is the main part of this. listening and what I was listening for is what can happen when we do this and I didn't quite hear it <coughs> I may have <coughs> missed it from my coffee and so on <coughs> but there's a point at which when we do that decker is a point at which our <coughs> our respirate respiration our breathing and our heartbeat find harmony they get in sync and if you do it in a group, everybody's heart can get in sync. Everybody's heart beating at the same speed, the same pace. Now, <coughs> depending on what's going on in us, heartbeats can be faster. But so it doesn't always happen. But it relatively happens. And that brings a kind of coherence and it brings a kind of connection from the hearts to hearts. And the saying, the saying that I repeat over and over is hearts remain connected. Once they connect, they remain connected. And it's tragic in some cases because you know, we, we love people and they just they, 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 they betray us and we have difficulties and but the hearts remain connected and that's okay. You know, it's one of the difficulties and one of the one of the educating things of life, one of the hard earned uh, wisdoms. I have a poem I wrote years ago from my wife on Valentine's Day about never diminish love. If it's love, it doesn't go away. You know, in spite of the fact that we get angry and it's natural to feel angry and feel all these things when we get feel betrayed by someone. But the hearts beating together, that moment and this moment, the fact that our hearts were doing it and you were doing this together in the same as last night, whereas, uh, what's the sister? Yeah. The, f the fact that we did that vicar last night and for all of those who did that, to do that means there's a connection that happens on a very deep level that remains. I had a friend that I used to be in theater with and we do all these very elaborate hard work. Theater is a wonderful practice, wonderful therapy, especially for young people to get together and work hard to perform some sort of do a performance and work the play out because you work together for this end even though it's a kind of false kind of, you know imitation of life in some way drama so whatever it might be but that working together and the connection and the, the teamwork that takes to do that draws one really close and you begin to feel as you were saying Idris you feel safe with the people you're with at some point feeling safe is probably one of the most primary things that we need as living creatures to feel safe. And it's our mother, ideally, at some point early on that does that. I had a mother who I loved dearly, but she was known as the Iron Woman. So, you know, as that tells a big story in itself. But I love her deeply. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was saying that Dr. Spock and, and others, 
who said, don't respond to the baby when the baby cries and things like that. Kind of like the kind of craziness that took place, akin to a lot of the a lot of the things that were happening. We don't have a, the midwife here today, but. Uh, <laughs> generate a connection as best you can, reconnect, recognize what was lost. And that's why these basic hikmas for, can form a guideline of principles upon which we build any kind of healing amongst other things. I have a saying, it's less talk, more touch. Yeah. In less, response to how do we heal, it's yes. using the connection via touch. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Got it. Absolutely. Less talk, more touch. Okay. There, there. I mean, and t my wife does a therapy called touch therapy, and it's very simple things. I mean, the power of like putting your hand on a child's back. You're not a child, I know, but you're down here. It's like about twice my height. <laughs> um, the power of putting a hand on a child's back. I mean, you can't put your hand on anyone because a lot of people, it's too much touch. Like, but the ones that you can, and the children and your own children. Sorry? Who? Who? Who doesn't want to be touched? Adults. Adults. Oh, yeah. Certain, certain ones, yeah. Like some people, they don't want to be touched. And I, I don't understand. Is that like trauma? Well, yeah. I mean, for many people, it's, it's important to realize that, too. Because there's 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 different styles of people. There's people that need to touch a person yeah. to even talk to them. But some people, because it, particularly people who are traumatized in their body or by their bodies or at their bodies, those people will be hard. A lot of people, for example, the exercise, this grounding exercise. A lot of people, that's hard to be in their body, and we have to honor that. Here we have to recognize it, honor it, and, and be gentle in terms of bringing about a sense of safety. I mean, we, and safety, the thing is, I may have said this yesterday once, but I'll say it again. I mean, if there's any single thing that we can equate with safety, it's a kind of iman. You know, Allah's got my back. I mean, we can put our hand on our child's back and make them feel held and present. Powerful, the neck, very powerful. My wife does these things for it's not, she'll use like these little cushions with someone and puts it behind their neck. And, but she knows when, who, and what, what part. And they, you know, oh, okay, it was great relief. So it's, a, it's, a, it's another form, touch therapy. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but touch therapy, neuroaffective touch, it's called. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, because of COVID, you know, she has not been practicing it, but she has all these kind of little pillows and shaped things that she, Sometimes you'll have someone lying down, and she'll put one here, and one there, and cushion there, and, and they'll just, ah, oh, this is great. Sense of safety and relief. Um, there was um, uh, ICU with the baby's ICU. One child was completely, his vitals were completely falling. Yes. The nurse came running, brought the baby, uh, twin baby, put it in the thing, and the baby started uh, the picking up. So that was a real something that really touched me real deep. The touch, uh, they were in the ICU, low birth baby, vitals were gone, and they tried her, everything And to, put the baby in. So this nurse out of nowhere, she just did something that she couldn't uh, uh, do anything else that can be done. So she picked up the uh, healthier baby from the thing. With and, the other baby. And the other baby who was uh, losing, all the vitals were going down. It just brought everything back. Yeah. And we know the, the other similar stories are the premier, very premature babies, how they survive and they do much better with any touch of any kind. And you, uh, you and someone said about that, or you said something that was very touching, you said. That story. Yeah, it touched my heart. It and touched your heart. Yeah. There's touch again. I have a question. 
If you had to put the two of them side by side, touch or rhythm, which would you say is more important, touch or rhythm? Like if you could only have one, well, I guess that's a weird hypothetical. Yeah, it's kind of a weird question. Then, well, I'm thinking, I went the other day and I was watching, the, I was watching an, African, an African diaspora dance performance. Yeah. And I realized these dancers are not touching each other at all. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a partner dance. Yeah. And although at one point they tried to sort of incorporate a little Western move and one of them kind of put their arm a little bit like lightly around the other and they kind of yeah. changed places. But mostly it's not um, touch well, based at well, all. I mean, the thing rhythm, is, rhythm presence with another engages the primary sense that we develop in our mother's womb, first of all, which is his sense of touch, of feeling. And that includes sound, because sound is vibrations. Touch is vibrations. And, and so, you know, even dancing together. I mean, I used to love raving. You said that. I remember you said that. <laughs> the music. Whatever came. Whatever came. But sometimes it was actually hot. They were doing te techno music, you know, bom, bom, you know. And but I was doing, <laughs> you know, you were. I was just gonna ask: Did Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi like do anything that was related to touch therapy during his time? Uh, yeah. Well, that story. Were you there? The story I told about father. Oh, no, he touched was... people, and they did things. One man said, he said to one man, Salawi said to him, he said, take the Islam you've learned to such and such a place, country. And he said, I, I don't think I can do that. Prophet Sosan okay. put his hand on his chest and said, you can do it. And he said, I can do it, period. Oh, I have one thing I recall. Um, just a quick thing, like, I don't know if it's like a pro tip or not, but like, one time I met somebody, and I, this is a long time ago, and I was just saying, hey, how you doing? And then, so I met them, shake their hand, and then like, she like reached out, and then she's like, yeah, I'm good. And then while she was talking to me, she would like, coin, like, she would kind of grab like, the side of my arm, and I just like, never forgot that. And I was just like, it was just forever memorable and imprinted on me. Wow. It's kind of like, you're just like, yeah, how you doing, man? Yeah. And then something like that, like, not like, not like emotion, but just, yeah. it was the way it was done during that initial... Did you feel safe and okay with it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That yeah. person was incredible, but like, I mean, yeah. they had great energies and it was a good setting too, yeah. Yeah. but it was just like done in a way where it's like, it was so focused and like that person was, like cared about you and was like very empathetic. So yeah. I, I just never forgot that. I've met a lot of people. So that one thing just stands out. There's a great book that was written many, many years ago by Ashley, Ashley Montague called Touch. It's a great big thing, and he just goes through all the things that happens with touch. I mean, extraordinary things happen with touch. I remember when I first went to Morocco, I had a hard time when these men would take my hand and walk, want to walk hand in hand with me. You know, and I, coming from America, was like, you know. And then someone, and when that first guy I did that, I remember the man, it was Muli, uh, uh, Muli Abdul Salam, no, Muli, not Muli Abdul Salam. I can't remember his name. You, my son would know him. But he, he, when he felt me doing that, feeling I'm, in, I'm secure, he took uh, his hand and my hand and put my, on my chest, and then we walked like that. But yeah, people touch. Uh, I mean, some people touch, and some cultures touch more than others. Yeah. Same Arabs with gaze. Lot, right? Sorry? Arabs kiss a lot. Yeah, Arabs kiss a lot. Yeah. Italians, it, it, well, it, it, <laughs> The Arabs were, uh, the Italians were Arabized a yeah. great deal. We forget that. You know, we forget that the Muslims, talk to Dr. Omar about this stuff. You know, Dr. Omar, because, yeah, the, the Muslims went everywhere. Some countries that we wouldn't even, Switzerland, were mostly Arab, mostly Muslims. It's things common. like that. But we're human beings, and we're Bani Adam, and there's things that are common for us, and there's things we don't do. But mostly because our cultures have been shattered and the humanity, the fabric of our humanity has been rent for a long time, over and over. The first industrial resolution, revolution, the second one, and the third one is on us. So. Um. 
regarding the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was two stories when you said that they came to mind. One, I mean, both of these are in the Shifa of Qadi Ayyad. If you haven't read it, get that. But uh, plug. Um, there's the story where uh, you know he was just walking amongst the people and he saw someone that was looking at him and was trembling. And he went and put his hand on the person's shoulder and they stopped trembling. And he said, I'm not a king. I'm, I'm the slave of my Lord. You know? Um, and then there's the story that they tell where uh, anyone he touched, they would smell like him for days. So the law of Southern. And he, so they, all of the people would try to get their children around the Prophet Sallallahu so he could touch them. So they could come home and the house would be fragrant from the fact that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam touched the child. Yeah, that's that's one of those. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. What else? So. These things, one of the things, like I was saying yesterday, I'll reiterate it is, you know, our, the Quran says, Dali Kal Kitab, for those who, and it goes on to say, those who believe in the unseen. For those who believe in the unseen. And we have to remember that the unseen is this enormous realm, much bigger than this, what we can touch and see. It's huge. And we believe in the unseen, and we believe in the angels, and we believe that the angels and these energies and all these realities are true. I, I remember a man who I met, and he was studying earth, air, fire, and water from the point of view of, of, uh, of, uh, I think it was Aristotle. And, and I had been studying it according to Ibn Sina, and the, you know. And, uh, and I met him in the cafe, and so we started talking. We talked, and we'd have these regular meetings. And one day we were having a talk, and he said, well, I, I have a spiritual teacher. And I said, oh, what, uh, what kind of, and he'd, and he'd give me some sort of kind of dubious kind of re references to the spiritual teacher. With due respect, I mean, it might have been great, but there were some things that I wasn't sure about. And I said, well, does, uh, does this guy, does it, does it cost you to, be his, for him to be your teacher, and he says, "Oh yeah, it's pretty expensive." It's I said, and after he told me it was pretty expensive, you had to pay this teacher. And I said, "Well, you know, in, in Islam, it's like the teacher is not not permitted to take money." And he kind of looked at me like, and he kind of went into the state, like like some realization that wait a minute, this is not okay. And he went into the state in which he kind of had a fit. He fell to the floor, was shaking, couldn't move. And I ne never, he, I didn't even tell him I was a Muslim. He didn't know that. So I went next to him and I started reciting uh, uh, Fatiha and Ikhlas over and over and over. And each time I did, it came out of it. And he came out of it crying and said, what do I do now? How do I, he, as if to say, well, how do I get free from this? Because it was like some, some kind of magic. I, but I've seen this more than once. I've seen it many, many times where recitation of Quran <clears throat> will affect people positively, even if they don't have a clue what it is. And they say afterwards, what was that? He became a Muslim, of course, the guy, but 
he didn't know what that was, but he listened to it. So, so the power of those words and the power of the heart and intention that we have with anyone is extraordinary. I studied uh, Thai massage. And the teacher I had, he was a pretty amazing guy. He was one of the most severely traumatized people I've ever met. He could never, basically, he'd have a fist fight with someone every day. <laughs> and he was a taught Thai massage. But he also had these insights that were very strange. A wonderful man, but trouble. He was, he was born, his mother was born, he was born and his mother was pregnant in the middle of war in Vietnam. <laughs> but uh, he used to do exercises with us to kind of, it was a great class in Thai massage, but one of the closest things, and they claim that lineage goes back to the Buddha, the Buddha's position that Thai massage. And uh, he would do these exercises in which we would work on someone with the massage, and it's all done on the ground. And then we'd, we'd do, and do certain moves, and then we would ask the person to give a response. And then he would say, now in your heart, in your being, do the same thing with this, this particular intention. So our attention would change. And we do the same thing, and they would report this different thing. It was connected to our intention. I was saying earlier this morning about a man when I was in Pakistan. There was a man uh, who was I traveled with, and he traveled. We traveled around uh, nor northern Pakistan. Uh, actually, we traveled from Shik from Karachi out, and he said, "We're going to visit the Mazars. We're going to visit the." Uh, We're going to visit the uh, the tombs and the bazaars, the maqams of the Aulia, of Aulia. But he said, I wanted you to do me a favor. Don't read any of the names of the people. You know, if it's all right with you, don't do that. So that we visit them and they're on, on, anonymously. You don't know who's buried there. You know, avoid that. You know, this is Sheikh such and such. And he said, do the things that you usually do, which is, you know, give salams to your dhikr. Make the up for yourself and for the person that's there, et cetera, et cetera. And we do that. And what we did is we went to each one. And each one, I would do that. And then I'd come out. And he'd say to me, what did you experience there? And I'd just say, well, I felt this, 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 this. And then he would tell me the story of the person who was buried there. And it would be this, this, this. It was subjectively spot on. He's following me? That was his teaching. His name was Colonel Wah and they, another one of these colonels, Colonel Wahid Baksh. <laughs> I think that means something like the, the one gift or something. Huh? Lunch. Lunch. And we went to many, and, and it was the same thing. Each place has a reality that's subjective that is about that person. You know, when the Quran says, do not say they are dead, they live. And this is true for all the people that have passed away, our mothers. You know, they live on within us, and they live on in the collective realities of the unseen. I have this wonderful shirt that I, my son got from one of the tribal peoples. It's called. It's a ghost dance. The traditional natives have something they call the ghost dance. And this ghost dance shirt is a particular dance. And it's a dance and a ceremony that the natives developed. And they, they, they did these, this ceremony, which was meant to make, make peace between the, you know, these, the terrible white cavalry and armies and all the tribes. And so what do you think the white people did? If it's about something to make peace, what do you suppose they did? Huh? They, they, they outlawed it. <laughs> Couldn't do it. How dare you make peace? And so you know, so that. But on that shirt, it the shirt. It's a, it's a ghost ant shirt in that ceremony, and on it has all these different symbols like birds and stars and different things, and all those represent ancestors that we honor and identify. And in the ghost dance, you would then bring in the the you know the blessings of those ancestors together for the time. And one of the things that's lost in the modern world is not only connections with our ancestors, 
but the honoring of them and the honoring of that energy that remains in every one of us, in our genes, in our epigenetics, if you will, all of that reality that's in the unseen that's powerful, very strong. You were going to say. Assalamu alaikum. For all of those online that are not coming back from lunch like the people here, <laughs> I'm here. Assalamu alaikum. Feels funny looking at a wall and saying Assalamu alaikum, but hey, this is the modern world. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> well, I'm not sure how long or how many are still coming. It'll take a little while. But uh, any commentary or any quick? What where did we leave off? We were yawning. Touch. <laughs> well, actually, so just to let another couple of commentaries on touch. And we can yawn. Please, if you feel by like yawning in this session, it's halal. Okay. But if you yawn, notice what's taking place. Notice what you feel in your jaw. Notice what you feel around your eye sockets. And some of the things that happen in yawning that I didn't go into in detail, I could go on for quite a long time, even though there's very, very little few studies, and they're all very recent. And people are usually looking in the same sort of area over and over and over and reiterating it. Uh, and about a week ago, I found someone who did a survey on the research done in yawning. And he had actually all the uh, good. You're telling. He had all the points and the things that I'd come up with. Like one of the remarkable things that happens is when we yawn, the, there's a there's something called the keratin body, which is a mass of cells where the carotid ar arteries, carotid artery splits and goes up both sides of the brain. <laughs> and at that point, the carotid the carotid body. Does, sends out all these messages and all these activities take place, including the f increasing some degree of flow in the spine. That's a pretty major thing, flow in the spine. It, uh, it, it, it stimulates the production of nitric oxide, which is something, you know, that I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with some of the things involved in that. Uh, it, it uh, stimulates penile erection. It has signal, it signals social engagements of all sorts of different kinds. Hunger, adversity, awakening, joining, connecting, all of these various things happen. And it's no accident that it is one of the most common social contagious things that take place. So there's lots of other things. I don't have them. You know, at hand, but if anyone wants to see any of that research on the studies, it's so interesting. And I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot more uh, uh, discoveries of the kind of implications of yawning because it is such a common thing. I've discovered, too, when I work with people in somatic work, whether I get where I, I'm in, encouraging them to come become present in their bodies. And to talk about being present in your body all automatically and already brings may, enables a lot of people to suddenly become more aware that they have a body. My, my beloved teacher, Dr. Lowen, he used to say, uh, you know, some people, some people feel like in, in the world there are nobody. They have no body. Nobody is nobody. And he says, then they, they may change and feel like, well, now I am somebody. You follow what I'm saying? Those words are remarkable, kind of just very direct. And he went so far as to say, we could say we have a body, or he said we could even go so far as to say we are a body. It's the place where our soul lives, and it will live, be there until it allows frees it from our body. And so it's intimately connected from the time of Adam and all of his successors to us today, when Allah placed that soul in our body, and we answered the question from Allah, am I not your Lord, la la and we said yes. 
and our soul entered our body. So one of the hikmas I have in that list is the animal body heals the animal body and the self. And one of the videos I send out to people is, is some of you have probably, probably gotten it, the, the Impala. Anybody else gotten the Impala video? Just, but the video, what is this? It's a video of an Impala, like a kind of gazelle, that has been caught by a cheetah, and the cheetah's jaws are on the neck of that. And that cheetah is essentially dead. Did I talk about this yesterday? Yeah, I did. OK, I don't want to reiterate. But the point of that, that cheetah did not have to listen to a TED talk or go to a cheetah, a, a, a gazelle therapist. The, the gazelle didn't need to do that. Because what it needed to do was innate by Allah's design. And that what was needed to do innately was to have some means by what time had passed and that would tell the, the Impala that it was safe enough to begin to come back after exiting, being effectively, effectively dead, no heartbeat, no breath for a period of time. You, I, and all of us mammals can do that by virtue of the mammalian diving reflex for up to a half hour or 45 minutes, especially in cold water. And there's no damage. That's a protective mechanism in mammals, all mammals. And that, so that, that gazelle is not breathing, nothing, no movement, and probably no heartbeat, because it's a video. But then at some point, starts to breathe, and then suddenly starts breathing lots. Great breathing. And then that breathing starts moving into the body, and it, the gazelle sits up. And it goes through very particular movements. Can't stop it. That's the line. This is what, and this is what I've had. This is what brought me to the study of the yawning. Is I've had people who would have an inclination to yawn, and I say, "Go ahead and yawn." And then they would suddenly they they start yawning, and then they say, "Start again." I said, "Don't don't stop. Let it happen." There would be a cascading of this impulse over and over and over, and I mean, in that process of the yawning, very often. There would be memories come up from them. But it would be interesting in the fact that most, when I see these memories, they would be memories that seem to be, at least by my own subjective observation, they were memories that were being transformed and processed as they came forth in the on. Allah gave us everything to you. That, like I said, that gazelle did not have to go to a gazelle therapist. It needed to let what was designed in its body to do its work. And yet yawning, well, you all do it in every, every, you find it in every creature. Fish, birds, everything, all creatures. It's across the board pretty much socially. I don't know of any, well, no, that's not true. Probably some very, very earth-connected people in forests and jungles in the world probably don't feel the need to. Politely yawn and stifle it. But that stifling, if you look at that, that is an essential encounter between our, man, our animal nature and social constraint. And when we, I mean, for so many of us, that is a, that, that's a difficulty and a, a problem in the first place in all different levels. How do we be natural and whole? And, uh, and, and so some people, you just mentioned yawning and talk about it. My friend, I was telling him about the research I'm doing, and he's and, and on the phone, and he said, you're making me yawn right now. <laughs> but it, just talking about being in the body, I've seen it makes people begin to yawn. It's natural for us to be in the body, and it's natural. So like answering the question the other day, yesterday, which is, we're not learning something new. We're remembering something we lost. So I remember someone that did did a lot of somatic, some somatic work with me, and then for a couple of years she hadn't done any somatic work. She hadn't, and and we can exert, we can withdraw from our body and and be dissociated and not present in our body, 
because it's a, it's a strategy for managing the difficulty of being alive. So this woman, I remember one woman who I, uh, I said to her, I hadn't spoken to her for a long time, and she says, I needed to call you because so much is going on in my life. Maybe I could talk to you about what's happening. And I said, well, OK. Because, and I could tell she was, so I said, well, so what are you noticing in your body? And she stopped for a moment. She broke down sobbing. And that's all it took. What are you noticing in your body? Hello, you remember you have a body. Remember your soul is there in this body. Didn't take much. So touch, but let's finish the thing about, so anything else about yawning? How what? Well, I mean, it, it is, all, one thing we know that it is contagious. And I would suggest that because it's used as a signaling mecha mechanism amongst many other things. The other thing that happens with the yawn, if it's a successful yawn and you get a bit of tears with a lot of yawning, there was a study done several years ago, and I can't find it again, but that, that there, there's a new, there, there is something that's a recent kind of articulation of what's called the glymphatic session, uh, the glymphatic system. Anybody know that term? No, glim, glymphatic. Glymphatic relates to the glymph, the glymph cells, which are primary brain cells. And the glymphatic system is like the lymphatic system, but it's much more refined and fine-tuned. It's much more like my microscopic. Now there you are tuning your pyro, tuning your polyvagal system. <laughs> People that do this, if, if in, and the advice I give them is, that's all right. Your body knows to do that, but the secret of that is doing it as slowly as you can, stretching the experience in time, and feeling and being present in every piece of that movement. And that will regulate some of the nervous system and the social engagement system. The polyvagal system has to do with the, the double nerves that go from the base of the brain to the heart and the lungs, and their balance or imbalance to the stomach and the entire body, and then back up to the brain in feedback. and is important in the actual social engagement systems of the face, voice. We talked a little bit yesterday about the tone of voice and the melody of the voice, right? The, how much that says beyond the words, right? We talked a bit about that. I could go a long thing on that. So the social, so so in the animals, you know, most of the studies on yawning have been done with chimpanzees and monkeys and and rats. But I mean, that's the scientific world. I mean, <laughs> which which is kind of unfortunate in some way, you know, because rats are not humans, nor are monkeys. But but so there's a lot of signaling that takes place. Sometimes hunger. People are hungry. Sometimes alpha male with a threat, will, they'll both yawn each other. But that's baboons with these big teeth. Part of that is showing their teeth, maybe. So there's a lot that we don't know, but we know it's contagious. And the, and the degree of contagion in humans, it's not contagious before the age of five. I'm just in study, so you know, before the, not until you're after five years old does it become contagious. We can make, uh, you know, uh, have opinions on why that would be the case, I suppose. But we know it's contagious. <laughs> and I, I say, yeah, I'm not going to. But it's a waking up. That's clear. The one thing that's common in all these studies is that it awakens what they, it calls, it says, an arousal of the brain. So we can say yawning is something that shows we're bored. On the other hand, we could say it shows that we want to wake up, right? Alhamdulillah, was a nice yawn. Yes. Yes.
group communal healing. healing yes. So the hundred being like an example of that. Yes. Uh, so yeah, I was just mentioning about like um, connecting like sound, touch, vibration, and communal healing, and the hadra being an example of that. And I have heard like even some people suggest that this was actually a response to, for example, the trauma of the Mongol invasions. Is that you actually have the hadra coming out of that? Allahu I'm like I don't know well, the origins of it, but I've heard like some scholars mention that, for yeah. example, and then. I've heard like more recently, a couple of people, Sheikh Idris Watts being one of them, mentioning like for our times, do we have to come up with maybe something that's actually new and relevant to our times that actually brings in these different elements, bringing in elements of our sacred tradition, but something that's actually for our times, not just like necessarily Hadra, but something else that actually is uh, innovative group worship still connected to our tradition. Interesting, yeah. But well, Idris is on it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I know. But I wanted to know your thoughts on on that. Number one, like, yeah. what are your thoughts on it? And then two, like, how do we actually go about um, bringing that into community? Because yeah. even the Hadra is something that's, uh, you know, contested and it's a controversial issue, not even among... I think, among, the, yeah. I think any sort of objection to the Hadra, personally, pretty thin, really. It's really pretty thin. Uh, and, and the power of it, from anyone who sees it and experiences it, the degree to which it's recognized and it seems right, uh, I think it may fit any time. But that doesn't mean there might not be something else that comes out. We don't know. I mean, at the moment, we're bereft in terms of communal thing, in terms of what happens by the social sound of common. You know, again, back to my, my, my science nerd, nerdism, I remember because I, when I was growing up in high school, I lived near this big thing called Pollywog Pond, and it would be thousands and thousands of frogs. And, you know, at, when the frogs are at night at certain times, you just hear this this roaring of all the frogs croaking together. And when I was doing that, all that science nerd stuff, I discovered these studies in which they would take recordings of the frogs and they would amplify them as if there were more frogs and the frog would, frogs would stop reproducing. You know, in other words, that was a common thing. There's the murmuration. You, people familiar with murmuration? Bird? Murmuration of birds and fish? No? This is another one of those common things. I mean, again, it's, it's reps, it relates a lot to the Rupert Sheldrake kind of stuff on some level. But it's the fact that the birds, in fact, there's one bird uh, variety. They travel in these great uh, flocks, thousands of them all at once, and they all turn at the same time. And so they move as a body. They relate as to each other. That's called murmuration. And the fish do it as well. And they're doing the study, well, how do they do it? Is it the wake of the wings? That's the most common belief. In other words, the movement of one is affecting the movement of the next one and it's affecting the movement of the whole. But it's so consistent from the center of the group all the way to the edge simultaneously, we have to ask what's going on. There's so much that happens that is not directly touch, but it's sensed. It's like there's this story about the sharks. You know about the sharks can sense urine in the water from a human from something like a mile away. Does anybody know that? Remember that stuff? This is kind of David Attenborough kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you appreciate that. I like to make these references to people and see who goes. I, I said to the last one, I, I said it's kind of a David Cronenberg kind of issue. And some woman out there went, <laughs> and the other thought, well, who's David Cronenberg? <laughs> How many of you know quite David Cronenberg, by the way? <laughs> it's a good reference for a particular, a very peculiar kind of not weird weirdness, right? <laughs> anyway, alhamdulillah. So, and I wanted to mention also we, in terms of the touch thing. So I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I appreciate uh, Idris and his approach, because he has a good, solid knowledge. And he's also someone 
like myself, because you and I were both present at the beginning of the Is Islamic psychology where, uh, presentations in Istanbul before they started the college. And, and we both agreed because he was, you know, he calls himself one of my students. Thank God, thank you for that at least because, uh, but, but the, you know, the shortcomings of psychology. But he has a good solid Islamic knowledge and so I'm looking to him always, and I always, you know, say to him, "That's you know, great. Keep it up. Go for that." Because that's what I'm saying. I'd like to see this take place in a greater number of us. Um, so I don't know what else it could be, but there's endless things. I believe in group group music, but I believe in, like I said, uh, some of you may not have heard this yesterday. The last workshop I did in Southern California, I started it with an example that I learned from. Minister Farrakhan at the Million Man March, in which he had everybody raise their hand. It wasn't like that, but raise their hand and call their name, say, I, Hakeem Archuleta, I, whatever their name was. And a million men, there must have been a million men there. It was a pretty awesome thing. He said, I, and then they spoke their name, and they, then he had them repeat, I make a vow from this day to never talk or put down or strike a woman in my life from this day on. And Allah, I don't know what that did, but it was powerful. And people I've spoken to were there with that. There were changes. The power of that kind of thing together is you know, to do something like that. So Let me just finish that thing because yeah. the people who weren't here. What I did is I, I, I asked people to vow to sing as often and as much as they could from that day on and to hold to that commitment with their family members, with friends, with their alone. If it's, it can be alone, fine. If it's one or two other people, even better. But to sing because we've lost that part of our humanity. And yesterday I said to a man who said, I can't sing. I said, you, you can sing. You are the inheritor of Sidna Dawood, alayhi salam, who sang his message with such beauty that the birds fell from the sky. You're a human being, and that's your birdness. That is your birdness. And it's built in as all the animal qualities we contain in some degree. That's why Allah places us at the center of his creation with lioness. Lionishness. And birdness and snakeness and so on. We could go on and on. It's to understand ourselves by those forms that are contained within us out there in the creation. So, yeah, we, we can recover singing. We can recover singing. And I don't mean, you know, I, I don't believe personally in, in that, the kind of singing in which we, we take. I mean, the beautiful thing about Moroccan. The Moroccan Qasaid and the Arabic Qasidas uh, Kasi, and stuff that are sung vigorously and with harmony, with, with, with uh, strength and power, you know, Jalali quality, loud. Um, the language is not the same as English. And the melodies are not the same, and the, the scales are not the same. The scales in, from India to Morocco, the Makama in Morocco and in, in the Middle East, and the the ragas in India, all of those represent states. And the traditional uh, sound, someone is talking about sound, the medicine of sound. The medicine of sound used to be understood by this principle that music hath, what is it from Shakespeare? You think music hath the strength to soothe the savage beast? Isn't that it? Did anybody know that Shakespeare line? It changed, in any words, Hamza al-Din, love bless his soul. Did any of you know Hamza al-Din? He was in the Bay Area for many years. He passed away and, you know, blessed man, played the oud and sang. And he once, I was, he was, came to New Mexico one time, he talked about how the, the, the music and the belly dancing, belly, dan belly dancing is actually, the word belly dancing actually came from ballad dancing. And the in the English, ballad meaning country dancing, and the and the English 
heard bala dancing as belly dancing and they turned into belly dancing. But he said belly dancing was something in which the movements, <coughs> you know, the belly dancing was very specific kind of thing in which the arms would move in accordance to the flutes and the hips would move according to the drums, interestingly enough, <laughs> and so on. And other parts would move according to the santur. And this was all. But he said in those times, people had the art in which they could take and play music and change someone's state. We know this is a technique that was used in, uh, in Andalusia in Spain, in hospitals, in the hospitals where they treated so-called mental illnesses with diet, activities, music, theater, drama, and things that were not talked not talk alone. They were activities that changed people and brought people together. I mentioned yesterday about a therapy that didn't last very long because it's so impractical in which there would be four people to every single person, four or five actual people who were well balanced and well boundaried and con contained solid with one person who is not being able to be solid. And that they would, by, by being but proximity to these people they would learn. So we learn from each other. And we learn from the world around us. And we learn from, you drive from careening down the highways at 80 miles an hour and 2,000 pounds of metal, isolated one per driver in what my son used to call isolation pods. We learn from those things. The medium is the message. So, yeah, we, we'll see. But I, I'm an advocate for, why not do Hadra? I mean, it's singing, and it's a kind of dancing. I mean, and I mentioned that to some, I, I may have mentioned this now, I'll go so far as to mention it again, with due respect, Sheikh Hamza. I remember him walking with me in New Mexico and saying, you know, we should all do Hadra. And, and then he realized his students were behind him, and he said, for our bodies. <laughs> And I say, yes, for our bodies. The place where our souls and our hearts reside. So, we'll see. But I would suggest we bring back singing, and I recommend this book. I recommended it yesterday, Rise Up Singing. Did I recommend that yesterday? There is a book I used to have. I don't have it right now. It's called Rise Up Singing. And it's the kind of book, it has everything from uh, nursery rhymes, to old uh, uh, Irish and English folk songs, to uh, uh, Beatles and Dylan songs, and traditional. It, it has this amazing collection. And it's got uh, the words, and it's got the chords and chord changes and things like that, you know, basic musical. And, but you know, you can sing it, you can do this with your family. And I, and I recommend do it with your friends and family. Just we, one of the things we did in Chicago with that thing is we simply, uh, we, did, we did a little singing here, but it was hard to get people to do the jalal, the uh, chorus. But one of the things I did in, in Chicago, we had quite a few people. How many? It was at least 100, about 100 people there. And I just got people to all, and we can do that right now. Let's just do that, okay? Just make it. Listen in and see if you can find the common note. And just do, ah. Okay, again. Use my as the follow. Uh, and listen and do it again this time with more force and more volume. Uh, and we can make it a law. Allah. Listen and make it volume. Allah. And notice what that little tiny bit does to your body and your state. If nothing else, by breathing with some energy. We were designed to sing. Otherwise, Senator Daoud would not have come in that form and done that thing. They say that some people, some singers have become so good at singing 
with such movement that they, not only people fall unconscious, but some people would die. And some of you must know if you've really listened to Gavali or even Coke studio recordings, you know what I'm talking about, the possibilities. Anyway. Oh, just a couple of years. Yeah. I didn't. I mean, most, most of the people I've worked with since that time are, uh, are, are Desis, mostly, mostly Pakistanis. But I, you know, what the inheritances I got there were the two my teachers were Indian Pakistani, so and my wife is Pakistani. She's Punjabi, so I continue to learn. What? Bismillah. One of the things that uh, I've noticed is in gatherings um, when we're reciting Quran or there's dhikr. At times you hear voices that are not there singing with you. And for me, how I notice it is because it's, if it's a group of men, nobody's hitting that note. Nobody's <laughs> hitting that note. That note, yeah. It's a oh, note they'll kick it when it comes. Yes. You, know that, you know what? Genius, musical genius was Mozart. Now, may, how many, any of you even familiar with Mozart or fond of Mozart music? Mozart, I mean, he was a... He has a he has a two flute sonata for two flutes that he wrote, and he had he, his genius is he had it designed so that the sound of the two flutes would create a third voice. So if you listen, and then when you say wait a minute, there's a third flute, and it's the but there's this principle called the this. The cir the, it's a circle of fifths. Does anybody know? You know what, who knows what the uh, a, a fifth is in a in a in a uh, an octave? So you know what? So a fifth is what? Uh, seven semitones. Sorry. Seven semitones. It's the it's the yeah the fifth the fifth of the. Of the knots, the well, it, we, it, we could call it the interval between a tonic note, one note, mm -hmm. and the next note that vibrates in harmony with that. Not the most immediate one, but the most common one before it goes an entire octave. So who can sing it? Who can sing? Where's Mom and McCabe? Da, 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 something like that. The circle of fifths, when we're singing together, and... Some people, you know, say don't sing harmony. The traditions are not singing harmony in Kosai, but when we sing together, that thing happens automatically. The sound of singing three people is greater than one plus one plus one, because every so every sound and every vibration that comes from one person's voice will amplify the other ones, providing they're in harmony. If they're out of harmony, it will dampen it. Right? You all get that? So it's the interval between a note, because we go up and pick da 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 That's the twelve tone scale in Western music. In the Arabic world and the rest of the world, there's much more tiny more 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 notes in that in the scales that are usually used. In the ragas and the makamat uh, from the Middle East and Chinese music and so forth. So, a group of five people singing is more than the equivalent of five different voices put together because each one, if they're singing in harmony, and you know what it's like when you hear people singing in harmony, right? If uh, I mean, if I if we'd had the video stuff together, one of the things I wanted to present, and this can be in the videos that if you subscribe to this next stage of that we were talking about yesterday, this new stage of the stuff I've been producing, I produced these videos. But a lot of it is listening to the various ways in which harmony is expressed in the world. The Russian harmonies in the traditional Russian, before all that uh, political craziness took place, awesome. Just awesome, just like serious. Pardon me? How would you characterize? How would you search 
how would you search online for something like oh, that? Oh, you can just go to Russian, traditional Russian harmonic singing, and you'll find these group of, groups of men sitting, you know, and they'll do many different parts that, that are in harmony, different, you know, so like, I guess they do something like even five parts, different harmonies. And then when solo, uh, someone will come in and on the top is solo, kind of as the, uh, the, the part of a poem. It's only poems about the world and nature and the birds and the trees. And I mean, it's beautiful stuff. It's very moving. And the Africans, the Africans do the same thing. The Eastern Europeans, you know, Bulgarian singing, but the Africans are really good at it. This multi harmony. So that stuff is part of our birthright as human beings that we've left behind for these absurd little plastic discs that we call, that we can say about, I love music. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to love that, and the other thing is to love singing or making some sound, even if it's drumming on a couple of sticks or something. Okay? So, what else? Comments? This is supposed to be the discussion, and I'm holding forth here, and rather than just, if I sit down, it's going to be, I'm going to be a little more passive, and even though a higher level here. Up, up or low. What, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, like, shamanism and, like, what they do? Who's, who's saying that? Oh, shamanism. Shamanism, well, I mean, I... There's New Age shamanism and there's traditional shamanism. Shamanism is the natural. It's kind of it's kind of people who play a certain role in societies, and uh, it's usually around uh, the the whole arena and realm of the unseen that they bring into their cultural realities, and people who they have had some kind of initiation into an understanding or proficiency in whatever it is they're doing and elected to do. The <clears throat> and this brings brings up something else that I want to talk about and thing is the started to talk about earlier, which is the vastness of the unseen that we as Muslims are obliged to believe in. Dalik al Kitab, we believe in the unseen. And the unseen is vast. It's much more vast than this material world. But in Australia, I don't know if people are familiar with, the Australians had a Sharia. In the past, there are ancient peoples, ancient peoples. And it's only, I mean, they were, someone who visited there in the 30s and 40s tells the story about coming back and how they've been decimated by the modern world and the food from the modern world. He said, because, and he had pictures of these people, he said they were like warriors. Magnificent bodies, muscular, well-formed, balanced physiques, great postures, present in the world. And then sugar and white flour and all of this stuff came in and it wasted the, uh, the population. But the pictures, I mean, if you ever look at the pictures of the, of the, of the Australian Aborigines in the 30s, amazing people. And they weren't going to any gym. They weren't going to gym, but they were not. A, they were super buff and absolutely beautifully formed bodies. That says something about our lifestyle. We don't need gyms. In fact, you know, I'm not a. I, I don't recommend gyms, but I do recommend lots of movement. We're designed to move. Like I said, the number I can say the number eleven bus is the starter. You know, but we don't do that. But the Australian Aborigines, they had a Sharia, and they had an amazing connection to the unseen, because they did this. They had a practice called the Mulga wire, and the Mulga wire is one thing where if they wanted to communicate and connect with somebody else, they would start a fire and they'd send a message that would be answered by someone else with that fire, and then they would just sit down in front of the fire and they connect. Right? They would connect somehow, the mocha wire, and they, they would connect with details. Is that better sound? Yeah. 
So, but also what they would do is if someone had, if someone in the community had violated that level of the Sharia, in which they would then be uh, open to, uh, to um, punishment by death, it would be done by the shaman. They didn't, whatever they call it, I mean, the shaman's a very different name. That's, that's a sort of catch-all phrase for many different things. People use their drugs and whatever. The Russians who drink you know, poison, the poison mushrooms, and then they urinate it out and give it to the next one, and they pass it on. And Because it's such a poison, it's not assimilated. Back to our the, the hecma about poison, anything we cannot assimilate or eliminate is a real toxin. But the shaman... In the, in the traditional Sharia of the Aboriginal, if a man was sentenced to execution, it would be done by the man who had the bag of bones, and he would take out of it a, one single bone and point it at the person. Done. That was the execution. And they would die within a period of time. So what do you think of that? Does anybody know the story of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? When he, when he threw a pebble at the man and hit him in his neck, and the man turned him and said, he killed me. And the man died. What does that say? <laughs> what does that say? It says a lot. It says a lot about what can happen by imagination and belief. And that can happen both in the negative sense and the positive sense. I was just sharing with someone earlier about my experience with viruses from many, many, many years ago, long before COVID ever came about, in which I would have uh, people would call me from Australia, London, New York, California, all within a few days of each other, and say, I have this flu, can you help me with it? I used to get this kind of, I did a lot of that kind of work back in early years. And they would describe these very specific kind of flu symptoms, and they say, well, it started like this, and then this, and this, and this. And each one would be so similar. My question you know, came up, how can this be so similar? And even they described it was sore throats like, and then it was subjective description. How can they all be so similar and so spontaneous from such a disparate places in the world? Did they travel there? I mean, and it made me question viruses. It made me question to the point that and I was saying, I just spoke about this for the first time to my friends, but I'm speaking about uh, it. made me question the whole reality of viruses so much so that when I hear, would hear someone say, oh, there's this thing going around, and I, my red flags would go, mm, red, this thing going around. <laughs> okay, And then they would start to tell me about it. And I would automatically sort of move into this protective mode, not dissociation, but protective of my own locus and being, in which I would hear it, but inside it would be protected by the shell of la Allah. I'm not going to allow this suggestion this was was to enter into my being because I felt I felt that that may be the virus itself so I'm just throwing it out as just a suggestion but I will add that, that from the scholar's point of view the jinn part of jinn part of the nature of the jinn is that they have qualities they will never know because they are jinn. They're unseen creatures. They are the creatures of the unseen, and they are the families of the unseen. They have families, and they have they have generations in the family, and so forth. I'll leave it at that. But I'm pointing out here how important it is to realize how we are influenced by what seems to be subtle realities. Back to these things about TV programs that we watch. Uh, you know, I know someone that watched this TV series called uh, The Morning Show. Anybody ever watch that? Yeah, and it was very, very well done. 
But if you pay attention, it's all about backstabbing. The theme underlying it's all about backstabbing, making something, being successful at the expense of anyone. And those are the kind of messages that go in in spite of the drama and the glamour or anything like that. The humor. Humor can be the cover up for all these things. I've never watched Aragal or Oregon or whatever it is. Huh? Eric Trugel. I've never watched any of that in spite of the fact that all the Muslims say, eh, it's about Ibn Arabi. In the <laughs> Mashallah, maybe. Uh, uh, but but I, I know that these things, there are messages that we don't recognize and that we pick up because the subtle influence that we're open to and capable of being changed by are enormous. I love the study that happened in one of the universities, Midwest universities, in which the sociology professor said, I want to do an experiment with you all if it's OK. And, but I, you have to vow to keep it secret and private and let no one know about it and don't mention it to anyone. And everybody agreed, promise, promise. Yes, they all promised. And so the experiment was, he said, I want you, when you're on campus, if you see anyone wearing red, you tell them, you look great today. You don't mention anything red, but you look great today. If they had anything red, a month later, everyone was wearing red. <laughs> if you want to see really another interesting of the influence, well, the century of the self is, is and pe people know the century of the self. That's a, no, it's a documentary by Adam Curtis. It, it has a lot about the how we are influenced by these subtle realities and subtle things. It's a very, so it, it's an engaging uh, documentary. But um, uh, what was the other one I was going to mention? The other one that's really interesting, and someone said, and I thought it was a joke, they said, well, you know, if you're driving a Subaru, what's the likelihood that you would be considered to be what? Huh? Who drives Subarus? Huh? White people with children? Yeah. How about lesbians? <laughs> They're white people not with children necessarily. Sometimes. No, but here's it. If you go to the Atlantic magazine, Atlantic magazine, and they have a whole exposition a whole kind of article, it's a description of how lesbians were targeted by the marketing world to buy Subarus. And the subtle way in which no one knew it was happening, but it's a result with all these subtle things like the kind of license plate, the kind of color, the kind of setting, it was all psychologically designed so that suddenly the, became the, the, the car for lesbians. They were successful. It's a really interesting article to read, just in terms of the capabilities of that kind of subtle influence. Healing works in the same way. And I say this if the only if there's only two or three therapists, because we're all healers of each other. And we have to recognize and be cognizant of the subtle influence we can have, even by what we're seeing or thinking inside, that may not be obvious and you know, in, in the words. It's really important. I always say to men, I say, look, assume that your wife knows everything about you, knows everything you're feeling, and there's no way you can ever be dishonest with her because she knows when you're dishonest. And your children, the same. And your animals, the same. Although the animals are much more flexible in being loyal <laughs> than dogs and cats. <laughs> They're amazingly forgiving. The other side of feeling? Well, I, what I'm talking about, let, let's, let's jump a little bit more. In. Let's see. I'm trying to enable or talk about how do we restore wholeness of our being with all the aspects it has, from feeling to appearance. I have a hard time trying to tell people who dress my yacht. My, if, if I'm wearing so-called comfortable clothes, and I'm going out. She says, you're going to be homeless today? I said, no, I'm, I'll put on some nice clothing. You know. And how often do I see, see this thing where the, 
where the, the husband is saying, yeah, and my wife that gives me the same thing. Listen to her. Now, 80%, 80 percent, 80 percent of the judgment that's made from one person to another person is on their clothing. And we could say, oh, that's just a materialist, and I'm not a materialist, and I'm an artist, and blah, blah, blah. We could say all that, but this is the way we work. How it comes dressed. And 80% of that clothing is on the shoes. Does anyone notice the shoes I wear? Yellow. Moroccans. I can't go out in public most places without people saying, oh, I like your shoes. <laughs> They're just yellow. <laughs> yeah. They're out of the ordinary. And Prophet Sarsim said in Hadith, it's the best shoes. Yellow shoes are the best. It's, it's a Sahih Hadith. Anyway. So. Subtle influence, can it be related to frequency? Uh, I think it's, it's maybe a little too simplistic way of reading because everything has frequency. And everything has combinations of frequencies, and harmonics and chords, chordal realities. So, you know, uh, but, it, but it's, it's because it's very nuanced. And in, one of the things I wanted to do if we had, if I'd had videos to work with, you know, presentation, was to do, play certain kinds of music and ask you at certain stages in the music to know what happens in the body. But when it comes to voice, voices, I remember recently a man who's a dear, dear old friend who was passing through New Mexico and said, where, where exactly are you? And he, I said, well, I'm in such such place. And he said, well, I, I'll, 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 we're going to try to come by when I come back. And I knew he was lying. I knew he said that, but I knew he wasn't going to come by. And he didn't come by. But we know so much more, and the women know this better, by the tone of voice than by the words. And it's a pretty important thing. And children the same. Children and teenagers especially, they know when you're talking BS. Or, or when we're doing that line, this is what I'm supposed to say. Oh, yeah, this is that's because I'm going to be a good Boy Scout, Girl Scout, Muslim, or not. And being Sadiq, you know, look at the, the it's important principle here that the Prophet said his, his legacy went to Abu Bakr as Sadiq, not Sidna Ali, who was an amazing thinker and, you know, insights and deep stuff, but Abu Bakr to be Sadiq, to be genuine. This is a goal for us men more than the women because the women are more naturally honest. Uh, and people, some people, does anybody question that when I say this? I'm asking you right now, does anybody have, you know, say, no, that's not, no, it's true. I have problems, I mean, my teacher about marriage and relationships, he said the onus is on men. The woman can have gone through the most severe trauma and be so, so disturbed and wounded. But the man, if he's going to take on that marriage, he has the responsibility to care for that and oversee and care for that person, whatever comes. And by Allah, if he does that, he will be transformed. But so hard in the age we live in, because we all have been wounded. And we all have to, and that's one of the difficulties with having connection at all anyway. What do we, you know, my, one of my teachers, dear teachers, used to say, well, do you want to let that person in your lifeboat? Because we're living in a time, you know, one of the great metaphors of our time was the Titanic, which was the film when it came out, out was the best, most popular movie ever. It was the best, biggest box office because it was a perfect metaphor for modern life. They all said, well, this is unsinkable. Well, folks, this modern world is sunk. It's not sinking. It's sunk. And there's lifeboats. Some are in the, the wealthier in the lifeboats. Some don't get lifeboats. They're holding on to their baggage, so to speak. Some are drowning. Yeah. Yeah. 
Can you repeat what you just said? The metaphor. Oh. Well, I mean, that the question was, no matter what a woman has gone, gone through, does the man have the capability to manage and to be an ally in her healing, if you want to look at it from that point of view, or or can, to be her husband. <laughs> Husbanding is a very specific term. It's meaning taking care of something. Um, some men will rise to the occasion, and will be. The, and I've seen there are examples. I could give you some examples that just some spectacular examples of men who have had spiritual practices, gone through all sorts of things, and it was that woman. I mentioned this yesterday. It was the woman that, in the end provided that final piece they actually needed for that transformation to become a man. Not all their men in their men's groups, but the so-called, you know, fatua, and then, you know, <laughs> being strong and shooting arrows and riding horses, and what are chopping wood, I don't know what it is. <laughs> you know, the prophet says was more like a mother in many ways than he was anything else. And he was never, he was never accused of being too harsh. It was always too soft by others. So I don't know. I mean, it depends on Allah. But we live in a very difficult time, and there are some situations where a man is not capable of doing that because it is his own wounds, usually. But we're all so deeply wounded. I mean, there are some people that are so wounded that, you know, and I've been doing this work for over 50 years, and I've been seeing trauma, 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 trauma come to me. I'm sick of hearing the term. I don't like to even use that term anymore. Like I say, you know, I know it, it's become so overused and watered down, nobody understands the essence of it anymore, so much so that I expect to be driving down the road and seeing a sign that says, trauma-informed Sunday brunch. <laughs> I'm sure maybe it's already happened somewhere. So it's a hard, and we have to have, the, the moment we do respect to the therapists, they're coming in doing their best. But, uh, and the shiyuch, but you know there's a man who studies outcomes, therapist, Scott Miller. Do you know Scott Miller? He's got an interesting guy, isn't he? What's interesting is he said the same thing that Dr. Omar said, and I heard it from both of them in one week, the same thing. And I had it just mentioned it to someone too, which is the story of Joha. And it was about, I said it, and, but it's all about the same thing. It's about trying to solve things in the wrong way. And it's the story of Joha when he's, he's under a light lamp and he's going through the ground and the policeman comes by and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for my keys. Oh, you lost them? Did you lose them here? He said, no, I lost them in the house. He said, well, why are you looking here? He said, because the light's better. <laughs> you know, and, and, and on some level, that's the story of science. I mean, the science cancer research just, uh, uh, it's a juggernaut. Just continues, continues, continues. And cancer is going up still. Some cancers are getting better. Mental health, I mean, one of my teachers, I saw it in a video with him at his panel discussion from many, many years ago. And the first thing he said, he started the lecture and he, he was on a panel. And the first thing he said was, well, it's pretty clear that psychotherapy has failed completely. <laughs> and while there's more and more therapies, their self-help books are doubling in, in, in publication almost every year. It's gone crazy. And the number of therapists are now moving into thousands. And from that, tens of thousands or more of people who are, give testimonials for those therapists helping them. So with due respect to therapists, they're doing their best. It's like sinking, drowning people. Yeah, you pull them into your boat. But we're so wounded. I mean, there's some cases where, I mean, I've seen cases recently where I fear the man doesn't have the, the, the presence, if you would use that term, overused at this particular event, <laughs> the presence to be there for that person and her woundedness, or vice versa. But it's usually, uh, you know, the man that, that hasn't 
my teacher taught that in relationships, it's the onus is on men. I believe that. Well, a part of it's a Quranic injunction about caring and taking care of women. But because women already know so much more than we know, especially about relationships and feelings, and we're trained out of that, and we're jerked and forced out of that into being strong men and various things. This, this false idea of manhood in charge. And knowing, I mean, this all across the board thing, this Urdu, this Urdu term where you were, and I'm, someone mentioned, I mentioned this Urdu term that I learned recently. With so many Urdu, uh, Desi women, it's primary, Pakistanis most, been most of my people that I've worked with all these years. The, and, the, and, the, and the expression is, what do you know? You know, what do you know? You're just a woman. You're not going to know anything. So that's why I believe that's the case. Because women with their balance of more oxytocin and men with their balance of too much testosterone. And then men who come to me say, how do I boost my testosterone so I can feel stronger and more powerful? I said, that's not, that, you're, you don't get stronger and more powerful with testosterone. You can reproduce and you can make, and you can fight. But that's not what it's about. It's about being the nuanced in insight that informs your heart and makes you a, a big human being in yourself. About? About singing. So um, I was really inspired by the power you mentioned in singing and and the voice, the human voice, and using it to um, heal people through the yes. singing. Yes. So I teach early, I, work, I focus on early childhood education and I teach children, I teach children seven and under. And um, both in the mommy and me classes along with the preschool classes, I try to incorporate a lot of singing. And so whether it's um, traditional qasaid or the English translation of traditional qasidas or dhikr, I really just try to bring that to life yeah. through, um, you know, th throughout the program. And I just wanted to get your advice on what you would recommend specifically for children seven and under in regards to singing. Um, what type of songs and, and any and set you would have to share? Sounds like you're on it. I mean, Qasidas. The thing about Qasidas is they're beautifully, uh, audibly, they're beautifully written. They sound beautiful. I mean, one of the beauties about the Arabic language, it's not like English language. It's like, it's no accident that there's more operas in Italian because most of the words in Italian end with vowels. It's ready to sing. It's like designed to sing. And the Arabic language, and the Qasidas, even if it's Moroccan singing, it's got, it's a much more beautiful sound. You know, people used to, people used to listen to Quran that were enemies of the Prophet in Islam, and they would secretly listen because it was so awesome to hear it. We know that. Last night, the party at the end of the, our session last night, oh, you know, that was, that was it. I mean, you know, after all the things we did all day, we go there and for the Asia prayer, and this guy, and this man, you probably, a lot of, most of you probably know him, he's Moroccan. I mean, I've just gotten to know him recently, but that, that was, I mean, that was, that's said it all. So, uh, yeah, the Qasai, uh, I mean, traditional singing tends to be more, there's a lot more natural things, but even English, but, you know, you know I, I, I love Wash Quran and Wash Quran in, in group. I mean, that's one of the things when I became Muslim, I heard that. To me, that was the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard, and it was it moved me inside. I felt like it was my ancestors singing for me, reciting for me, Quran. 
but then I discovered, well, not everybody does that. Not amongst the most of them, so it's just the Moroccans and the Andalusians and the North Africans. So, I mean, it's they sing, 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 sing. The Moroccans, they start singing as babies. You know, and the tradition in Morocco is, was, the, was the, uh, <laughs> the tradition in Morocco was to have a Jews of Quran after, uh, after uh, Fajr and another Jews after Maghrib, but in unison singing so everybody can sit and take part in this collective voice and learn to recite Quran and learn the melodies and learn the style and learn to sing. And then they, I mean, you know, in the Arab countries, in Morocco, in Algeria, these countries, you go there and you'll find whole audiences of hundreds of people and they know all these awesome poems, long, elaborate poems about praise of God and the Prophet Sallallahu and all this stuff, and they know the words to it. It's like a whole mass of people singing these spiritual songs. There's a similar thing that happens in, in, the, uh, in, in the Eastern Desi world, in Pakistan, in those countries, all that, you know, in which they're classic poems. They don't know them in the same way the Moroccans do it. They haven't been singing them for years after years, and everybody knows it, but it's still based on that kind of spiritual poetry that uh, is absolutely gorgeous, beautiful, and anyone who spent time, I mean, when I was in Pakistan for those years, studying for those two years, I had the fortune, good fortune to go to lots of Kavali gatherings with very good singers, and they, there's a practice they do there, because those songs, if you listen to them, and you're present, and you can understand the words, I was with that man that would take me to the take me to the, uh, the, the maqamat, the, the, to the tombs of the awliya. I mentioned earlier, I don't, some of you probably weren't here. And he would have me just make dhikr and then afterwards tell me the story of the, uh, the wali without knowing who was there and show me how even by just being there, I got something from the nature of his life. And, and, and someone, you, you, someone here, she, Explain how that happened in, in uh, where? Indonesia. Indonesia. In Indonesia, where they went with a bunch of several women, and the women kind of spontaneously took hands and held hands, but fell around the tomb with this person, just without knowing anything, and they all began to cry. And they were told afterwards this man was known for his protection and service to women. That's who he was as a, as a wali. These things are real. And so this man that took me there, you know, it had a, it, it was the, it's, it's the, the Quranic truth that they do not say they're die, they're alive. So this realm of the unseen, sorry, someone's been wanting to ask a question for you. Is there a question back there, Hamza? Yes. Yes, what's that? So the question was, when you said the music goes to the tombs, what did that actually mean? The music? Going into the tombs, where you said the Islam music. What, what was all about that? I don't remember saying the music went into the tomb, but... Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Let me, I'll repeat this, Hamza. We, Allah designed us naturally to sing. And Sidna Dawood, one of the prophets, salam, he delivered his message in the form of singing. And they say that his singing and his message was so beautiful. And it was heard because of the beauty of the singing was heard by people with such depth that the birds were so beautiful that the birds would fall from the sky. But I say to people, when, and someone I said to uh, last night, I said to someone, I said, sing, sing, sing out. And he said, oh, I can't sing. And I said, yes, you can sing. You don't sing, but yes, you can sing. 
And the only thing that stops most people from singing out, and I'll hand it to the Moroccans, they don't hold back, and I'll hand it even more to the Tunisians, who just blast out. And when they blast out, every pore of our skin acts as an ear, and every bone hears what's being sung, and if we know the meaning of it, it deeply changes us and has an effect. And that's why when we have a powerful dhikr, we leave the dhikr, and our body continues to resonate and ring with it. So were you going to say something more, Hamza? How does the song make the bird fly, birds fly in the sky? Fall from, no, fall from the sky. Well, because it's so beautiful. Because birds are the ones, they're the, nat they're the ones we think of. They, have you ever listened to birds singing? They're really beautiful singers. I love birds singing. There's a woman who used to go to the forest in the East Coast with mockingbirds, and she used to take recordings of Gustav Mahler's symphonies and play it, and the birds would start singing the symphonies. <laughs> so it's the beauty of it. Allah gave us that capabilities for reciting Quran with beauty, that, that Qari last night. Was, uh, that, was the, that was the culmination of our whole day of talking about all these things, to listen to that extraordinary recitation. I, it's one of, I'm one of those days I'll, I'll never forget that moment. So, question here. Sorry, John? I believe so. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen young children, if you start playing drums or you have a rhythm. I had one of the videos I want to have here because how we respond to the world is part of what the second exercise I'm talking about, tracking. What do I notice in my body? What does my body do? Am I here dead or alive? The, prophet, uh, the, the Quran says that the kafirun are like propped up blocks of wood. They don't respond. But the human responds, and there's ayahs in Quran that says, for those who hear the ayahs and their bodies tremble. Right, Tarif? And the tears flow. Sheikh Habib, uh, my Sheikh, in one of his qasidis, he said, Oh Allah, send us that knowledge that will cause our bodies to tremor, tremble and our tears to flow. You know, and open our hearts to that and to that state of being. And that doesn't mean a state of weakness. It's, in its, it's a state of greatness and grandness. It's a bigger state than one that's constricted and closed. Oh, okay. So I went with a friend and my daughter, and my daughter was just, she was way more introverted than her mother. <laughs> I couldn't even yawn earlier today. I still haven't yawned yet, but I will. I will yawn. <laughs> but my but my daughter's seven, and she's just in in her body much more. They have these the the beat going. There's bass. There's a djembe drum. There's a shaker. And, she, and there's an older woman who was moving, and she just went with it. And she's like, Mommy, the, the music is moving me. I can't stop. I can't stop. the mo And I'm, I'm all constricted. Don't do that. It's inappropriate. That kind of move is not. Yeah. But she, was, she, just, she just naturally you know, went with it. When, so did you all hear that? When, one of the videos that I had tended to play, like I said, there's several videos I wanted to project them or have a view, and then ask you what response you have to your body, but one of them is, is it's a group of African children, maybe 15 or 20 young children, like, I don't know, four, three, four, five, maybe, very young, and this woman, that, and they never heard, never heard fiddle music, you know, that kind of fast thing, and she starts playing this fiddle music, and it's just, they just go wild. They just all respond, and it's a whole group of children doing that. So, uh, and animals do the same. There's a man that used to go, uh, there, there was a video, I think it was one of these uh, uh, 
David Attenborough type things. I don't know where, he, you know, this guy has a piano. He takes it out into the jungle and he plays his piano for this elephant that comes and <laughs> starts moving, <laughs> getting it on with the uh, piano. Okay, so what else? How are we? Yes, you can. Sorry? The answer is yes, you can. Yeah. Well, that's my, my thesis. And like I said, when I was in, when I was in Bravo Rain, I said, uh, La designed us to move, to respond to music. Just don't go to like weird places, but like, yeah. Well, unless you can manage weird places. Like, like I used to go to raves all the time and, and, and do hadras during the raves. I have a quick question, if I, if I can. Hello. Uh, what? Right here. I, I didn't hear. Thank you. Right here, I have a quick question. To your right. Right here. Right here. Um, I'm, I'm going back to like where you were talking a little bit more about like the warring, you know, like you know, there's people out here who want to war, versus there's people out here who want to have peace, perhaps. Um, yeah. And as Muslims in America, in the U.S., you know, um, from my experience, you know, it's been uh, it's been a little bit uneasy to be a Muslim in front of certain you know certain people to be open about who I am and stuff of that nature. Um, just curious if anybody else has experienced the same challenges before, or if anybody has any recommendations for how. We as Muslims continue to promote peace in a world that sometimes, you know, isn't necessarily uh, on the same page. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty good question, and I think it's a pretty common one because we do believe in peace, and we believe in making peace and promoting peace, and we believe what well, we believe in fighting when it's appropriate and defending. We all oh, that's true. It's hard for a lot of people to even grasp that. <clears throat> but it's hard to also to be what I've seen with again, like I said, most of the people that I've worked with in these over fifty years of work now has been mostly with actually mostly with Pakistanis and Arabs, but uh, mostly mostly Desis of support, Pakistanis Indians. And one of the things that's hard for anyone, my wife is a Punjabi, and you know it, it's hard for people to understand. Like white people like me, I came out of privileged white people, no, typical white people, Southern California community where there were no black people, not even brown people, not even, you know, Asian people. There were, there were, there were Mexican Americans next door who saved my life as human beings, to be honest, and were my protectors when I was in high school because I was a foreigner there. So I understood that, but it was hard for me to, in time, I finally recognized what it means to grow up. I had one woman who was a dentist, and she was working in a community with, with a wide range of, of uh, Muslims, and mostly Muslims, as a dentist. And she moved to somewhere else, and she started working with a clientele who were mostly, mostly white people. And she said, she said, I couldn't help it, but it felt like they were all looking sideways at me. And I thought, what a good description of something. And that's, you know, people say there's trauma that's obvious and there's trauma that's not so obvious. And there's something that I consider insidious trauma, which is trauma that takes place in a subtle way, but over a long period of time, over and over and over. And one of those <coughs> is being shunned and looked, being having being looking looked sideways by other people that is felt and it's felt more by women than it is by men but it will be felt and it will have an effect and an impact and we're we're, we're you know we're all dealing with that now it's, it's it's a topic of it's a current topic of discussion you know what that means to have lived through that in these centuries of it and and the ongoing quality of it now. So, but in terms of dealing and being strong in the world, there's several, you know, principles that I personally believe in, but, you know, I, this is from the point of view as, as a Hakeem and someone who is, whose opinions and views are colored by all the people I've seen. But I will say that 
one can express, it's possible for one to express everything one feels. It's possible for anyone to express everyone, everything one feels. And my teacher said, if you do not express what you feel, it will destroy you. You must express. And, but that expression has to be done with hikmah. And ideally, it's done with hikmah and compassion at the same time, holding to those principles, holding to that. But recognizing that anything that needs to be said can be said if it's said in the right way. But it must be done. And he also said anyone who expresses their feelings fully, they will not be depressed. But so many people, they don't have anyone they feel safe to expressing anything to. And then they say something, you get shut down. That's been the plight of women over and over and over and over and over, where they express what they feel, and their men say, no, you're not even feeling that. That's not even real. You, well, that's because, or you need to do this, or blah, 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 blah. So its strength is not more testosterone or bigger biceps that you show off by having short sleeve shirts <laughs> and having big cars that <laughs> or, or, you know, anything else. The outward show of power, big houses, fancy, you know. Strength is by having certainty in oneself and real trust in Allah and recognition that he has your back more than yourself or anyone else ever could have. And that's not, you know, that's easy to see, say, as a good, quote unquote, Muslim. One of the things that disturbs me most these days is I see people who are struggling. And they're struggling with <coughs> whatever it is in the world that has wounded them and given them difficulties in the world. And they're making an effort by coming to me to try to come forth from that difficulty. And then they listen to a spiritual teacher say, well, you won't be depressed if you strong iman because Allah trusts in the law. And you, all you have to do is increase your iman and have stronger iman and you won't be depressed or anxious. Well, yeah, but how do you do that? It's a great thing to say. And so they come to me and say, yeah, I guess my iman, I mean, or they'll say, all you need to do is do salat al All you have to do is salawat. You do prayer enough on the prophet and you won't have any anxiety. And he says, someone comes and says, well, I do it 300 times every night, and I'm going to increase it to 500. I'm still anxious. So we have to be real about people's condition. And we have to honor where they're at for them to move and to come to the next, to move to the next stage. One of the songs, talking about the, the art of music, it used to be, I mean, if a person is depressed and sad, it doesn't mean you just simply play ah, da, 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 and they're happy. I mean, the art of the of the of the Andalusian type of casitas was this tr this this transition from melody to melody to melody to melody, and same in in the maqamat, in the traditional uh, Arab music, in which you you may start with a very deep, serious minor chords, minor kind of quality, sad, and, and and move little by little, transforming, changing, changing. The influence of, you know, people ask me to, to work with their, two things that I've been, been to, given tasks to work with are young children who are disruptive and in prob, trouble, and old people who are in states of dementia. And for those people, for children, one of the most valuable therapies is one of my most valuable therapies for children that I've discovered through the years is, well, one of, I'll just give you one technique that I use, which is, it's this. And things of that sort. Why? Why can that be therapy? Play. Huh? Play. And why should play be therapy? It's fun. What else? Say again. 
What was the other? It connects you with. Them. It's connecting, playing. And play, as I said before, play is never random. Play is specifically coming forth because play is spontaneous. We don't plan play. Children come up, oh, let's play. Yeah, well, let's do this first and then let's do this second. And oh, yeah, you know, and the monkey bars. <laughs> It's, it has to be spontaneous or it's not play. Absolutely. Absolutely. The question is, can that same kind of connection be made to connect with the inner child? Anybody who connects with people in any number, they will not make it all serious. There has to be humor in it. There has to be this alternation, you know, of Jalal and Jamal, of serious, uh, and and and, and it, part of it. So a great degree of his connection. I, I said before that I believe for doctors, the man that dis I, I I mentioned Scott Miller. Scott Miller is a man really interesting. It's valuable for us Muslims to hear this. Scott Miller is the one that studies. You know about his outcomes study, right? And he's, he and a group of people have studied the outcomes of people who are, have emotional, or, you know, I don't like to use the term mental illness ever. I, I just don't want to ever use it, to be honest. But people who have emotional problems. And he studied the people who go to psychotherapists or psychiatrists, who go to medical doctors, who go to clergy, that would include imams, you know, spiritual teachers friends, and psychics. And of those, they studied, well, what was the greatest number of people said that said, well, I got good results. I felt better from this. I, I felt, you know, healing is another thing. We won't get into the realm of healing. We'll talk about feeling better. What were the better outcomes from what group of people? And what, and what do you also put, what was the best outcome from what group? Friends? Would, you think friends, people think friends was it? It's an important thing for us Muslims to hear and therapists to hear. The psychics. The psychics had better reports of good results over a longer period of time. And they made more money at it. What does that say? I suggest, say again, give me five. You got it. Absolutely. It's back to what we were talking about earlier. Dali Kad Kitab, we believe in the Ghaib. <laughs> Hello. Well, let's do so. And let's begin to recognize the nuanced realities that are there in the unseen much, much greater and more vast than this final result of material things. And how much influence that has. I've got into that a bit about the, you know, the, the subtle influences of things. When I went to, first went to Morocco, <coughs> I mean, again, this thing about the eye being a piece of the brain pushing out through the skull, <coughs> we don't want to see things that, we don't want to see everything that exists. Prophet Sarasam said, if you could see what I see, you probably wouldn't go out at night. You know, we don't want to see that. We, we want to sustain and manage. I mean, by the same, same token, to see and to be able to feel cognizant and aware of the extraordinary generosity of Allah or the kindness of Allah or the forgiveness of Allah, all these positive things, we, if we could see it in its fullness, it would probably overwhelm us. We would not be able to contain it because it's too much. But when it comes to the unseen, we want to keep it. We want to keep a modicum of ways in which we can manage it. We don't want to see too much. But I remember when I first went to Morocco, and the Moroccans, some people more than other peoples, are more open to the unseen, and they're more con conversant with it on a regular basis. And that 
conversing with it on a regular basis also enables it, in many cases, to become more present. If you believe in miracles by a law, you're more likely to see them and recognize them and experience them. I love and our expectations of him. So when I first went to Morocco and we had this evening of Dekker and I was sitting with all these people, you know, that I couldn't speak the language and people were translating for me and I was all this all new world. And it was amazing Dekker, like last night it was this amazing night of Dekker, you know, it was just all these things happening. And I was sitting at a table and this one man said, he said, it was awesome. He said, yes, the Dekker. It's true about the Malaika, the angels. He said, at one point there were two angels that flew in that window up above and came and surrounded all of us. And this such and such a thing happened at that time. And I thought, wow, subhanAllah, what an amazing thing that he was able to experience that. And I took it as an interesting and more as a subjective experience that he had. Until at another point, I was sitting at another table, with another group of people, not from this table. And there was a man there who said, yeah, it was amazing. There was one point at which two angels came in. He said, he described the same thing. And that's when I said, What's happening here? That I this I never say. I, this is something I don't know about yet. But I didn't say yet. I said this is something I don't know about. So, when we believe and expect in miracles, because what's happening right now is a miracle. If we want to define any in any sort of way, we might define miracles. It's something that's so remarkable, so remarkable as to seem totally impossible. And that is, we are existing in Allah's creation. The, the, my friend, my friend Fatih ben Halim, dear, dear brother, uh, he said to me, I was talking with him about some, some people that were having really difficulties with coming out of their, diff their emotional stress and difficulties. And he said, you know, we have a saying in, in Libya, and he said it's not one of the hundred, one of the that's not one of the beautiful, the the most beautiful names of Allah, but it's Al Mudabir. He said, and the saying they use is Al Mudabir Hakim, and it means it's all going to be okay. <laughs> it's one of the most powerful statements we can give to any person. It's all going to be okay. Somewhere inside, we know that truth, reality, because Allah is in charge. In the end, whatever is going to happen, Allah is in charge. In Al Mudabir Hakim, it will all be okay. So, Alhamdulillah. Yes, okay. Question online. The question is what type of environments? Uh, or space should we surround ourselves to help with presence? What kind of space should we surround ourselves to help ourselves with presence? <clears throat> well, there's so many aspects to what we find ourselves in to increase pres presence in ourselves, to increase presence. Because we'll find ourselves in all sorts of easy and difficult surroundings. Inevitably, this is the way it works. This is the way we have to. But to increase that, we want to do things, we want to be in environments and places we will get good reflection. One of the most powerful things is good company. To be with people who are honest. To be with people who we can trust what they feel about us and what they might say about us. I mean, that's a pretty obvious one. You know, and people who remind, you know, there's a saying, you know, I mean, one of the, one of the hadith is, that, is the hadith, is it hadith or is it Quran, to be with the people who remind you of Allah. And that, that mandate or that recommendation, it doesn't mean to be with people who talk about Allah. I suggest that what, it, those people are the ones who behave in a way that you realize they are people of Allah in their behavior, in their actions, in their attitudes, in their feelings, what they say when, their adab, 
the way they look, the way they greet you, their sincerity, their honesty, all these qualities they have that are only qualities of Allah that they share and they bring forth from their beings. Um, and so I'm, I'm yes, I'm, I'm not sure what you're, I, I maybe, could, it, it, it's, it depends totally on what happens inside you, without a doubt, yeah, but if you're looking for what's going to make me more present, how do I get more present, um, yeah, to be people with, to remind you of the truth, whether, whether it's speaking the words of Quran or just by being honest. Yes, pure space. You know, people have come to me over and over and they say, well, this is happening with my son or somebody, and they're really gone off the, off the rails. And, you know, what should I do? Take them to a psychiatrist? And with due respect to the psychiatrist, to be honest, I say, no, I'd take them out into the forest. I mean, I'll say my, well, for myself, before I became Muslim, I had a period in which I had what would be described clinically as a psychotic break. And I was experiencing things that I shouldn't be experiencing. And I went to all the so-called spiritual teachers I knew and said, what can I do? It was, too, it was overwhelming. I was overwhelmed so completely I could barely speak. What should I do? And this one said, oh, well, God this, blah, 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 and this Buddhist this, and you would do this, and everybody. And these spiritual teachers like, and then I went to one man, he didn't say a word to me. Don't talk, touch. He took me, putting him in, put me in his in his camper van, got some sleeping bags, and we took off and we went to one state park after another and we just stopped. He didn't say anything. We just built fires, we ate what was there, and we traveled from all the way from California to New Mexico. Saved my life. By the wisdom of being there and giving me this healing of Allah's creation. So someone called me, if someone called me, I mean one man I know called call me and said, my son is he's become schizophrenic, but what do I do? So maybe send him. He said, should I, should I send him some shake or something? He said, is there a shake I can send him to? And it didn't sound practical in this case. I said, just take him to the forest. So presence, though, is another thing. I mean, you know, what we ask for from Allah, we'll get. And a lot of people, you know, I mean, we, I mean becoming present is really become, becoming more who you truly are. You know, we were designed to be present in this world, and we were more present in our bodies when we were children. And, that, and then we went through all the slings and arrows of life in which we learned how to shut down and not be so present, not cry when we felt like crying. Don't cry, don't cry. I remember that, how many times I was told that as a child. Don't cry. The Prophet said, if you could see what I see, you would laugh a little and cry. <laughs> Lots. But we learned the social constraints and the social expectations, which is part of being civilized human beings. But we want to then, beyond that, come to a place where we're intact. Someone once asked me, what's, what's the picture of a healthy being? And this image came to me of these things in California where you go to the redwood forest and they, they give you this big cross section of a big tree. You know, then they date, you know, this is the time Sadna Isa and this is this is when that happened in these rings, you know. And I said, Well, it's kind of like that. We have an embryo that's you know, still at the core of our being, and then this child that was just born, and then this first two years, and then the first child, four years and five years. And ideally, all of these experiences that we have are integrated, and each piece informs each other part, so that we now have this savvy adult that can care 
that can care for that child that was mistreated or felt shunned or rejected or felt frightened when we were child. If our mothers didn't do it for us enough and successfully enough, we have our own motherness. Because even motherness comes about from Allah. It's from our mother. It's only an attribute of Allah that comes through her. Yes? Tarif. Yeah. Right? Mama. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget Mama. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah, is it? Wrap up what? The day or? Oh, bless <laughs> Allah. Wrap up something. Muzamil. Any any last questions? One one more here. Um, they said that Rasulullah would play with children, and then um, and then you spoke about. Um, uh, sorry, if if you could just comment on how we understand the power of play. Like they said, Rasulullah used to play with children. And you use play as a as a therapeutic um, quality. You talked about spontaneous play, yeah. um, and then we're talking about mothers in our day and age who are traumatized at so many levels, children and younger and younger ages being exposed to all kinds of harm. And even everything that's spontaneous is only by Allah's command, and anything that comes spontaneously from us, we could say comes from deep within us. And for play to take place, we are, there has to be a submissive aspect. We can't plan play. We have to let control go and let it happen. And that's what makes it spontaneous. And that's what makes us laugh. We laugh because laugh is, laughter is also spontaneous. It comes forth. It's not we, we say, oh, I'm going to say something funny. And, and, or that I'm in, oh, that was funny, and now I'm going to laugh. Ha, 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 ha. No. It's autonomic from our inner unconscious subliminal realities. And back to, I want to remind you all of this, and if you weren't here yesterday, one of the things I stress so much is when we connect with each other, there is a second, and we, t we have connection, and whatever dialogue, even if it's a science dialogue, dialogue of sitting with each other, like I say the Native Americans do, anytime there's a dialogue, there is a second dialogue that's taking place subliminally, using the words of Bob Dylan, subliminally that conversation takes place. And that secondary subliminal conversation, subtextual, below the words, has a trajectory of its own. By Allah, it has a trajectory of its own. And that is a dialogue and conversation that will inform both parties if the connection in the, the, the conversation is real. So having said that, just as a prerequisite, play has to be something that spontaneously happens. I have seen children recover from severe trauma. And part of the, the thing to recognize is that play is a necess necessary reality of all animals and all creatures, and especially humans who have gone through compl complex, dramatic sort of traumatic experiences. And I can give you examples of things I've seen in which children are healed by allowing them to play and by seeing and recognizing that the play is very pointed towards them processing their experiences in the world. Play is when we process, when children process what's taken place. So I mean, one hand, the parents would say, well, you're not allowed to play with guns. Well. Uh, that's fine. I mean, I can understand why. But the thing is, why are they playing guns? Because they're traumatized by the fact that there are guns out there killing people and shooting. I remember when I was a kid, we would get, we would have play, you know, and then we oh, we have this dramatic thing where we fall down and die, and that was acting out some degree of trauma about the just the knowledge that that sort of thing takes place. Right now, I mentioned yesterday for those of you who weren't here. I mentioned my growing up with the drop drills, or is that today? And 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 now they have these uh, gun the shooter drills. That's traumatic. So how does 
you know, so we play out these things, and part of what happens in play is the same thing that happens in dreams. We play out the drama and the, the fearful things in a safe way in which the outcome is good. We laugh instead of, you know, grieve or, you know, have difficult experiences around it. So I've seen people, you know, I, 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 we don't have time, but again, these videos that can be made available to any of you who's do the subscribing. We could go into more detail. I could do one whole video on play alone. But play and sleep, sleep and dream, dreams are another way in which we process our experiences. And we have to dream and we have to play. But if we don't play, something else happens. <laughs> What? Zero. The way I want to make it simple, more of like yeah. tying it to what we're learning, which is like, and how would you discern that? Like, if we're listening to our body. Well, you want to be able to listen to your body and begin and to begin to develop the ability of how much can you, you know, what, what's my threshold? You know, what's my threshold in which I, I say no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I, I won't go there. Because some people are much more resilient and they can wade into the most difficult, dramatic situations in difficult situations emotionally. And they can be untouched in the sense that they sustain their ability to stand on their own two feet and their integrity without being, without being dissociated but present. That's a great quality. Great quality. And it's very much, you know, uh, it's an admirable quality to be present with those, and then to bring something positive to that situation. I remember, well, I, 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 I'm going to go off on another tangent here, but I remember one time we had a workshop in New Mexico. We had a workshop in New Mexico uh, with, and it was about education. So we had invited all these people from across the, the country who were involved in Islamic education. And it turned out on the first day there was a contingent of the African-American educators and the Arab educators. And they were, you know, they were, it was them and us. And the person who was there as one of our teachers was Sayyid Hussein Nasser. People know the Muslims say, and Sayyid Hussein Nasser. And he waded into that and he, you know, he just came into the room and he said, okay, listen. And then he took it on, put it on the table, and dealt with it beautifully. And it gave everybody the encouragement to come together. It was beautiful. And I said, well, that's Sufism. I mean, I mean I'll, I'll call that Sufism, because that's practical action in the world, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, barakallahu Thank you all for, is this the end? Just gonna make Allah Akbar, alhamdulillah. I can't, I can't ask for anything better. Alhamdulillah. So, Siti Hakim, inshallah, I want to say something before I, I do the dua, inshallah. Yes. Um, two things. The first one for Siti Hamza. Hamza, you asked the question how the bird will fall down when they said that no, Dawood will, will do the singing. Uh, <laughs> It's been narrated that because of the ihsan of Sayyidina Dawood and his beautiful voice, yes. everybody will listen. They go to, to a status called fana, that they don't feel themselves. So the bird heard, they don't want to be disturbed with anything. So they stopped moving their wings because of the beauty. And actually, they, they, they will go down. This is being mentioned in the Bidaya Nihaya, in the Mikathia, it's a book of history. And they fall down and they die. The same example, if you see the same way of beauty, but not in the song, now under the eye, where the, the, the women, when they saw Sayyidina Yusuf, and they start cutting their hands with, from the beauty of Sayyidina Yusuf, Nabiullah. And that beauty made them that feeling themselves. And there's awliya, they feel the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they don't feel anything around them. And this is Sidi Hakim, he knows what's that. This is called the fana, which is you don't feel yourself. So um, the second one is that uh, being present, Allah ordered us 
تو بي ويتنس شهداء لتكونوا شهداء على الناس تو بي ويتنس انا ويتنس يو نيد تو تو نوتس ايفريثينغ اراوند يو الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم اسد دعاء هي ميد سيد اللهم اجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون احسن والله ميد هاز فروم ذا بيبل هو ليسن فور ايفريثينغ اند ذن فولو ذا بيست اوف وات يو ليسن تو اند باي ذس يو ويل بي اكشلي بريزنت بيكوز يو ونت تو واتش ايفريثينغ اراوند يو اند تراي تو جيت ايفريثينغ اراوند يو اند اند فولو ذا بيست نعم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وصحبه اجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وانعم وعظم وكرم على سيدنا وحبيبنا وطبيبنا وشفعنا وقائدنا وقرت عيوننا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اسالك يا الله بجعل الحبيب الاعظم صلى الله عليه وسلم ان تربط قلوبنا بقلوب الحبيب الاعظم صلى الله عليه وسلم تجعلنا تحت انظاره وتجعلنا تحت ملاحظاته اسالك يا الله بجعل الحبيب الاعظم صلى الله عليه وسلم ان تجمعنا مع الحبيب الاعظم صلى الله عليه وسلم ظاهرا وباطنا مغطى ومنام في الدنيا والاخره اللهم ادخلنا مدخله اللهم اوردنا حوضه اللهم اجعلنا مع وجهين المواقف رحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين واجعلنا يا الله ممن ترضى عنهم في الدنيا والاخره بجاه الحبيب الاعظم صلى الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبسر اسرار الفاتحه This uh, unfortunately concludes our, our weekends and uh, as we said in the beginning of the program that's we always run out of time and so alhamdulillah we've been making way for a platform for, for Hakim to reach everybody and also to have some interaction. Um, so uh, anybody who received an email from us uh, basically saying you know come Join us. Um, you'll consider continue getting emails about the program as it uh, is is unfolding, and it's uh, there'll be more information about it. If you haven't received an email and you came through MCC or another method, let me know and we can get your email, or you can sign up at care at hikmawellness.com, and that will uh, you know just say please add me to the subscription list. Um, the second YouTube video is up. We just uploaded it today. So this is in the series of YouTube videos that we've been talking about. So if you've subscribed to um, Hakim's channel, then you'll be able to see that it's up. Um, otherwise, just keep in touch and you know keep an eye open, and inshallah you'll get to see more information that's coming and stuff like that. So inshallah. Alhamdulillah, thank everybody for <laughs> not still, not soon I'm, enough. I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, he's, still, he's still present. So. Um, no, alhamdulillah. Thank everybody for coming. It's been yes. it's been wonderful, and you know, again, being here is is so comfortable for everybody. Uh, you know, it's it's been wonderful. Um, thank MCC. They've like I said, they've been one of the best uh, places that that we've ever dealt with. And you know, alhamdulillah. Thank uh, Sidi Munir. He does amazing work. If you have any way of supporting this place, please come donate. You know, this place is amazing. It's wonderful. Um, you know, do everything you can to to make these things possible by supporting MCC, inshallah. So, um, inshallah, we have to make a quick exit. So we're gonna stow away real quick. But uh, you know, again, questions. Um, you know, if anybody wants to make appointments with uh, with Hakim, uh, his Calendly is the best way to do that. You can sign up for for you know one on one interactions, and of course, the courses will be unrolling. So if you want to actually have a more and how do they access Calendly? Calendly, um, it's on your website, hakimarchuleta.com. Okay. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you know, you can get in touch with myself and or just respond to one of the emails and just say, I want to get in touch. But, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, it was wonderful and beneficial for, yes. for us, and I hope it was for everybody else. And uh, inshallah, we look forward to seeing you all soon. So. And, and I just want to say one last thing, which is it, it's been wonderful. And wallahi, anything that you feel like you've gotten from me, Believe me, and I don't mean this to be romantically, it's, I've gotten as much from all of you because that's the way reciprocity, which is one of the hikmas, that the way it works. And anybody that doesn't realize that, yeah, well, it's the truth. MashaAllah.